moved. Is there a second? second? It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on any of those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor uh, of the slate of minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, the motion carries. Uh, reports of officers, Superintendent Merrill. Uh, thank you, President Bourne. Um, we have several things to, to share today. Make sure these things, all the electronics are off. Um, forestry staff have prepared the bid specifications for purchasing approximately 9,000 new trees due to the board's work on the budget. And they will be planted this spring. So um, this will be received in and about mid-January. So that's exciting. A, a quick uh, response uh, to uh, the board and others who were concerned about our trees in the city of Minneapolis. Um, ice rinks. What can I say when you have 40 degree weather? There's not, not much we can do about it, but uh, we started back on November 26th and started watering in two shifts on December 6th. We were on track and even ahead of last year to have a citywide opening this weekend. Unfortunately, it's not gonna happen. So, you know, it's nice to have the warm weather, but it does curtail a lot of our winter activities. So we'll look forward to, as the weather changes, um, we'll be able to get those rinks open and operating. Um, however, Loring Park, you can go skating there because there's a refrigerated rink. So if you really, really desperately want to go, swim, uh, go skating, please go down to Loring Park. Um, let's see. Environmental management. Um, okay, all Minneapolis lakes were considered ice covered as of December 12th. I don't know whether they're ice covered now, Jeremy. I don't think so, okay? Um, yeah. So the bottom line is that it's still unsafe uh, for people to be out on, if you, even if you, see, if you see it's a very thin, uh, uh, thin ice, um, very little ice, even that in the evening. But uh, please stay out of the water, away from the water. It's, we don't know how soon we'll have safe ice. It may be quite a few weeks, not quite a few, but maybe a couple weeks before we're able to, uh, to go out and enjoy um, our, uh, our ice in the area. Um, one of the other things I wanted to highlight is that we're having our 10th annual food drive December 10th through January 21st. It's benefiting the North Point Health and Wellness Center and Sabathony Community Center. And um, they uh, uh, every year at the end of the Martin Luther, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, birthday party, we always uh, collect all of the food and celebrate um, all of the the food we've been able to come up with. So that's on Monday the 21st at Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Park at 6.30. So we look forward to seeing you out there. Now I would like Tom Evers from the Minneapolis Parks Foundation to come. He has a, some special announcements that he would like to make. Mr. Evers. <clears throat> Superintendent. Merrill, President Bourne, Commissioners, uh, it's good to be back in front of you again. Um, I just want to share some news about a couple of gifts that we'll be presenting to the Park Board by the end of this year um, and just share some, some of the great work that's happening from it. Um, it's been a good year uh, and it's fun to always come in front of you all and just talk about the great work we're doing. It's a great partnership. Um, I, uh, first off, I want to share news that uh, through a gift, through uh, Barbara Lupiant and her family, we'll be contributing $50,000 to the Minneapolis uh, Park Swims program. So we've been working with Mimi um, Kalb on, on doing this over the past year of getting youth into the pools, um, uh, uh, including uh, lifeguard training scholarships, uh, swim scholarships, uh, culturally appropriate swimwear, and then working, uh, Mimi helped do a partnership through some of these funds to establish a partnership with Cedar Riverside to bring kids to the Jim Lupian Water Park. And so it's just an ongoing commitment to this pool and swimming across, uh, across the city. So um, we'll be contributing a portion of that and continuing to work with uh, your staff to do even more next year through that gift. 
Um, and a portion of that gift uh, also has been just looking at the, 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 um, the bathhouse and just beginning to explore what, that's a 1960s building and the question is can it be upgraded? So we're just doing some initial work and looking um, very preliminary about what the future could be uh, with staff. So that's a, a gift in motion. And then uh, lastly, we'll be making a, uh, the beginning contribution towards the design services for the Great Northern Greenway, the 26th Avenue Overlook. Um, your planning team and working with the uh, design team to, uh, to imagine that uh, and come up with uh, an appropriate design for this really unique spot where 26th Avenue hits the river. And so we'll be making that contribution because some good work's been doing it. I know uh, Commissioner French and Commissioner Severson are on the uh, advisory committee for that. Um, and this is really giving the river back to the north side as best we can in the beginning. So those are two gifts that are coming this year, and we're just, let's keep doing more. So thank you, Superintendent Merrill. It's been great to work with you. Thank you for all the support, and uh, we hope to do more. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Thanks. Evers, and yeah. we'll just uh, say it's been a banner year for philanthropic giving to awesome. the park system. And so thank you to the foundation and all of your partners for the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Absolutely fabulous. And before I finish, I'd like Corky... Cordell Wiseman to come forward, and he's going to bring, introduce um, Mr. Andre Fisher. Good evening, President Bourne and Commissioners, Superintendent Merrill. Um, I want to introduce Andre Fisher. He, um, he, we met, oh, I don't know how many years ago, but um, he created the Mobile Jazz Mobile for us, and um, I'll have him do an update on where we're at with that. And I'm going to pass it on to Andre. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's good to see everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say hello to, to, uh, to Ms. Anderson. Uh, the idea for this and what I've been doing for the past six years basically uh, came from uh, the inspiration and advice I got from Ms. Anderson also from Corky and from a gentleman named Al Bangora. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Mobile Jazz not only does free concerts in the parks by using your showmobile, we now have after school programs in four high schools. Uh, I employ now, we started with three instructors, now we have 30. And we've gotten grants from uh, St. Paul Foundation to Best Buy to Bigelow to different organizations after initially we started just by doing free concerts in Minneapolis parks. These were patterned after the Jazzmobile, which was originated in Harlem by a Dr. Billy Taylor. And this was to create a jazz renaissance in Harlem. Basically, it's to expose children to what they need to be critical thinkers. And also in the history of jazz was also in the history, the history of the United States. So basically, we have shiny pennies which we invite children to come see and involve them in things they're already interested in. But what we've done is created an environment which is conducive to creative. We all know that the lack of, of decisions are made when you don't have enough input. So basically we're exposing children wherever we go, not only to jazz, but that kind of thinking which takes discipline to be able to get to that point. Also, uh, I commend you because now we all see the difference between being stewards of the land and stewards of the people. There's two totally separate things. And, and to be stewards of the people, you'll always do the right thing when you're stewards of the people, uh, as far as that's concerned. Also, I'm, I'm also uh, glad to see that uh, Mr. Bangora uh, was considered, has, has, he, has he agreed? because that gentleman and I set up for hours. Uh, and now we have also recording studios and, and five rec centers in St. Paul. And basically the St. Paul Parks put up the money for us to get the equipment. Mm -hmm. And initially I met them by being a vendor partner for St. Paul Public Schools. That's at a time when Minneapolis schools weren't quite sure what they were doing. So when I talked to uh, uh, people at the Minneapolis uh, Board of Education, it seemed to go over their heads. So I went to whoever said the word children first, and that was uh, a lady named Miss Silva, who at the time was running the St. Paul Board of Education. I'm from Minneapolis, so my goal has always been to come here and give back. Uh, I'm a former senior vice president of MCA Records, uh, ex-vice president of Quincy Jones Productions for 10 years. Uh, Vice President 20th Century Fox Records and Artist Development. I've won five Grammys. Uh, 
I'm ex-dean of McNally Smith. I was even on the Park Foundation board. That's when I came up with the bright idea to talk you guys out of that truck every Wednesday during the <laughs> summer. So the Minneapolis Park Board has been the city I moved back to. Uh, I was born here. My mother's water broke while she was singing in a club. That's how I was born in Minneapolis. <laughs> And I was born the next day. They didn't even live here yet. But they moved here because they said this was a good place to raise children. So I'm proud to say that I was born here, that I was raised here. And after doing much work for all these companies and, and winning all these awards and making all these records, it was time to make legacy. And legacy is not by giving money. Legacy is not putting your name on the side of a building. Legacy is to be a candy striper in a hospital. A legacy is to help someone across the street. It's the things that Minnesotans do naturally, which I was ostracized for as a kid in California. They couldn't even pronounce Minneapolis. So it's not only is it good, back, good to be back here, but this is our going on our seventh year of our partnership with the Park Board. And also we are now uh, partners with uh, St. Paul Public Schools. We are now a vendor, and as I say, we're now in five high schools. And basically, we deal with almost 250 kids a day. So it's turned from showing kids music and trying to be creative and productive with them to be careful what you wish for because it will <laughs> they'll dump it right in your lap. And that's exactly what's happened. I'm going to run you. this quick video as I finish up. This video is some pictures of what we do at the park. It will also show us uh, in some of the high schools and also a couple of the studios that we currently run. There's no sound, it's just pictures. That's our first time at Harrison. These parks you will recognize if you look at the pictures. And basically, some people <laughs> judge an event by how many adults show up. We judge the event by how many kids show up. It's like when they tell you to play music for a pregnant woman. You know, my mother was told to uh, expose her, her unborn child to uh, classical music. Well, we see kids uh, come through the park and they get just that. They get, they get the influence whether they want to or not. They're listening to great music that we present. We use the best artists in town, the best students. And a lot of people come through that wouldn't even come here as far as a, for a concert, but would come here to do it for free for our children in the parks. And those same people come to the schools and now our TAs are now some of the students who came to see us in the parks. So now going into our seventh year, some of those kids that we first met are now coming back to be part of Mobile Jazz themselves. I'm so thankful and grateful to the Minneapolis Park Board uh, and to reassociate myself with the new members. And also a quiet cheer, I wanna jump up and down because Mr. Bangor is the one who gave me the idea to make this happen. So this is the culmination of those conversations I had six years ago, and also sitting with the people on the foundation, uh, uh, as far as people telling me w what mattered in the city. And most people don't know city planning. Most, most civilians uh, don't know what plans the city has for the next 20 years. So they're not privy to quite a few things. And the way they get an inkling of how the city's doing is through our parks mm -hmm. and, and how we handle when people come to see us and what we have to offer them. I'm here to be grateful and to say thanks to everyone. And not only do uh, I want to continue, but the money that's giving me, I triple it. Mobile Jazz takes what you have, which covers less than a third of what we do. And every Wednesday, there's a ticker tape that goes on and there's a check that goes out. And we gladly spend that money towards the education of the children and, and positive forces which exist here in the Twin Cities. And specifically, uh, great thanks uh, to the Minneapolis Park Board and its members. Uh, from when I started back uh, six years ago, when I didn't know anyone, and now I consider them uh, uh, all my friends. Matter of fact, even the reason why we're in high schools is because uh, we were signed as a community partner by Tyrese Cox. <laughs> because she said, if you want to help the community, here's something you can do. Mm -hmm. So everyone I've talked to has given us positive advice and, and, and definitely uh, 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 fruitful information to take with us on our journeys through these parks every day. 
We found out that the majority of the kids, some even have PTSD. Some are traumatized. Some are uh, uh, of all kinds of different ways, shapes, and forms. So the things that we offer are less to tell them what to do than to find out how we can treat them. And our instructors are also trained by the Youth Social Work Department at the University of Minnesota. We also have a partnership with them. So it's gone from doing concerts to after school programs to creating studios, and now we even sponsor other organizations. Through El Fondo Barriqua, which is an organization in St. Paul, we helped raise over $500,000 for Puerto Rican relief. Uh, Mobile Jazz has also sent guitars and instruments. Uh, I have a voice. It's and, the message other a group of teenagers uh, to is sharing Rico after the police this is shooting that death was done of Philando Castillo. Castillo. I'm done after Members this of business. Twin Cities <laughs> Mobile Jazz Project came together to record a song in honor of the cafeteria supervisor. They said that they needed a way to channel their emotions. As WCCO's Jennifer Merrily reports, they found a powerful way. Students in the Mobile Jazz Project summer program felt deeply when they learned Philando Castile was killed by a police officer after a traffic stop. It took a hole in my heart. We needed an outlet, something to go to, and we all love music. Each brought their own story, their own background. I hear a voice that have a dream that one day I will achieve and won't be stopped by all the negativity. And collaborated to empower the community. My first line is born by my black parents but came out light. When it comes to music, you're able to be who you are. You could feel the traumatic energy that these kids had in their hearts. Instructors help the students channel what they were feeling. And it's these children trying to find a way that they can rise with that sun and not have to live in this fear that it could be them I have a voice rang true. I don't think ethnicity matters when it comes to how you feel about it. We we all got to lay out our emotions. We just want to make things better and want this to stop. Not, you know, not just the grown-ups anymore, not just the protesters anymore, it's the kids too. Jennifer Merrily, WCCO 4 News. Andre, thank you so much. You're it is you can hear the fishing. Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Project song, I Have a Voice, in memory of Philando Castillo. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank right. you. Superintendent Merrill, does that conclude your that concludes report of my officers? Report. Thank you. Are there any questions for Superintendent Merrill? Seeing none, we will move on with the agenda. I would entertain a resolution for the consent items, resolutions 2018-344 through 2018-348. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, the, the consent agenda has been moved. Is there a second? second. It's been, uh, consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of resolutions 2018-344 through 2018 348, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions. The uh, consent agenda carries. Uh, moving on to reports of standing committees, Chair Forney. On behalf of the planning committee, um, there is an item of which I will be recusing myself, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, Vice Chair um, Colville. Thank you, um, Chair Forney. Uh, I, on behalf of the Planning Committee, I will move Resolution 2018-328, Resolution Approving a Modified Encroachment Permit for Use of 613 Square Feet of Land Encroaching Upon Park Properties in Front of the Subject Property at 2863 Lake of the Isles Parkway East at Lake of the Isles Park, a part of Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park, and reconsidering the Planning Committee's previous determination related to Resolution 2018-108 on February the 21st of 2018. It has been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, it looks like uh, there is uh, no discussion. Um, I, I do have a quick question for Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. The uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, there, there was some discussion. This is before us uh, again this evening after the 
um, board has already ruled this is a motion to reconsider. Um, reconsider. If I remember some of the circumstances, there was one property owner that had um, that had claimed to and made claims of having an encroachment on the property and was not able to provide documentation of that encroachment, which is why we're back today. Can you just walk us through a little bit about why we're back today? Uh, President Borden, this did move through committee. The board didn't take an action on this specific thing. It was the request of the proponent or the applicant to put this on hold. Um, it, you're correct. The neighboring property at 2359 East Lake of the Isles Parkway claimed uh, to have some right for the driveway that exists in front of that property. Um, despite requesting documentation for se several times over the course of a year, perhaps, um, we haven't seen anything come from that party. At the same time, um, the property owners are building their home. We've extended to them a construction permit to cross parkland to build their home. They have no other uh, access to a public right of way, public road, public accessible road. Uh, so we grant them the construction permit and now they're uh, requesting the separated driveway with the understanding that they have not been able to reach agreement with the neighboring property owner for a shared driveway, which was the previous board's recommendation. And the uh, the previous, the, the adopted recommendation, that was initially staff's recommendation as well, that the property owner at 2359 and the property owner at 2863 work together on a, on a shared driveway. That's correct. Okay. And, and we're here because the owner at 2359 is stating that there's not a requirement to share their driveway because there is not, because they have, they have, they're saying that they have a right of way or an encroachment. They have not been able to provide documentation of that. President Borden, uh, I think there's two aspects. You're correct, and I think the other piece of it is that uh, the applicant has not, as a result of that, has not been able to come to an agreement with that property owner for the sharing of that driveway. Um, I will uh, also indicate that at some point when that property, the neighboring property's driveway is repaired or reconstructed, or when we actually get to a point where we are actively pursuing undocumented encroachments, that property owner will be subject to the full encroachment fee that would have been waived in the shared driveway arrangement that was approved by the previous board. Do you have any idea of what that encroachment fee it, it'll be similar be? to what the applicant is paying. It'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty eight to thirty thousand dollars, okay. maybe the, more. Uh, and the reason why I bring this up to the board, I'm certainly um, we certainly do not want to stand in the way of the owners at twenty eight sixty three completing completing their home. Um, I think this board, from previous conversations, we're all a little bit there. There's a challenge that we are impacting park users. Um, and we have an obligation to have minimal impact for park users when uh, when we provide right of way. And so I, I guess my, my question would be, I, I just heard you say Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, when we start proactively seeking undocumented encroachments, this will be on our list. Uh, pre President that? Boyd, that, that's correct. So in 2019, part of the planning division's work plan is to work with legal counsel to move through a process of updating the encroachment policies and procedures that we use. At the same time, we'll be um, going through the initial processes of defining a master plan for um, uh, Lake of the Isles, the channels, and Cedar Lake. And as a part of that, we'll be uh, conducting what we call an ALTA survey. ALTA is American Land Title Association survey that will demonstrate whether or not there actually is encroachments. And with that, we'd be able to more actively pursue uh, encroaching properties, encroachments on, onto our properties. But we essentially have with 2359, a property owner that has come to us and has effectively said, I have an undocumented encroachment on Minneapolis Park property right now. Uh, President Bourne, actually uh, what that property owner has said is that they have a documented encroachment. Um, but they have failed but they to have produce failed that to... documentation and exactly. how, how long of a time period? Well over a year. Okay. Um, what staff direction would you need to receive from the board to proactively uh, to proactively document that encroachment and collect the fees associated 
so the Minneapolis Park Board can gather those fees from 2359 uh, and use that to offset the impact that we're having on Minneapolis Park users by um, by having a different documented uh, different encroachment right next door. What sort of staff direction would you need to expedite that process? President Bourne, I, I might actually defer to Superintendent Merrill, but I think if you provide us direction tonight, we can begin that process. Okay. I guess I would look to my uh, colleagues. Is there any, um, is there any um, reservations with asking staff and providing staff direction um, to expedite the process of documenting the encroachment at 2359 um, East Lake of the Isles Parkway. Is there any objection to providing staff direction to expedite that process? No. I'm seeing no objection. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder and Superintendent Merrill, do you have the staff direction that you need to expedite that process? I believe we do. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I would speak in favor of this resolution and would hope that it, and ho would, hope that it would pass. Uh, is there any further discussion on, uh, on the resolution? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of resolution 2018-328, please signify by, uh, if the secretary would please take a roll. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Commissioner Forney is recused. Vice President Hassan. Aye. President Bourne. Aye. You have seven ayes, one nay, and uh, one recused. Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, Chair Cogill. On behalf of the Administration and Finance Committee, I will move Resolution 2018-319, Resolution Approving Amendment Number 4 to License Agreement L304 with state, the State of Minnesota, Department of Public Safety for Office Space for Minnesota State Patrol at MPRB Headquarters, Building 2117 West River Road. Uh, the motion has been moved. 2018-319, uh, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on 2018-319? Commissioner Meyer, followed by French. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, can Christine come forward? Ms. Downey. And Commissioner Meyer, just a heads up, we're at 528. You might ask your first question and then we'll go into open time. Uh, my main question is why are we issuing this license without receiving any payment for it? I would, I'd like to know the context of this and we can wait until after open time for that. But um, and I'll, I also wanted to know like how much space uh, this license is taking up and what alternative uses of it might be. Commissioner Meyer and uh, Chair Cogill, I will uh, defer to um, Chief Ohado on this matter. This, I'm sorry, my mic is Mike's not on. Not on. Pretty far. It's actually on. Oh, Commissioner okay. Meyer and uh, Chief Cogill, I would. I, I mean, I'm sorry, Chair Cogill, I would actually defer to um, Chief Ohado regarding the matter of the space. And in terms of the charge, I believe it's actually in terms of the um, goodwill that's between the two. Um, organizations so I would also just after for, after open time actually have that discussion I believe thank you miss Downey um, we'll be moving into uh, we'll take a break and move into open time um, this is the time on our agenda where uh, we receive comments from the public on a variety of topics. We welcome folks to come in and uh, give their testimony of anything that they would like to see the Park Board be aware of or uh, address in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Uh, we have a couple of uh, guidelines for folks uh, that uh, speak. Uh, the, first, uh, the first thing is we do this at uh, time certain at 5.30 every evening. Uh, we have a total of 15 minutes allocated per speaker. I have one, two, I have 17 speakers signed up, so I will allocate uh, without objection. I'll allocate 90 seconds per speaker, so we'll go just a little bit over the 15 minutes, uh, but that gives enough people, that gives folks uh, enough time to be able to um, 
uh, address the board. Uh, there's a couple of items. If uh, folks have uh, signage, we welcome signage in the in the room. We just want to be respectful of folks that may be sitting behind you. Uh, so if you have any signs to display, we ask that you put them around the perimeter of the room uh, in the same way that those signs are on the perimeter of the room behind. If you look over your shoulder, there's some signage there. Um, we ask that folks remain seated until they are called forward. Uh, the, there are two items of comments that are not uh, appropriate for uh, open time. Uh, those are pending litigation and personnel matters, just out of respect for privacy for personnel and uh, park board litigation. If there's anything that you'd like the board to be aware of on any of those comments, the best way to make, uh, to make yourself heard to the board is to uh, address commissioners directly. All of our emails for both the uh, commissioners and executive staff can be found on our website at minneapolisparks.org. Um, the park board does not tolerate uh, discriminatory or harassing comments towards anybody, so we ask that uh, you keep those comments in mind while you're giving your, um, while you're giving your testimony. Uh, my first speaker, I'd like to welcome former Park Board employee and son and grandson of a former Park Board Commissioner, uh, Josh Neiman. So uh, Josh, if you would state your uh, name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record and you have 90 seconds to address Great. the board. My name is Josh Neiman. I live on 50th and Vincent Avenue South. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Thanks for taking the time to hear all of us and especially thanks for your service to our public. I'm here to ask the board to take action to address and repair the dysfunction that I observe plaguing our board right now. I want to ensure that all of our elected leaders, especially the women that are a part of this board, have a voice and are heard consistently. Uh, to be blunt, our park system is the best. I believe all of you have a ton to offer our park system. I want to see that in action. What I'm describing from the outside looking in is there appears to be a clear majority group and a clear minority group. That's a problem that I can see that uh, from the outside looking in, especially with all these individuals that generally agree, that want to focus on all of our equity issues and opportunities, that want to bring more opportunities to serving our youth. This poor culture manifests itself in a conversation that we saw in a recent board meeting where we learned uh, that there was a process to hire a consultant for the entire board, yet a few members were excluded. Uh, these are things that I believe can be resolved and addressed, and I think that starts at the top and requires the right leader. I expect you will all find a president that brings the board together, not drives them apart, that builds consensus, that will be a great listener, and creates a culture of collaboration that allows all of our elected leaders to serve our park system. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Neiman. Our next speaker is uh, Patty Neiman. Patty, if you would uh, come forward and state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record, and you have 90 seconds to address the board. Good evening. I'm Patty Neiman. I'm here speaking for my brother, Scott Neiman. Dear members of the MPRB, I hope you have learned recently that a board majority and a leader without a moral compass are certain to be challenged about their personal ethics and any decision they make. Being in power requires a very high standard of self-regulation to ensure abuses of power do not occur. The recent decision of how your IGR consultant position was created and the hiring process utilized is the perfect example of what, have I, what I'm referring to. When the board and superintendent agree to a process and then it's ignored because those in power deem it is unnecessary, you are going to have a problem. When the president and the superintendent chose to compound this problem by handling the hiring in a secretive manner by splitting the contract, so many members of the board and the public don't even know someone was hired. Important ethical lines are being crossed. Lastly then, let's make sure to take this to the highest level of ethical dysfunction by hiring a person that has a strong personal relationship with the president of the board so we can all see, given the lack of transparency, that this $114,000 a year job is a reward for his political patronage. I'm not sure who those of you who control the decision making are on this board expect, but you do not operate in a vacuum. You have put up a large, huge red flag to the public that will bring a great deal of scrutiny. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Ms. Neiman. Our next speaker is Jennifer Bastian. Jennifer, are you here this evening? Jennifer, if you would state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record, and you have 90 seconds to address the board. 
Good evening, my name is Jennifer Bastian and I live at 47th in Emerson. I'm here again tonight on behalf of the Washburn tennis teams. Some of you may remember I was here last month asking for an answer as to why Washburn tennis team has been denied access to the Kenwood School Park. Well, De La Salle High School, a private high school, has been given priority. After 18 months of inquiry, we have not received an explanation or an answer. Since I was last here, I have also received no response. Tonight, I'm here asking for an answer to this question. Why is a private school being given priority to our public facilities when there is a clear need at the public school? It feels like it's a simple, straightforward answer, and the silence from the park board leaves me believing there's a larger story here that's very worth exploring. We aren't giving up or going away. Please do what's right by your constituents and grant our public school students the use of our shared public facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bastian. Uh, Chip uh, Jenny, is Chip here this evening? Chip uh, Jenny, and I might be pronouncing the last name wrong. Um, there is no Chip here. Moving on, Julia Wallace. Is Julia here this evening? Uh, Julia, if you would state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record and you have 90 seconds to address the board. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Julie Wallace and I live in the Prospect Park neighborhood uh, in, on the east side. Uh, I just want to point out what seemed to me a, a, a really interesting juxtaposition of issues that are coming before your planning commission tonight, your planning committee, uh, for study and, and future use, no action. And it just seemed to me it was very interesting to have the, uh, the community engagement draft coming before you, which is, of course, how you're going to carry out your uh, community engagement that I think is so important to all the members of this group. Uh, and uh, also being presented to the committee at the same time is the East of the River Master Plan, uh, in which I have taken a great deal of interest. I have not been on the CIC, but I've just been a neighbor who was involved uh, and watched carefully and was most impressed with how your staff has carried out the community engagement for that particular master plan. You will see the plan now tonight, 300 pages an incredible report with an enormous number of wonderful ideas that we're just thrilled to see. And the community engagement was active and included all sorts of people from the neighborhoods and communities. Uh, and of course, we're particularly excited that this plan is gonna bring back to you the, uh, the possibility of continuing the grand rounds and fi fitting out the uh, missing link. And so that is terribly exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. Uh, my next speaker is Cynthia Wilson. Uh, Cynthia, if you would uh, come forward and state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public, public record and you have 90 seconds to address the board. Yeah, Welcome. My name is Cynthia Wilson, uh, President Bourne and the commissioners. Um, real quickly, first uh, I bring you season's greetings, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, um, Hanukkah, all of those great things. Um, I'm coming with a different hat on tonight. I'm representing the Minneapolis NAACP, and I'm coming for a couple of reasons. My first and foremost is um, in reference to the meeting that took place in November. Uh, some people already talked about it, but my focus is not on the process of hiring what took place then, because that we can go out many different places with that, because the process was followed. Rather, the person who got the job was who people wanted or not. The process was followed. Um, but my bigger concern was what took place at that meeting. The, the disrespect um, from our, you know, from our board who represents the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. What took place was, I, I'm very appalled. Uh, first and foremost by you, Commissioner Forney. You owe Mary Merrill Anderson an apology, an open apology. What you did as a commissioner is uncalled for. And I have to call you out on it because it's very disrespectful. As individuals, we have our own ideas and our own personal beliefs, and that's fine. If somebody has a disagreement, there's ways that we can deal with that. But what we need right now is some healing for our organization to move forward and to get better. Because at the end and the beginning of the day, the purpose of this goal of our organization is to become a better organization. And we will continue to come, the NAACP, until that apology is given to Mary Merrill Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, our next... Uh... Our next speaker is uh, Annika Bowie. Uh, Annika, are you here this evening? Anika Bowie, is Anika here this evening? I she's en route. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to go back really quick and see if Chip Jenny has come into the room. Is Chip? Chip is still not here. Our next speaker is Ralph X. Ralph, are you here this evening? Ralph. Ralph, if you would uh, come forward and state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record, and you have 90 seconds to address the board. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, peace. My name is Ralph Crowder. Um, just real quick, just very quick. Let me take a deep breath real quick. You know, racial politics is very interesting, and I think that's definitely something that's been happening with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board in many different ways. Um, usually when institutions have liberal faces, uh, they put different people in charge to kind of clear the damage. And I get that. You know, that's happened a lot. I've seen that a lot. So where we are now, and this is just, I don't have any, any stake in none of this. I'm not coming up here begging for money or contracts or anything. So let me be very clear, because I've put in hours upon hours of community service for free for the children that participate in the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. But I find it very ironic that there is a black man coming into leadership. I think this might be the first black man who's been the superintendent, if I'm not mistaken. And all of a sudden there's an issue about the house that he's going to stay in that has been accessible to all superintendents in that position. Then all of a sudden there's a newspaper article today with a very misleading headline saying that he already got a raise before he even started a day of his job. So I just want to keep everybody in mind that serves the children of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Please keep in mind these children are of the most need and they do not have time for all the racial politics because the children suffer the worst. Thank you. So just keep your eyes on that. Thank Th you. Thank you, Ralph, for your comments. Our next speaker uh, is Hafsma Mohammed. Is Hafsma here this evening? Hafsma, if you would come forward, uh, state your name, and if you're comfortable, the address for the public record, and you have 90 seconds to address the board. Welcome. Okay, my name is Hafsa Mohammed, and um, I actually live at 1808 University Avenue, and I'm here representing Salam Cultural Center this evening. Um, we're located at 3141 Northeast Minneapolis, and our center was basically founded on helping the underprivileged East African community in, here in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, we, our aspirations was to build bridges between communities, especially those who come from different environments and being relocated as refugees and immigrants to the United States. Um, as a student, as a student volunteer at Southern Cultural Center, I have time and time again witnessed um, the good work and effort that we put in and seen the changes in our community that we have. We have programs going from uh, after school programs, tutoring for the youth, to uh, English as a second language sessions for our adult members learning how to speak a brand new language, all the way to um, a worship uh, area, designated mosque area. And we're basically saying that we can't keep, continue, we can't thrive, we can't continue to do this good work if we don't have a proper parking area. And that is an issue for us because we have older adults that are trying to get in, disabled persons, children, and as I said before, our building is located at Central Avenue, and it's a very busy area. So we're here to ask the, uh, the board members, especially Commissioner Chris Myers, you are our commissioner, that you have ignored us time and time again, and you even um, approved another similar plan. So we're here to ask the board to do some action. Thank you, Hafsma. Our next speaker is Andre Fisher. Andre, are you here this evening? Uh, Andre... I don't who see our next. That's who presented. Oh, I, Andre. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was our Twin Cities old jazz project. Excuse me. Hi. My name is Anika Bowie. I actually was um, one of the speakers. This came in a thank little you. late. Please excuse me. So, um, for the record, my name is Anika Bowie. I'm the vice president of NAACP Minneapolis. And I um, am here today charged um, with speaking to a harm that was done. 
Um, it's very apparent and knowledgeable that a harm was done to our interim superintendent and that a public apology is demanded on behalf of NAACP Minneapolis. And as we are talking about equity on a state level as well as in Minneapolis, we need to understand that what does that really mean to us? Does that mean just a black face? And if that is just a black face that's in leadership, I think that is totally against what we are asking for around equity because we need to talk about equity in a restoration, restoring harm that's been done on black and brown folks historically in Minneapolis, in Minnesota as well. And I want to actually uh, leave you with a quote by Malcolm X that says the most disrespected person in America we can even put, insert quote, Minneapolis, is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America, quote, Minneapolis, is the black woman. The most neglected person in America, quote, Minneapolis, is the black woman. So if we're talking about equity and those who are the most disrespected, the most under-resourced, the most under, you know, under disenfranchised, we need to talk about how can we give respect and also honor in resources and also understanding of that black women need to be respected and that we should not have any type of politics or any dynamics that we are putting black people against black people. Thank you. As, you're welcome. Thank you, Anika, for your comments. Um, I'm just going to check back and see if Chip Jenny has come in. He was earlier. Uh, Chip was earlier on the list. Is Chip here this evening? Um, and thank you, for Anika, for letting me know that you had come in. Our next speaker is Hassan Hussein. Is Hassan here this evening? Um, Officer Hussein, if you would uh, step forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record, and you have 90 seconds to address the All board. Right. Welcome. My name is Officer Hussein, and I work for Metro Transit Police, and I live in Uptown. Minneapolis is my hometown, my adopted home. What I want to do is I want to talk about the need for the Somali community to have full-fledged Somali speaking officer that works for Minneapolis Park Board. What happens too often is that when we go out and we do a lot of kind of community meetings and we try to educate and inform how the legal system and how this basically country is, and we are responsible, those who don't speak the language. One of the questions is that we don't have an answer, and we've been doing it ever since summer. Every month we have three, four meetings. One of the questions that we don't have an answer for is, I am afraid to use the parks. There are kids that are hanging around. I feel this. And then, it's not an afraid where there's a 911 needs to be called and an officer to be there. It's an afraid where they don't feel comfortable walking around on a summer night at eight o'clock in a, some trailer park in their neighborhood. And we need an ambassador, someone that speaks the language, that's an officer. So if needed to be an officer needs to use, an officer job needs to do. If there is also a need where they kind of miscommunication and informative, we need to do that. Thank you, Officer okay. Hussein. Our next speaker is uh, Jeanette Colby. Uh, Jeanette, if you would come forward and state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record and you have 90 seconds to address the board and welcome. Hi, good evening, Commissioners. I'm Jeanette Colby, and I live near East Cedar Beach in Minneapolis. Um, I'm here tonight to congratulate the board in this month of December on all that you've gotten done this year. Um, thank you very much to Superintendent Mary Merrill for stepping in when it was a challenging position, and good luck to our new Superintendent Bangora. Um, I just want to express, echo some concerns that have been already expressed tonight about how some decisions are being made, um, including um, the decision to name this building without public comment or public input. Um, as wonderful as Superintendent Merrill is, um, we do have processes that we need to follow as a, as a governing body. So I just wanted to make that clear. And I also want to echo the, that I was disappointed to see the level of frustration that some commissioners expressed at the last meeting. And I want to humbly request that you consider for the coming year um, reorganizing your board officers. Thanks. 
Thank you, Ms. Colby. Our next speaker is Al Flowers. Al, are you still here this evening? Al, if you would come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record. And you have uh, 90 seconds to address the board, and welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, 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 Chairman Bourne and uh, uh, board members and uh, interim uh, superintendent Mer Mary Merrill and Anderson Mary Merrill. Which, uh, I, and that's something I want to know with, uh, with the, y'all yeah, know we're gonna rename this headquarters after, and uh, what's the date on that? Can you put that date out so we can make sure we advertise it? And so I can say thank you uh, for bringing back Juneteenth as an African-American descendant of the slave. It was important that uh, you did that at a time when Google is putting out $2 million to have us uh, fighting the police instead of putting that $2 million in the, into our community to help with at-risk kids. I'd rather them do that instead of putting the propaganda and they're going to use our community, have some black, and you know, and they ain't going to give you but twenty five, fifty thousand 50000 to keep us fighting. So to the board, I'm talking about uh, the innovation dollars. When you get ready to start talking about that innovation dollars, don't forget where those at-risk kids they are in our community. Make sure that those dollars come to our community to help kids. It's got to, you know, you get, it's not a lot of money, but you can split it, you can make it right for a lot of communities, and let's be fair to everybody. Let's be fair and make it fair and get that and uh, do, uh, do the right uh, thing. And, uh, and I hope that uh, in the uh, coming year that uh, we all, that we all do better with, uh, with it, uh, uh, being equitable to all communities, particularly ours, the African-American descendant of the slave. And I'm going to keep saying that. Don't forget that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Our next speaker is uh, Kelly Jacobson. Uh, Kelly, are you, or Kelly or Kellen, um, if you would uh, correct me and uh, you uh, and state Kellen. your, thank Kellen you. Jacobs. Thank you. And if you uh, state your address, if you're comfortable and you have 90 seconds to address the board, welcome. Yeah, I live on 33rd and Longfellow. Um, so I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Minneapolis, and I've been a coach of the Minneapolis Park and Recs in different athletics for over eight years. I'm also a, a realtor resource for my community, and I'm here today because we currently have a, a master plan that does not include basketball at our park. Um, I believe that it provides an opportunity for a lot of people in our neighborhoods that may or may not currently use the park to enjoy the park. So we've, um, with the help of A.K. Hassan, as well as the park director put up two temporary hoops, which since they've happened, we've seen all these new faces. We've seen families coming out and really enjoying the park, and it's been, it's been really awesome. The current plan calls for two community gardens in our very small park. I don't know if you're familiar with Corcoran, but it is a very small park. And what I'm asking is that we can take one of those community gardens, move it to a larger park, possibly Powderhorn, in order to have basketball there because I do think it um, provides activities for kids that really need it, as well as adults exercise in this technology ridden world um, stress relief all the above so what I'm asking from you guys first and foremost is what we can do as a community to make that happen and what you're willing to do as elected members to also make sure that happens so I will follow up with all of you um, some of you may have been invited to the event that we did it was called the hoops up celebration great turnout we had over 100 families come out and enjoy the park that day um, so I'm very proud of that and I hope that this can happen sometime soon in the next year or so to get this, because I know the plan comes into place soon. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you having us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Um, Corcoran, Corcoran Park. Corcoran Park. Corcoran. And there's a, multiple people from our community that are also here that I'm trying to represent tonight as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Russ Grigsby. Uh, is Russ here this evening? Russ, if you would state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record, and you have 90 seconds to address the board, and welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Russ Grigsby, 3506 22nd Avenue South, also in Corcoran Park, and uh, I'm a, a community member, also a, a pastor. I served on the uh, Corcoran Neighborhood Organization for a year as an editor of the newspaper. Um, I was a part of the first uh, meeting uh, that was uh, taken as uh, input gathering for the community in terms of what uh, the future would look like for the park. And I, I can say that I, I was glad to be a part of that meeting. Um, Kellen didn't have the opportunity to be a part of that, uh, but I don't think anyone uh, really uh, quite understood what uh, the vision that Kellen has, has presented at, at the time. Uh, when he had this hoops up uh, party, it, it was incredible. Um, 
there, there were over 100 uh, people in attendance. And since then, uh, with these uh, portable hoops, uh, the, the park is, at least the basketball court, has been filled. And so uh, it's just, it's a great site. I would love to see it uh, continue uh, in a permanent way. Um, I'll just say that uh, obviously gardening is, is a huge part of, of our community, and I get that. Um, but I, I definitely see this as being uh, equally valid, and um, especially for the youth, um, uh, uh, giving them access to a, a permanent uh, basketball court. So uh, thank you, Commissioner Hassan, uh, for your work as well. And uh, yeah, I, I would also just add that um, if uh, any of you commissioners uh, could come and actually take a look at, at what's happening, it, it really is exciting. I, now with no snow on the ground, there's, uh, there's still uh, people playing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grigsby. That's my uh, final speaker for open time just before we, we might have another speaker for open time, but I'll still uh, say what I was going to say. Uh, typically, uh, one thing I neglected to do tonight is I'll refer people if they have a specific question, if they were looking for some follow-up. Uh, in this corner of the room, we have Assistant uh, Superintendent Michael Schroeder. So if your questions were related to pro, uh, uh, park design, uh, you can talk to him if Michael can raise his hand uh, just during the meeting. We also have Assistant Superintendent Jeremy Barrick if you had any environmental or operational concerns that, you would like, that you'd that you like to follow up with. And Assistant Superintendent Tyrese Cox if you have any recreational uh, concerns. So the three of them are available during the meeting and you can touch base with them. I think we might have a couple more speakers signed up. We so Informed. We have no shortage of folks that have signed up in time. Well, these are public. these are public hearing. Got it. So we have two two speakers only. Okay. So we have one more speaker. Um, uh, Fartoon Hassan is Fartoon here this evening. Uh, Fartoon. Uh, Fartoon, if you would like to come forward, state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record. And you have uh, as soon as. You will have 90 seconds to address the board. Okay. Welcome. Hello, everybody. My name is Fortun Deo, and I'm a owner at Cedar Business. Um, today, I come here uh, about prime coil community. The prime coil, I have a question. What is it for? First. Second, um, prime coil is the only place that are on Cedar Avenue. We have uh, so many kids, different ages. Uh, the last couple of years, Brian Cole was not for the community. It does, it's locked. We don't know what's going on. As a parent, when we try to get in, the, manage, the management or the employee or the who doing the homework help are not friendly to the people. We don't have enough space. There's only one basketball court, and that's for business, I believe, because it's not for the community. We are bright, different communities. We have a ch six children. We have the elders, we have a youth, we have a um, underage. So the need in this our community is not working with that specific area. And that's the only place we have. Uh, we would like to have more places, but right now what we have is we don't have enough funding. There's a lack of funding, there's no opportunity for the kids. We end up youth problem. Every mother in Cedar Avenue have grief, they lost kids and um, to do drugs. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Fartoon. Uh, that is our last uh, speaker signed up for open time. Okay. Uh, that is our last speaker signed up for open time. We are going back to um, resolution 2018 319, and I believe Commissioner Meyer had the floor for, uh, for questions. Chief Ohado can answer them, hopefully. Uh, President Bourne, Commissioner Meyer, I believe the first question is, is why don't we get any rent yeah. for this lease? Um, the State Patrol is part of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, another public agency who we have a lot of cooperation with. Um, and essentially, how they use our space is not any sort of exclusive use. So as a partnership and, and um, collaboration with with another public public entity, the state of Minnesota, um, we have we have not charged for that space, and uh, frankly, I don't believe the state patrol typically pays for space in that in that way. 
Um, so for, first you described it as a, a lease for clarification in, in the document it says it's not a lease it's a license I don't know what the difference is in this case but um, how, how much space are we talking about so they have no exclusive use of any okay. space so what we do is because of because of our proximity to I-94 especially uh, the state patrol has asked uh, since 2012 if they can stop by our office uh, the park police office and have access to the toilets uh, the break room and a common area where they can sit and occasionally write reports okay do we have an idea of how much value is attached to that i i can't think of a way to quantify that all right, that's all the questions. Thank you. Commissioner Meyer, I think, did Superintendent Merrill, did you have a? I was going to ask that for him to quantify. I was just going to suggest that he share how they're using the space, and he did that. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. I have uh, Commissioner French followed by Commissioner Severson. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, how long is the lease? I believe it's like four years. Is maybe wrong? Commissioner um, French and uh, Chair Cogill, I believe it's three years. Three years. It'll start in February of 2019 and go until 2022. Is there, <laughs> is there, is there any uh, opposition to make sure that, that we can make this lease a year to year lease so we can maybe? I believe it has been in the past. It just ends up being sort of um, cumbersome to keep amending it every year. So it's just because it's sort of a very small license and and as um, was pointed out it is not a lease it is a license it's just sort of like a, a parking permit so that there's no space that is being designated they have no right to say this is the space we get to exclude any of the park board from any particular space it's just uh, their ability to come in as he said and use the bathroom and sit and write reports they they get it they kind of get in where they fit in so um, and so that it is this three years otherwise it just becomes we come before you and ask for another amendment the next year and it just becomes a little cumbersome so why not just do it for three years and I, it wasn't yeah. other than that I'd, I'd really like to see it uh, maybe possibly a year to year so we can reevaluate I'm sorry reevaluate the license every year uh, I don't know if other board members are up for that but I'd, I'd like at least for us to that have a long drawn out three year license where we can't make decisions within side of the three years. Yeah, and I would also, um, if I could add with a the license, there, there is a termination clause in this in, we, in which we could terminate this. So although it is a, a term, I believe of three years, it is, it is easily terminated by, I believe, both parties, if I could actually go to back to the original, um, document and that's included in the materials that was uh, attached to the uh, resolution does it have to be clause or actually it's um in the original document under section six six one pursuant to this the license is subject to cancellation upon 30 days written notice by the licensee for any reason and also the licensor um, may agree that expiration um, earlier so there is uh, a way to to cancel the, the license thank you very much thank you Commissioner French uh, Commissioner Severson uh, I would actually support that as well I, I don't think it's cumbersome to review these kind of um, policies and our leases or licensing uh, do we do this for anybody anyone else do we offer space for free to the NAACP, perhaps, if they want office space, a parking space? Do we offer this to the Boys and Girls Club, Minneapolis Public Schools? Uh, President Bourne, um, Commissioner Severson, uh, I don't have enough organizational knowledge to answer that question. I can speak to the Park Police Office, and the only people that we uh, permit this sort of formal access to is the Minnesota State Patrol. Do we, in return, use any of the Minnesota State Patrol space? Uh, President Bourne, Commissioner Severson, one of the reasons why the State Patrol wants access to our space is because they typically don't have space. Uh, troopers uh, bring their squad cars home. 
they start their shift from their driveway and they head to their, their assigned districts. And so within those districts, the state patrol has sought out places so that troopers can, can use the bathroom and, and eat their lunch. Uh, that's why they've targeted and, and requested our space here right off of the Broadway exit on I-94. Chief Ohado, can you tell me what are the benefits of the residents of city of Minneapolis, particularly North Minneapolis residents, of allowing them to use space for free in our facilities? So President Bourne and, and Commissioner Severson, um, the, the benefit analysis that we did um, has a couple of points. Uh, I'm not sure that the benefit analysis ties directly to the residents of, of North Minneapolis, uh, but it does benefit this organization and, and maybe um, subsequently uh, our community as a whole. So as I'm sure all of you know, uh, the Park Police Department is off duty between 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning. Uh, one of the things that having troopers stop by this office does is it provides some 24-hour security coverage patrols uh, that benefit us at no cost. Uh, in addition, the State Patrol has provided training to our officers um, around accident investigation, traffic enforcement, uh, the use of speed detection equipment. Uh, the other thing they do is they provide support during the Minneapolis bike tour. Um, they usually cover the intersection of Worth Parkway and Highway 55 at no cost to the organization. So from one to seven, what kind of security control do they offer? Uh, President Bourne, uh, Commissioner Severson, uh, they, are, they are in this parking lot. They are stopping by our office frequently on the course of their regular assignment. And, and this is fenced in over here, correct? So it's not like open air. Um, Commissioner Severson, the south part of our uh, lot that's adjacent to Broadway Pizza was recently fenced about a year ago. And we need additional security with the fencing? Um, Commissioner Severson, within that parking lot, we have well over a million dollars worth of mobile equipment, and I think uh, added security uh, is never a bad thing. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I don't know. The the last place I think a thief might show up is to a police department parking lot to take something, but that's just my opinion, but okay. Thank you, Chief Ohado. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer for the second time. Thank you. Uh, just one more question. What did we, what did the troopers do before 2012? Did they go somewhere else? Uh, President Bourne, Commissioner Meyer, uh, I don't, I don't know, I'm sorry. I would assume that they had another um, place that they went, but I don't, I don't know what their history was prior to 2012. I'm not opposed to them leasing the space from us, but I'm going to vote against this at this time because I think we should be asking for compensation in exchange. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Um, I'm sorry I didn't see the order after Commissioner French. It was French. Uh, I'll go to Musich since that will be for the first time. Um, Hassan and then Severson for the second time. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to remember. Okay, question. then French, Musich, Hassan. <clears throat> I, a question I have to ask. Uh, there was an incident last summer with a uh, Minnesota Highway Patrol. Uh, do we know if that car was stationed here? Was that one of the patrol vehicles that was actually stationed here at the park board? Uh, President Bourne, Commissioner French. Um, there, there are no, to be clear, there are no troopers who are stationed out of our office. Uh, they use this as a temporary place to take a break in the course of their shift. My understanding of the, the situation, the knowledge that I have of the situation that took place at Bohannon Park last, this last year uh, involved a trooper who was conducting traffic enforcement on I-94 and was not at the park police office. Is there, is there a possibility that that trooper might have used our facilities here? Is there a possibility? <laughs> Certainly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Bourne. Uh, Chief Ohado, if I understand correctly, we are essentially providing a rest area to state troopers that are doing their jobs in the vicinity of Minneapolis, is that correct? President Bourne, Commissioner Musich, yes, that's correct. Okay, and if we were to um, 
discontinue this relationship with them. There would be no one uh, patrolling our lots at night. We would not have the free coverage of the intersection of 55 and the parkway, I forget which one. And potentially they would just utilize another public police space within the city. Would that be an accurate assessment of the changes that would occur if we were to discontinue this license? Commissioner Musage, yes, that's an accurate summary. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Musage, uh, Vice President Hassan, followed by Commissioner Vita. Thank you, President Mon. Uh, Chief Arum, uh, the question I have is, I, they have been already using the space. Is this the first time you brought lease before the board? Uh, President Bourne, Commissioner Hassan, uh, no, I think this is the fourth renewal of this license. Uh, each prior renewal has been approved by the board. Uh, the first lease uh, was back in early 2012. Uh, at that point, I was not the park police chief, and I, I presume that the prior park police chief brought that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Hassan, Commissioner Vita. Thank you, President Bourne. I don't, I don't have a question, Chief Apollo. I just want to speak to uh, partnerships and just um, make the point that um, this, to me, is more about a partnership with the state. And I just want us to be mindful that the state gives us over $15 million a year. And I think that that equates to a lot more than them, uh, us allowing their staff to use the bathroom here. So I just want us to be mindful of the partnership that we have with the state as the co-chair of the legislative committee. Um, we, we, look for them, we look for them to give us quite a bit of money to fund a lot of our work here at the park board. So. I, I just want us to take a step back and think about the overall partnership that we have with the state. They do us a huge favor, and I don't think us letting them park their cars and using our toilets is that big of a favor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Vita. Is there any other discussion? Um, Chair Cogill. I suppose there is, uh, since this came out of my committee and there were no questions about it the first time, I suppose I'm <laughs> vaguely surprised um, now. Um, a lot of folks voted for it. Um, and I, I suppose I would uh, say that I'm supportive right now of this. I certainly understand my fellow commissioners' uh, concerns about policing and interactions with folks on the north side. Um, I don't think that um, the goodwill relationship that we have with the state um, on just allowing bathroom breaks for people who are serving our, our state is the right way to go about trying to um, address some of those concerns. Um, so I would, uh, at this point, really urge folks to allow for this uh, small, not even a lease, a license agreement. Thank you, Chair Cogill. Is there any further discussion? Um, seeing that, I, I have a couple of just brief questions and points of clarification. My first is to counsel. Uh, this is a license and not a lease. I'm assuming that this requires uh, five votes to pass uh, to pass the board and not six. You're correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, I, the, I'm I'm personally torn on on this as well as not a uh, not being a member of, not being a member of the committee. This is my first opportunity to uh, speak to it. I, I'm appreciative of the partnership that we do have with the State Patrol. Um, I echo a lot of uh, what I am hearing as concerns from some of my colleagues. Um, the, uh, while we do have partnerships with the state, I, I don't think we have any similar agreements with the Department of Natural Resources, the uh, MMB, MnDOT, so many other state agencies. We don't have the, uh, this is a unique partnership and I'm all for partnering with the state, but this is a, this is a unique partnership. Um, and we, have some other items on on the agenda tonight that we're going to be discussing around um, law enforcement community relations and I, I I do think especially with the event earlier this year in Commissioner Severson's district that uh, that does bring up a lot of um, I think there are a lot of relevant questions um, Miss Downey and uh, Chief Ohado the the three years so I understand this right this has come up as a year-to-year -year license has is the suggestion of a change to a three-year license is that a request from the state or the um, uh, state patrol or is that a recommendation of staff 
I believe that was from the state. That's a that's a uh, that's a recommendation from the state. Um, would the state still? You might not know the answer to this, but would the state still accept a one-year agreement, which is uh, the agreements that we have passed year after year since 2012? I, I apologize. The uh, previous amendments have been two years, so this the previous is actually, amendments have been two years. actually just okay. an additional additional year. So, okay. um, I am not aware of what their stance would be on the one year less of the amendment. So, because we didn't, because folks didn't bring up their questions at at the committee level. So, um, uh, uh, so I do appreciate the position that it sounds like a lot of my colleagues are in. Um, so I also understand, and this might be to Ms. Downey and to Council under the original agreement item 6.1, 2, and 3 of termination. If I'm understanding this right, any party can terminate this agreement at any time, provided there's a 30-day notice. Am I understanding that correctly? You know, I would defer to Council Rice on this. I have not had a chance to actually review this, so I read this sure. very quickly. So okay. maybe he can take Con a quick Council Rice, would you be able to address that? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. President, yes. Um, Ms. Downey, as you know, handles these matters and does an excellent job on it. I do recall this coming through uh, about six years ago, and my recollection is uh, that, yeah, it's terminable by either party on 30 days' notice, but I'm in the process of trying to confirm that in the agreement. Um, and I, with no more lights on, I guess I'm going to have to confirm that now. Yeah, w <laughs> would you mind taking a moment? Because it, it, if this, uh, well, Council Rice is confirming if that is the case, um, I would be supportive of I would be supportive of this license. Um, I'm hearing some concerns from commissioners. If there is a concern about remuneration, if there is a concern about partnering, that is something that this board can bring forward. Uh, if that understanding of termination is correct, um, Mr. President, it is 30 days that for any is, reason. For any reason. Okay, so I would encourage commissioners that have, I, I will be supporting this. Um, I would co uh, encourage any commissioners that have concerns that there is a way to address those concerns. They can bring them through their relevant committees if there are any changes that they would like to see to this agreement. Um, but it is a really challenging position to put staff and our partners in uh, after something comes through committee. Um, if we did not approve this tonight, uh, I don't even know how we, I think we're required to give notice for them to move out, and I don't think we could meet the notice period for them to move out for when, for when, it, for when it expires. The lease um, expires January 31st. So okay, so I, I, stand corrected on, I stand corrected on that. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Meyer. But um, I think my point still stands that it would be putting some of our partners in a very difficult position. They share a lot of the concerns that were expressed here this evening, and I would encourage any colleagues that, ha that want to bring those up through committee. I think that... Chief Ohado and Ms. Downey and Council Rice would be very willing, and Superintendent Bangor would be very willing to look at this uh, through through different lenses. So I will be supporting this. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I would still, uh, while it doesn't require six votes, I would still ask the secretary to take a roll. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. No. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Hassan. Aye. President Forn. Aye. You have seven ayes, two nays. The resolution passes. Uh, Chair Kogel. On behalf of the Administration and Finance Committee, I'll move resolution 2018-333, resolution accepting the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's ADA action plan. Uh, it has been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, discuss this at the last meeting, uh, but my request to have a bathroom break was rejected. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to step out at some point, and I thought that this would be a long study item, but you guys were already over it with it by the time we got back. Um, but I just wanted to highlight this because this was a tremendous piece of work that we that staff did on this and there are so many great things uh, that we're doing in there um, I mean it's it's a long document I, I won't go through all of them but 
um, you know, changing policies uh, to help people with service animals and with food allergies and with hearing problems or vision issues. Um, this is a really forward-looking plan that really helps make our parks more accessible to everybody. And um, you know, I want to get the word out there to anyone listening that you know, um, you know we have interpretive services uh, for people who are blind. They can request things like the agendas to be provided in Braille. You know, there, there are a lot of opportunities there. So I just really want to applaud staff for this this great ADA plan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner, <coughs> I just want to echo what Commissioner Myers was uh, saying as. Sometimes I've worked with, uh, I've coached kids with disabilities for a lot of years, uh, and I can't tell you how we'll go to some gym sometimes and everything's not accessible. We might have to walk a block or something to get to a certain place. So this is this is a game changer. Appreciate staff for working on this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner French. Is there any other discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll just also echo my gratitude for staff's work and for all the community that has given engagement over a number of years to bring this policy forward. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all of those in favor of Resolution 2018-333, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Chair Kogel. Uh, on behalf of Admin and Finance, I will uh, move Resolution 2018-335. A resolution approving a lease agreement with Aaron Taylor Fine Art, leasing commercial space at 3104 Pacific Street North, Unit 200M, located within the above the Falls Regional Park for a term of three years, effective January the 1st, 2019, and expiring December 31st, 2021. 2018-335 has been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I would ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Musish. Aye. Commissioner Kogan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Hassan. Aye. President Born. Aye. You have nine ayes. Uh, the motion carries. Chair Kogel. I'll move resolution 2018-336, resolution approving an amendment to the 2018 Capital Improvement Program reallocating portions of 20-year Neighborhood Park Plan Rehabilitation Program funds. 2018-336 uh, has been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on 2018-336? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The 2018-336 uh, carries. Moving into unfinished business, um, I would um, entertain a re uh, resolution 9.1, approving the employment agreement with Al Bangoras uh, for <laughs> superintendent of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Is there a motion? So moved. It has been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I saw Commissioner Musich, followed by Commissioner... Meyer. Uh, I'll also, followed by Commissioner Forney, I'll note that we have a 6.30 public hearing in the planning committee as we start moving into questions. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Porn. Um, I have a question for council. I'm wondering if you might be able to provide me with an example of how the board would force the superintendent to resign um, in item 10C. Oh, sorry, not 10C. 10D, it says no severance payment will be paid to Bangora if he voluntarily resigns his position as superintendent, provided, however, this clause does not apply. It should Bangora be forced to resign by the board? Yes, I can answer that. Um, I think in employment situations, um, if yeah, the, the superintendent Bangora specifically asked for that. Um, there are resignations and then there are requested resignations. Um, and so I think that uh, what he was saying that um, if he was truly being um, uh, discharged, that the uh, severance pay would kick in. And the reason this notion of voluntary resignation uh, came in was because the last superintendent contact track we had was 
it didn't matter. Uh, six months severance was due whether the re it was a voluntary resignation or whatever. So I, I took it from the discussion we had earlier in the year. Several concerns were raised by board members about the public policy of paying that or not paying it. Frankly, it was a provision that was agreed to by the board. It was in the contract. Um, and uh, this is an attempt to say that there will be no severance if it's a voluntary resignation, that I, I'm gone. I just, I'm going to resign for whatever re personal reasons a person might have. Um, it, as we explored it with uh, Mr. Bangora, the question was, okay, I resign because I want to go, or I resign because my choice was to be fired. And we certainly see that in employment situations where people are kind of offered an opportunity. You can either go or be fired. Your choice. And I guess I'm unclear in what situation we would choose to pay someone um, essentially more than most people in the city of Minneapolis make in a year um, if they're choosing to resign. I, I don't, I'm <laughs> unclear on what an example it, it, of forced to resign is that isn't termination. Resign or be fired. Right, why wouldn't we just fire someone? It would be much more because, fiscally responsible for the city I mean, of Minneapolis. Because if, if we fire them, excuse me, Mr. President, Commissioner Musich, I, under the provision that we've had for every superintendent since Dave Fisher and probably before, at least every superintendent I'm familiar with, you can only discharge a superintendent for just cause. Right. That's a standard that applies to any of our uh, employees who have collected bargaining agreements or are covered by the civil service uh, provisions of the uh, uh, city. Um, just cause is a fairly high standard um, that involves not only a reason but a process. Um, the, we, uh, under this agreement and our prior agreements, a superintendent could be fired for just cause. In that case, no severance is due. If, however, a superintendent is uh, discharged for some other reason, like we just want you to go. We're not giving you a reason. You're gone. In those cases, we have provided a severance payment um, for at least 20 years. That amounts to six months. And in a position like this that's at the top of the organization, um, granted it's uh, a, a very, it's the most expensive individual contract for an employee that the board has. Um, but I think we're seeing, you know, there's been a big discussion about the salary of the University of Minnesota president, um, the Art Institute, other uh, Places that come over the weekend, there was a story about nonprofit salaries. They're very high, and in order to attract talent at this level, a provision like this and contracts are not at all uncommon. Uh, Mr. Bangor is coming several hundred, if not thousand, two thousand miles to come here. His family's moving in. Um, uh, I, I personally don't think it's unreasonable that in that case that if he's coming his security is limited to a term and uh, if he's asked to leave or if he's fired he may have to find employment at another level at that same level that's not in this community. Thank you, uh, Council Rice. I'm going to recess the full board to go into planning where uh, if Commissioner Forney could act on the public here, if Chair Forney could act on the public hearing and item 5.1, the associated the associated resolution. Oh, both. Uh, okay. So I am uh, recessing the, uh, I'm recessing the regular meeting to go into planning, Chair Forney. Thank you. On behalf of the planning committee, excuse me, I'd like to call the meeting to the order with the secretary. Please call the roll. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Severson. Here. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Vice Chair Kogia. Here. Chair Forney. Here. Do you have a quorum? I'd like to uh, make uh, have a motion to approve the agenda with the amendment um, to the agenda of um, a study report item 6.3, Planning Division 2018 Accomplishments. Do I need to second it? Uh, I will do so. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor of the uh, amended uh, agenda and agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Abstentions? So moved. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 28th, 2018. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. 
Okay, I'm going to open up the public hearing um, for uh, to amend the South Service Area Master Plan to include the CPRO site. And um, so if we could have a um, presentation of that, and it sounds like we'd have a few people who want to speak. So, Adam, please. Excellent, Chair Forney, uh, Commissioners. Um, I have a very brief presentation about um, both the uh, specific item related to the public hearing, which is an amendment of the South Service Area Master Plan, uh, but also essentially Action 5.1 on your agenda, all of which are, are fairly interlinked. Um, this all has to do with the potential acquisition of the CPRO green space from Hennepin County by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Um, tonight in uh, Resolution 2018-351, there are four pieces that you will consider kind of all at once and they all go together to make this a possibility should you choose to act on it. Number one is to authorize a cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for a free transfer of the CPRO site to MPRB. The second piece is to accept a $300,000 grant for the phase two improvements of that site and that grant would be again from Hennepin County. We do need to amend the South Service Area Master Plan essentially to accept the concept plan for the CPRO site that was developed in collaboration with MPRB and the county. And that is the specific item on which there's a public hearing tonight, but clearly I expect people might speak about any of these uh, particular pieces. And then the fourth one is to initiate a naming process for this site. CPRO refers to the grain elevator that used to sit there, so we might wanna rethink that. Um, the CPRO site is 1.65 acres right on the Midtown Greenway. Um, it is shown here in the yellow box. Uh, it's between 10th Avenue South and 11th Avenue South in the Midtown Phillips neighborhood. Um, it does include the only fully ADA accessible uh, uh, route to the Greenway in the uh, trench portion of, that, of the Greenway. Um, the CPRO elevator, which used to occupy the site, was acquired by Hennepin County in order to implement uh, this phase of the Greenway. It was demolished in early 2004. Um, and in all, on the acquisition, the demolition, and build out of this site as it exists today, the county has spent $7.5 million to date. The policy foundation for us bringing this forward is in the South Service Area Master Plan. Uh, action number 12 spe specifically suggests seeking additional parkland or private land available for public use, which you'll hear about in the next action, uh, in the Greenway Corridor west of Hiawatha and at Hiawatha uh, and Lake Street. So essentially, this uh, was a refinement of the comprehensive plans search area and the CPRO site, which is that blue star, uh, sits directly within uh, this, this park search area. There's been quite a lot of community engagement around this site uh, over the years, over more than a decade, um, mainly led by Hennepin County. Uh, and I will note if there are questions for Hennepin County, uh, Crystal Myslack is here uh, this evening to answer them. Um, Hennepin County, as the owner of the site at that time, began in 2004 to envision what it could be as a public green space. Um, there was a public review process and then a visioning process again in 2009, which involved community groups um, and just uh, folks using the site. Uh, there was some construction that took place at that time, including the access ramps, some seating, natural plantings, and there was also programming that took place on the site during these years. In 2015, there was a placemaking residency event, which again asked the community what they wanted to do. And one of the things that came out of that was the question of what is the ultimate future of this site. That's when the park board got involved and I began working with Hennepin County in 2016 to consider how, what would be the steps maybe to have this become a full-fledged Minneapolis park. In 2016, we convened a design workshop with the community, uh, the county, uh, MPRB staff and other stakeholders. And we also attended the 2017 Midtown Phillips annual community meeting uh, to show off an initial concept and gauge community reaction to that. The basic vision has held true kind of all the way through since the county started um, envisioning the site in 2004 all the way through to this uh, most recent Midtown uh, Phillips community meeting. The priorities have always been universal design, <clears throat> bike and pet safety, healthy foods, physical activity, and then community events and family programming. So the concept that was developed really tries to look at each of those and put that on the site in a way that capitalizes on the existing conditions and adds a few more things that will make this even more usable as a park. So today, the pieces that are existing to navigate, the Greenway is down at the bottom here. 10th Avenue and 11th Avenue do bridge the Greenway. So the entire sl site slopes downward toward the Greenway. This pathway, this Y-shaped pathway, um, is existing today, as are the pathways over here and most of the seating in this location, as well as much of the native plantings on the slope. 
There are some fruit trees that have been planted in the upper portion of the site. Those are all what we consider phase one improvements. The master plan would go beyond that and do some additional things. Some co a connecting path from 10th. This is a key desire line for community members right now. Um, a stage down at the lowest portion of the park with seating and a graded amphitheater, um, all accessible. Um, an improved picnic area with a small picnic shelter. Additional urban agriculture opportunities in the northern edge of the site, so expanding that. And then using the grade in this location to create a small adventure style playground. And then also including utilities, water, and electrical to serve both the urban ag, the picnicking use, as well as the stage use. The, the policy foundation of the concept plan, we again look to the South Service Area Master Plan. Um, we felt when developing this concept that the CPRO site could provide some desired recreational amenities that aren't available or even master planned into the Midtown Phillips area, most notably at Stewart Park, uh, which does lack and is not master planned to have some of these uh, pieces. Expansion of urban agriculture is something that's obviously we have a, a whole policy plan around it. We have an adopted community garden policy now. Um, and the South Service Area Master Plan Action 19 calls for additional sites. Adventure play would increase the diversity of play options. In the South Service Area Master Plan, uh, there was an action related to that too. Um, natural areas, the South Service Area Master Plan calls for natural areas in most parks. And the performance area and stage would be a new feature in the Midtown Phillips neighborhood. As part of this concept, we prepared a cost estimate. As we do in our Service Area Master Plans, we follow the same format. And I just want to highlight that the $300,000 grant that's coming from Hennepin County wasn't selected out of thin air. We actually looked at some things that would probably be implementable in the short term, most notably, most notably some more naturalized areas, the urban agriculture area, utilities most notably, and then um, some additional trails, and then the grading, earthwork, and stage. So uh, most things except maybe the full playground, but really looking at trying to get that performance space in there and to better serve with utilities the facilities that are there. And the cost estimate of that runs to about $270,000. And so the 300 dollars is specifically designed to implement what we consider to be a good phase two project. The maintenance estimate, um, if the park obviously comes into the, the park board system, we would begin maintaining that. Um, the best estimates that we have at this point is that the South Service Area Master Plan prepared a per acre cost across the South Service Area. And that was a real cost. If we adjust that for inflation, the per acre cost is about $13,400. Obviously, that's a general average. But if you apply that to the CPRO site, uh, the operations would cost an additional roughly $22,000 uh, a year. The next steps, if the board acts affirmatively tonight and then in February, we would execute the formal agreement uh, with the county, uh, prepare our final due diligence, and then file the land transfer. Uh, we would also, in 2019, initiate uh, the phase two design and construction project, which would include community engagement, we would probably want to install some general park use sites so people are aware of our rules. Um, and then operations and maintenance by MPRB would begin. In addition, in 2019, the site would receive an equity ranking um, and would be eligible for CIP funding. But we would take into account the phase two expenditure. So that would essentially count against the park. And then also planning staff would initiate a naming process by requesting nominations from the community and from the board as a first step. We'll also create a park packet for the CPRO site and install that into the South Service Area Master Plan. You noted in my background that much of the background information would actually become that park packet and thereby the master plan for that park. So the narrative that it's included in your background, um, you would be essentially, uh, that is the amendment to the Service Area Master Plan uh, that you would be approving. Uh, and with that, I will conclude and return it to you, uh, Chair Forney. Thank you, Adam, for the presentation. Um, I will open up the um, public hearing at this point. Um, there is some confusion that I just wanted uh, everybody to know. Um, a lot of people I know signed up for the open time, which is at 5.30, which is our general time to address the board with concerns. And then there were people who signed up for this public hearing, which is about amending the South Service um, Area Plan. Um, I'm going to begin with the people who we think um, all uh, signed up for the public hearing regarding uh, the amending the South Service. And then I'm going to move to the people who might have thought that they were um, uh, um, speak, just speaking at, at open time. So um, I apologize that. So initially what I'm going to do is the people who signed up for the um, CPRO, I'm going to say um, you have um, three minutes. So I'm going to call each one of you if you want to just kind of cue yourself up and everything. And um, 
share your name and your address. And um, the first person is Donna Nest. I think that's correct. And then after that is Soren Jensen. And then Rand um, Ruther Ruderstaff. Sorry if yeah, I got that wrong. Huh? I'm just going Smith. <laughs> Smith. <laughs> okay. Anyway, is Donna here? Yes. Okay, Donna, please come forward. Yes, I won't even take um, three minutes, but I am here. I'm very excited about this plan, and I'm here to encourage you to um, do this acquisition for the CPO site um, in the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, my goal is to ride my bike 100 miles a week, and usually I meet that goal. Wow. And, but this wow. summer, uh, I, f I was coming down um, that ramp, that uh, goes into the um, into the uh, greenway, and um, I skidded on uh, some gravel at the bottom of it, fell off my bike, and broke my elbow. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I think it needs some improvements. Um, and I am I'm a resident of Midtown. I love that area. I love that ramp, in fact, except for that um, problem at the end of it. And um, I just am excited about uh, improving it. So um, I, I just urge you to vote to acquire it and do that with Hennepin County. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. So Soren. Good evening, Chair Forney and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Soren Jensen. I'm the Executive Director of the Midtown Greenway Coalition. Actually, I've been working next to this site for the past uh, seven years. Uh, and uh, in my office, uh, there was a picture of it actually. Um, I overlooked this site, so I'm very familiar with this. Um, for those of you who don't know the Midtown Greenway Coalition, we were the nonprofit that had the idea for the Greenway, and then we worked with our partners to get it built. Uh, to get it built. Um, and I would like to very much thank Hennepin County for all of their work on the site um, and for all the resources they put into it. Um, however, I will echo what the first speaker said. Um, we've long noted that it needed some additional support. Uh, one of the first things that I found when I started is someone came uh, wheeled in uh, the top of a picnic table that was there. They just wheeled it into our office because a lot of people say, Can, you know, you must do everything on the Greenway. And well, we don't do everything <laughs> on the Greenway, but uh, as a small nonprofit, we do what I can. But we didn't really know what to do at the top of that table. Uh, and, it, and actually, it took a while to figure out who's going to fix the table. And so uh, back then, I thought, you know, the park board <laughs> knows how to fix a table um, and knows how to run a park. And so um, I have long advocated for this to happen. Uh, so I'm thrilled. I come uh, to support this, to speak in support of this uh, agreement and also the concept plan. I was part of the group that worked on this concept plan, so very excited about that. Uh, and I will tell you, I'm also very excited about the uh, uh, performance space and, and the stage area. We actually, uh, for the past couple of summers, have uh, gotten ourselves a permit and done some live music on this spot, exactly where that amphitheater um, is set. And so we see the Greenway as uh, an incredible resource for the community. We see the site as uh, a, a terrific green space. We very much support green spaces along the Greenway. Uh, and so thank you to Hennepin County and thank you to the Park Board for considering this. And uh, we urge you, um, the volunteers and the members of the Midtown Greenwood Coalition, to support this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Zorn. And your yeah, continuing advocacy. Rand. My name is Rand Rudd. Who's Crystal? Hi, I'm Rand. I'm Rand Rudderath. I'm Black Club leader. Uh, I live 2744 11th Avenue. And um, some of what Soren said wasn't our experience. And I don't need to go into the details of it. You'll see in the picture, uh, first of all, on the one hand, are a group of volunteers that are our Black Club. We're the ones who planted there. Uh, courtesy of Hennepin County, we were able to get a grant for $8,000 from NRP and the county facilitated getting some plants for us. And you'll notice on there, three of the people are over 80. One of the women had just had chemotherapy that morning. Another one had breast cancer. Another one isn't pictured. You'll also see two men on that picture. Both men are in excess of 80. 
they're the ones who have been down there picking up the trash this significant amount of time. The one man uh, was mugged, beaten up, and had his glasses broken, and this is fairly recent. Um, we were not involved in any of this planning process, and we're the ones who live right next door. We're the ones who, after they wasted $168,000, came forward and said, we got to do something. We've had bodies, we've got bottles, we've got needles. You can see the box of needles. Though All of those needles are found between approximately 10th and 18th. So not all of them are the CPRO site, but a significant number of them are. I found crack pipes down there. We found 283 condoms. So when it comes to this, my hope is that while I support the idea of you guys having responsibility, which is a key word here, that our vision, if you will, we had always kind of thought, or a number of us had thought about, you know, like a nonprofit, free, open CrossFit gym like they have in Chicago and on the two coasts and stuff like that. The talk about the amphitheater was something with Heart of the Beast that was very specific to Heart of the Beast, and the last time we'd heard about it was at a site further down the Greenway. So while I support it, and I use that word purposefully, I would hope that somehow they would engage us who literally live, eat, and breathe right next door there. We lost uh, something like six or seven neighbors, four houses when they demolished the uh, grain elevators. We went through lead abatement uh, and a couple of the yards, all as a result of this. So I'm kind of painting kind of a sad story here, but I do think we're entitled to some consideration. And to the best of my knowledge, not a single one of my neighbors have been involved in this. Nobody. We knew nothing about this until somebody last week emailed me and said, Rand, you really should go to this. So I hope you'll indulge us. Um, let's see. We've been, thank you. <laughs> Rand, thank you, and um, Chris will no longer be, hopefully, if we pass this and everything, will no longer be the person you would be, the point person, um, but um, Adam, who presented, or Michael Schroeder, um, hopefully we will be doing outreach when it comes to our naming, so I thank you for your, your comments. So now I'm going to move into what possibly might have been um, what people were thinking was for our open time, um, to that to we think is that list so I am going to there are I believe 16 people who are signed up for that so unfortunately I need to limit um, the amount of time and so I'm going to limit it to 90 seconds um, as we did in the beginning of the meeting so I really also apologize I might not be able to pronounce all the names um, properly so um, did Fardham um, Commissioner Forney yes um, if you I, want to I, I no I, I just wanted to thank you for uh, thank you for not. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. Um, there are. I, I understand what you're trying to address. Um, the. It is unusual though that people would be signed up. That, so so I would just encourage to follow the same rules that are the same time allotment, for the folks that are signed up for the public hearing. So that would be my recommendation. It's it's your committee. Okay. Well, well more what I was going to say is that. I would be very happy to hand this back to you when you um, reconvene the meeting. Um, if those people, if there is anybody else who wanted specifically to speak to the CPRO, um, the um, amending the South Service, um, is there anybody else who wanted to speak to that specifically? Is there anybody else? Okay. So and that might Forney be the wisest like, idea is uh, to pass that on to yeah, the I would full board that meeting. We suspend our rules to reopen open time for those speakers, and then okay. they would be allocated the ninety seconds. So um, those uh, sixteen people who did sign up on, unfortunately, the I think the wrong um, sign up sheet. We will, when we reconvene the meeting, we will have you then um, speaking at that time. So um, I'll pass that to you. Um, okay, with that, then I am going to close the public hearing and um, open up then discussion with uh, the board members, uh, the committee members. Um, first of all, um, to meet, read resolution 2018-351. Um, anybody like to read that? Move resolution 2018-351. A resolution authorizing a cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for the land transfer of the CPRO site of City Minimum Lake Park. Accepting a grant from Hennepin County in the amount of $300,000 for the implementation of phase two improvements of the site 
amending the South Service Area Master Plan to include the CEPRA site and initiating a process under the land acquisition policy. Um, okay, I only see one. Good. <laughs> I saw lights go on and off. All right. Um, yes, um, Vice Chair Coca. Uh Yes, I had a question for Director Arvidson um, about some of the engagement process and whether or not in the site planning um, and additions, uh, the folks in the kind of the bike community that utilize that space for a variety of races throughout the year were were consulted in any fashion or if that happened through the Midtown Greenway Coalition or if you could comment on that at all. Sure. Uh, Chair Forney, Commissioner Cogill, um, th there was, it was a bit of a hybrid engagement process. So the, the county has been engaging around the site and the use of the site um, with, a, with a very wide variety of site users for almost 10 years before we even came on. Um, there was a set of overall guiding principles that had been well established by that time. Um, we did additional engagement through this design charrette, um, which involved, uh, it did involve the Midtown Greenway Coalition and the Midtown Phillips Community Association, which we felt um, were groups that could speak to some of those other users, be they bicyclists or otherwise. Um, the uh, basic community vision, community desires were really reaffirmed, um, and then that's what led to um, this, de this concept design which granted is still a general concept design. And I think during the implementation <coughs> phase, if it moves forward, um, we'd be interested in engaging directly with the block club, with those that are immediately around there, um, and whomever else wants to be there to talk about the detailed design of some of these amenities. So we can continue the engagement around implementation as we go forward. Fantastic, thank you. That's uh, the only question I, I have. I, I would just uh, also say that it's, uh, I think, an exciting opportunity here and uh, appreciate the folks who came out to comment on this and I certainly hear whoever the speaker was on the gravel issue at the bottom of the hill it is dicey down there um, so anyway thank you very much thank you seeing no other okay um, I too I'm just very excited to um, add this amenity to our park system um, I mean, it's not an amenity, it's amenity that's already been wonderfully um, transformed and making it accessible for um, the, a community that is so dense and um, lacking in open space, um, I think is just a real um, wonderful gift and we appreciate it. So I really wanna extend a thank you, first of all, um, to some former, uh, former commissioner, um, Mark Andrew. I believe that he was one of his um, big brainstorms to come up with the Midtown Greenway and I'm so glad that um, it's been transformed and it continues to transform and then I also would like to um, comment that um, outgoing um, Hennepin County Commissioner uh, Peter McLaughlin that is something he also you know worked very diligently on all these years so this is a wonderful gift um, and we appreciate it and also appreciate our great collaboration with Hennepin County so thank you um, so do we need um, a roll call vote in this? Not an amendment. No, it's an amendment. Never mind. Excuse me, I was thinking as the land. <laughs> At that point, we will. Okay, um, all those in favor of the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. And then I am going to recess so we can go back to the full board meeting. Okay, I'm uh, reconvening uh, the regular meeting. Um, Without objection, I would go a little out of procedure. While we do have a motion on the floor, I would entertain a motion right now, if there's no objection, uh, to suspend the rules of the board uh, for the purposes of reopening uh, our open time public, uh, public testimony. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all of those in favor of suspension of the rules, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, motion carries unanimously. I would entertain a motion to uh, reopen uh, open time for the addition of approximately 15 public speakers. I moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to reopen open time for approximately 15 speakers? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'm uh, <laughs> reopening uh, open time. Uh, speakers are going to be allotted uh, 90 seconds. I'm going to ask 
uh, Vice President Hassan and Abdi to help take a lead on um, on help facilitating our way through this. Uh, speakers are given 90 seconds to address the board. Um, just in brief, you can speak on any topic that you'd like except for uh, pending litigation and personnel matters. Uh, the best way to um, best way to convey that is to commissioners directly. So uh, I am going to ask Vice President Hassan, uh, after every name that he reads, uh, the speaker will be able to come up to the microphone and have 90 seconds to address the board, and we would ask that they um, give their name and address for the public record, and uh, they'll each have 90 seconds. So I'm going to turn it over to Vice President Hassan. All right, thank you, President Moon. Uh, the first speaker, Posteo Jama. Good evening. My name is Poste Jama, I see the Riverside. I'm a mother. And then we have a concern as Fortun Hassan speaked about Brian Call Center. We have a lot of issues at see the Riverside. I know that there's a lot of investment going on, a lot of different organizations gaining different uh, funding for our youth, but none of that is happening at see the Riverside. So I want you guys as a park board to invest our see the Riverside and look for what's important for our kids. I'm sick and tired of seeing kids falling apart and mothers worry every night thinking about what's going to happen to her child and being awake middle of the night thinking of when is he going to come home. We need more park board police available. We need more and more investment in see the Riverside, whether it's a prank call or any other organization. And we need to get involved with that as a mother of so see the Riverside. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nasra Hassan. Safi Yusuf. That's okay. Nasra Hassan. Sorry about that. I'm going to go to the Riverside. I'm going to go to the Riverside. i Marka waxa u baahanahay community-ga inay inside kiisa waxa ka jiro aan community-ga ina qayb ka ahaano ilmaheeni inuu yaro 16 jiro school ku aaday meelo ku bad ku ciyaaro meelo tam ku qaatu baahanahay ma helo irid waa naga xiran tahay miidin yar hada inaan ku qabsana rabna community hada aan wana laga xiraa ilmaheeyga meelo ku ciyaaran male dadkeen waa weena meelo ku ay ku lugu baxsadaan male Mela ku shaqeystaan male marka waxa ku codsaneena sidiga barain call xafadeena iskale bilinadeena iskale bilinkaas wuxuu hadan ugu sugan yahay in malaha dadkeenu kama shaqeeyno marka intaasan dawladda ku codsaday inay naga caawiyaan community ga barain call okay thank you she said her name is uh, Nasra Hassan she lives in Sidi Riverside she's a mother and she said the same as all the other moms who are here today, um, most of them want to be involved in what is happening in their neighborhood. Um, she said a lot of our youth don't have programs. Um, she used it as an example that she has 16 years old that doesn't have any place to play, but at the same time, lack of um, youth-friendly space in the neighborhood. She said whenever we want to meet as moms and elders, um, we are not allowed to hold meetings at Brian Coyle Center. Um, she said the city has to do something about this. The park board has to do something about this. And it's not only young people, but um, adults and seniors in the neighborhood also need access in that building. So she, she's asking more space and programs, um, not only for young people, but also for seniors and adults. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
magaciga waa deeq xanshi aniga oo hadlaayo qoyooyinka ka socda sida rifisaid dibka waa wada qabna walaalahay waxay sheegeen ayaa kuligeena na wada heesto ilmaha iyo hooyooyinka marka waxa noola qabto okay so she said her name is um deeq hashi um she's also one of the moms she lives in sida rifisaid she said the same challenge and issues that other moms spoke about is what she would like to address. She said, I, I don't know how to speak in public, <laughs> um, but she said, um, we, we need help and we need your support. Thank you. Safi, Thank you. Safi Yusuf. <laughs> Okay, Anab Mohammed. Oh, uh, Sophia Yusuf. Okay. May I go to Allah, Sophia Yusuf? See the river side and begin it. Wahan Ryan and Kadlo and Anigam Wahan Brian Coil Adai, Mark and Jurisita Eton Sanitur, Ella Hatu and Adaya. Like in the battle, you tell Hete, said the Yala Ijo, Brian Coyle Marcantagno, Gura Tamikili Kernu Welit, Wahale, Welit, Bananka, Fadistan, the battle Ugu and his Tanatas Wai, Ilmehane, Wah, Awinan Mesha Kamehelan, because reason Kyogi Hill in Hawaii, Mobi is Fahmi, no that Kamesha Kashakayo, Hadanso Gulnan respected the Rio, Sik and Aklak Lehena, no Lala Hadla. وحن أبا هنه المهنة إني زين لو عاوي والد كن لو أقول هذا إني جدها جلان. She said her name is Safiya Yusuf. Um, she has been using Brian Coyson since she was a teenager, 13 years old. But now she has her own kids. She has three kids, and she lives in the Riverside neighborhood. She said um, one of the challenges that they face as parents. Um, they are not allowed to use Brian Coil, but also stay in the building while our kids, while their kids are in programs. Um, she said also, parents are not being respected in that building, and and the staff at Brian Coil Center don't respect parents, and they don't have enough programs um, for for their kids, and they need help, so they need something to be done. Hakala or Brian Coil Kajuro, Murky and Ilmehena and Ken, a mesh in a homag in Kusta Malan and his homag a Kashakistan. Ilma Murky, a hutag and Teo Halagaya, a Unugasi to Homagis, Missy Reading Kiss, Miss Willos or Deru Kashakayo, Lakin, Murky Usos or the Behel Muzuku Galaya, Mel Muzik, a solo homagis at the Mason, Murka and in Lakala Kavi, Unuga and Homag and Kashakais and in Mesh in Ugirin, Sid Wilshe and Okasha Kanger and Mahdi Abdrahman, Merke Kasha Kanger and Okale, and Homag Merke Namestan, Ilmaha, Halo Galang, Jirahiala, Kale, active in Usubio, like in Halkan Murku Street, Uso Galo Homag, and so what the Mason in Bau Ug is a Merkipo, Yar, Yohiala, and Lordson and Okashakana, Ayakane, Shakova, the Maha Arinta, say to Hele in Ugan, Homag, two high sea, two ways in. Okay, so Safia again said um, um, Brian Coyle has after school program that helps kids with their homework, um, but she said um, it's not structured and kids don't finish their homework because of lack of supervision. And she said um, they need more structure and supervision, but at the same time making sure that they have quality after school programs in that building, where adults will make sure kids finish their school work while they participate in uh, under supervision. So thank you. Muzamil uh, Ibrahim. All right. Excellent. Um, finally here. Um, my name is Muzamil Ibrahim, and I live in uh, Cedar Riverside. And I, I live there like um, since I came to the United States. 
uh, blind um, of that community neighborhood. And uh, I'm representing today um, Brian Cole Center. Brian Cole Center, um, me as a you know, a uh, person who live in that area, never been there. There was only one time that I uh, was there, and that time uh, I went there to have food with uh, uh, my friends because that was accessible. And um, otherwise, uh, facilities there, gym and other stuff were not, um, were not accessible, not only for uh, blind individuals, but um, also people who have some kind of physical disability. Gym is not, for example, for wheelchairs. And there is that. And another thing is um, uh, a, a youth um, program. And I am a youth studies uh, student at University of Minnesota, becoming a youth worker. And I'm also uh, serving on uh, Minneapolis, um, I'm sorry, Minnesota State uh, Council on Disability, and then familiar with those access issues and uh, youth uh, issues in my area. And um, some uh, organizations who come to uh, Cedar Riverside. You should finish the maestro. Um, sometimes um, those organizations don't allow um, their parents to be in the program and they would keep their parents out when they are working with uh, their uh, kids, meaning our kids. Um, and um, I have concern about that and also in that area, in that neighborhood, we need more youth workers who look like us, meaning okay, who I can understand more of our kids and cultures. And Mr. I think Mr. that, Mr. yeah. I think you went out of time. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Ayan Nisak. Ayan Nisak. Good evening, everybody. Salam alaikum, I am here on uh, the same issue. I am a mother, too. I live east, um, Cedar East. My address is 601 19th Avenue, and my name is Ayane Sah again. And uh, I see um, about youth problem all the time. I see somebody who's uh, selling drugs around my neighborhood, and I see someone who buying and we don't have enough police at the area who are serving us. And if you call for a problem, the police taking some time to come over. Sometimes our mothers, they come from Brian Cole because we live the other side of Cedar, and they say we cannot, um, uh, we cannot uh, tell our issue in a community in the, to meet in the neighborhood by the Brian Cole because they say this is not where you guys are supposed to be. So I also do uh, some events for the mothers, and that is why they come over there to talk their issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Halima Hassan. Maka Mohammed. Abdurrahman Jama. Jimale, Abdurrahman Jimale, sorry. Uh, Salam alaikum everybody. Magaigwa Abdurrahman Jimale, I'm Kasa Ala Havad the Sidder. And Wahan Ubahana or Sidder Gulaksa Baden and Kahadalo or Mesha Barkali Rado or Beli Granka communities are at a you yearly high. وحنا هابه استيل محنوسن أو تيس القبة، and يا المكان العادي هبا، مركب ماش بارك وحنا أوبا هنا هرتردي نلوه نيك رأي هدي سفع عن نلوه قبسي ذو قرد حساب بدن قيب جوني نو أوبا هنا علمها حنوسن، نوت كل جماعة حافظوا كوب بدين ضد هستيل ما بدن وحنوسن مركب أنت تشاورت. سير أم his name is عبد الرحمن جمالي he lives in سيد الريبسايد said we need to address um, the playground in, in City Riverside, Kerry Park, and also um, Brian Coyle. He said he has um, a child who is autistic, and he said there's a lot of kids with disability in City Riverside neighborhood. 
but we don't address and we don't have access and um, also programs and the playground is not um, appropriate for kids with disabilities in their neighborhood. So he said we need to really not only address access to um, activities, but also for all kids, but also kids with uh, kids with um, disability, especially kids with autistic. ولكنهم <تصفيق> سبب تلو جو جي مجرا كرنو سكورت كنا وا ما بجرا وارتو سكورت ما وان أرجع ملهم بواحد سكورت لا أوكي أنت أستوفى. Thank you. Um, so I think his last his last comments specifically speak on uh, about K Park and he said we need um, programs and equipment that kids with disabilities can use in that space. He also did touch um, the restrooms, how um, there's not enough restrooms in Kerry Park, and we need to improve that, especially, he said, he, he doesn't want to only talk about kids, but there's a lot of adults that use that space. Um, also, swimming, he did say um, there was um, it's a small um, swimming pool in Kerry Park, but I think because of the renovation at Kerry Park, that was not um, accessible this summer. And safety, the last thing he did mention was safety. He said, we don't have enough security and safety in, in, in that park. I say thank you. Mark um, Mohammed? Samir. <laughs> وحنا هاي إن هوية وعيال أو سيارة اللي بعتقد إنه وضوان وضا وضوان إنه وضا هيسا وحنا أنا جا إيجارة وعيال كقبابة صار عيب بنا كمان مرك الرق ما وريج الرق وعيب هو مرك برا في ما دبوده إنه هو وريج الرسيدر أو برين كول وأنا لقحد تي وأنا لود دي دي وحنا ربنا تذكى جا وعيال كام دابا برا في ما إيجا قبابة إن نلاقي أقراض إن إنه حلقة أو كله تذكى إنه وريج الرسيدر أو كله إنه وجي ما دانو إنه وريج يعني um, she said her name is Anna Mohammed. She lives in Sidi Riverside. Um, she's a mom, but also a senior. She said that um, a lot of the adults and seniors don't have um, activities and programs in Sidi Riverside. And since the weather is cold now, um, before they used to use um, the brain coil gym just to walk inside and to exercise but they don't have access to that now. And she said that we really need to um, allow seniors and adults to use that space during the winter. And, and not only think about youth, but also think about adults and seniors in the neighborhood. She said, um, I hope you will accept our request and honor. Thank you. Bye. Halima Hassan. Farheem Hamad. Samiro. Abdi Majid Omar. Hello everyone. My name is Abdi Majid Omar. I live in Adobe Bank. Northeast Minneapolis. I founder for Ceramic Cultural Center 1341 Central Level Northeast. 
We've had this dark building since 2016, and up to now we go forward and forward to have the parking lot. Unfortunately, the work of Park uh, Minneapolis, they didn't get this done, and then we talked to the mayor, and he visited us, and he saw our building, zero parking. Last week, all our children very close to die for accident because the main street doesn't have even the handicap parking. The elders will to attend our program. They don't find to access to get to the building. And we ask Chris Meyer in order to give us trade and they approve. But they give us the lease, maybe 13 houses, selling to the back way in order to buy for $400,000 and tear it down and they give that land in order to trade the piece of land is 9,630. And right now we found one house is for sale on the market right now, 1919, selling to the in order to buy that building. And they tear it down to give that land to the Minneapolis Bar Regulation in order to get the trade for this land to use as a parking lot. But unfortunately, we didn't get a response up to now. We're willing to pay more than 500,000 in order to get a piece of land. 9,610 square feet because we need it, because our people in need, our children, our programs, after school program, ESL classes, and even we have right now the new program for the homeless to feed every Sunday to give the food for all the people. We request the, all the members to consider this situation, and that is almost three years and more, and up to now we didn't get any response and I feel sanctioned, and we agree with Chris Meyer, he invited a guy, and he believed the green zone, and we believed in the green zone, but right now we found the place in order to trade that building to be willing to pay $500,000 and to get that space to use that as a green space to get this land. Please, we need okay. a fair action, and urgent action in order to save our children. Last week, we are very close to one child, Eight years old to buy for car accident because we don't yep. have any parking lot unless we have only public safety. Yes. Uh, right, thank you so much. Ivan Tam. Khadija Hussein. Odan Ali. Fortune Dell. Okay. I think we can move on. Is that, uh, is that all of our speakers? It looks like. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice President Hassan, for helping me with, through that portion of open time. Um, I am closing open time. Uh, again, thank you for your help, Vice President Hassan. We are moving on to, we have a resolution on the floor uh, considering a contract with um, Superintendent nominee Bangora. Uh, before I move back into questions um, I just want to take a moment for the folks um, for the folks at home just to talk a little bit about what we're doing because it sounds like folks might have some very uh, detailed level questions which they should uh, just so folks know the order it, uh, Commissioner Musich if she still had the floor and had other questions uh, she is there followed by Commissioner Meyer followed by Commissioner Forney is who I had set up to speak um, but I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of background before we go into discussion. Um, on November 28th of 2018, uh, the board unanimously uh, authorized me to uh, negotiate a contract with Mr. Bangora to serve as the next superintendent of the Minneapolis Park Board. Uh, after conferring with Mr. Bangora, I'm pleased to present this following contract for your consideration. Uh, Mr. Bangora has agreed to the terms in this contract. Um, and. Uh, should you approve it, uh, Mr. Mangora will join us on January 20th following his notice to his employer. I've asked Council Rice to prepare a short term sheet of the entire contract. Uh, at this time, I would ask Council Rice to just go over at a very high level the terms uh, of, the, of the contract before you and that might uh, answer some questions before they're asked, but uh, they might also give some folks some things that they want to ask about. And I also have Commissioner Vita following for me. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm referring to uh, the uh, a, a, a agenda uh, for tonight, uh, page uh, 189. Um, this is a summary. Um, the, initially, this is a three-year contract that would begin uh, January 20th, 19, uh, 2019, and it would terminate December 31, 2021. The base salary is $175,000 annually. There would be adjustments at beginning January 1 of each year that the contract is in force starting January 2020. Um, and each subsequent year, it would be based on the average negotiated uh, contract settlements for the other employees represented by collective bargaining agreements. Um, Mr. Bangor would receive all the benefits afforded other MPRB employees, health, insurance, uh, life, dental. Um, the board would agree to waive the six month waiting period to receive sick leave and vacation pay days. That's an exception from the general rule. Um, paid vacation days would be 26. Um, that's the same level that uh, Superintendent Miller had. Um, the professional dues um, would, the board would pay the NRPA uh, and the MRPA. Uh, Commissioner um, Meyer uh, caught that air. It's the National Recreation and Park Association and the Minnesota Recreation and Park <coughs> Association dues for uh, Mr. Bangor. That's similar to uh, past contracts. Expense reimbursements. Um, the board reimbursed Bangor for travel meeting and other expenses consistent with board policies. The contract itself has a special pr provision that during this transition period or the period from now until January 20th, uh, Mr. Bangora would be allowed to travel uh, up for transition purposes, um, and the board would pay uh, lodging, meals, other expenses related to that, uh, based on a reimbursement position. Um, for relocation, uh, Mr. Bangora would have one year to move his, himself and his family up here, and he would be, be reimbursed up to a maximum of $10,000 for actual relocation expenses. Um, the uh, contract uh, adds a uh, provision that hadn't been in prior contracts, although it had been done um, uh, informally or, or absent the contract, but Mr. Bangor asked that the, uh, there be annual uh, performance goals set, uh, agreed to between the board and uh, Mr. Bangor. Um, the severance pay uh, provision, this is one that there's been several uh, uh, questions on, I'll try to summarize this. My, my summary here is uh, close to, but not, uh, it, it, it's exactly what's in the contract, but I've structured a little bit differently so it could be understood. The contract could be uh, terminated uh, uh, on two bases uh, where no severance applies. The first one is that if Mr. Bangor is fired for just cause, that's the same standard that would apply to all other public board, employees the board has uh, collected bargaining agreements with or covered by civil service. Just talk cause is a uh, term of art. Um, it's fact dependent on the um, situation, but it also has certain elements of uh, due process, uh, both uh, procedural and substantive. Um, and the contract can be terminated without severance uh, if Mr. Bangora voluntarily resigns. And that's a true voluntary termination. I think uh, Commissioner Musich was uh, probing that question. That would be that Mr. Bangora simply decides that he's gone for whatever reason. Um, family, another job opportunity, um, he just decides, I resign. As opposed to the board is having trouble with Mr. Bangora and the choice is either you're fired or you resign, we'll give you an opportunity. If he's, if he's resigning under duress, um, that would, it, and not for just cause, that could be a period where he would get uh, uh, severance pay. So, and then the, on the other side, uh, sever six months severance pay would be paid if there's no just cause um, uh, proven. Um, the board could terminate the contract, but would have to pay six months' salary. Um, or if the board fails to renew the contract, it must pay Bangor a six months' severance. Um, that raises another question that I'll deal with uh, in paragraph 10. Um, so that if the contract 
Um, let me explain that on the renewal part. As I said, it's a three-year contract that runs um, uh, almost three years from today until uh, December 31, 2021. However, the board has an option two years from today uh, to advise Mr. Bangura that if it wants to renew the contract, it has to give him notice within two years and the contract renews for another two years. So it would be a total of three years plus two or a five-year contract. However, um, if the board two years from now chooses not to renew the contract, it's a three-year contract. He's basically not renewed. Um, and the, there would be, if you don't renew, you owe him a, a six-month severance package. So in essence, um, this contract is a, is a three-year contract where he works for the board plus a six-month severance package. Um, or if it's extended uh, two years and it becomes a five-year contract, so two years from tonight the board says we want to renew you, Mr. Bangora, for an additional two years beyond the initial term to December 31, 2023. Mr. Bangora, assuming everything works out, he has a five-year contract, um, and, um, but at the end of that five years he'd also be entitled to six-month severance if he if the board doesn't renew his uh, six-month severance package. Um, and um, the contract can be modified at any time by mutual agreement of the parties. Um, and lastly, there's an arbitration clause, so if any disputes arise over how, how to interpret the contract, it's resolved through uh, arbitration where each party would basically pick an arbitrator that's mutually agreeable to both sides. Thank you, Council Rice. I'll go back to Commissioner Musich, who had the floor for a question. Commissioner Musich. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a question about the decision about the date for renewal, and perhaps President Bourne, as the negotiator of the contract, you can answer this for me. I'm, I'm curious to understand what the rationale is for um, a 2020 decision about renewal versus a 2020 one decision that would allow for um, which would allow for an election cycle to have occurred um, prior to determining whether or not the new superintendent the new superintendent that we're taking on now should be kept on um, rather than making that decision for the next board um, in 2020. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musich. I can, uh, I can address that question. Um, again, going back to what I said in the letter to the board, this is the agreement that uh, Superintendent, our Superintendent nominee Bangora has agreed to. Uh, every, point, uh, every point in the contract was negotiated. The, uh, the point for the 2020 notice of renewal and going back to what Council Rice had said about the, uh, uh, the a choice not to renew in the form of a consulting contract severance package was a explicitly negotiated to um, provide the board ample notice and provide a future superintendent should the board not choose to renew um, a transition period going into that going into that next year. Mr. President, Council Rice, if, if I could amplify that. Um, Part of this date, Commissioner Musich, was uh, at my suggestion. I think, as you've seen, for a board to pick a superintendent, it usually is about a year process. It's not, uh, you might be able to shorten it. Um, I think this one went about on time. It probably extended a little bit longer than I think uh, commissioners had hoped. Um, the last two superintendents, uh, Superintendent John Gerben, uh, had a contract that basically had a carryover period of one year. If I recall, it expired on December, it, it might have been October 31st of 2010. That would have been 10 months into the new board's uh, term. And uh, the last superintendent, Superintendent Miller's contract actually would have expired in June of in this June. year. So there's some, there's some overlap uh, period. Um, and um, so it was, um, was it June for, I thought it was later. I thought, end of June. 
I thought it was October. June 30th I'm pretty sure it was October. It was October. June 30th of 2018. I have the contract over. Okay. I'm looking right. at it. It, it says it, June 30th of 2018. Okay. It carried over. And, um, you know, that's been kind of the practice that uh, it, it hasn't ever been, to my knowledge, a matter where the board has had an election and then immediately had, that the superintendent's contract has been uh, coterminous with the term of commissioners. There's always been some provision to overlap a, su a superintendent beyond the beginning of a new board superintendent. So I guess it's six months in the case of uh, Superintendent Miller, nine months in the case of, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Gerben, and, you know, initially it was, uh, you know, that, that's, the, that's the reason. I think just it's, it's continuity in, in uh, the organization to some level. Okay, thanks for the clarification. I I still don't understand, though, why we're going several years into the next board's term with the renewals of this contract versus what previous boards have done, which is give enough of an overlap for if the new board decides not to continue the contract to be able to select a different superintendent. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. I believe, again, this contract does exactly that. This, uh, this contract, if renewed, goes into the middle of a next term. The other, uh, the other point is uh, superintendent, uh, superintendent nominee Bangora as a point of negotiation had every single superintendent contract that the board has ever passed as a public document. Uh, superintendent Bangora had referenced those. Uh, we had negotiated points. This is the point that we had mutually agreed to. Uh, if that is something that the board does not agree to, um, I would go back and negotiate something else with Superintendent nominee Bangora, uh, and that would also push out our effective start date. But this is what Superintendent Bangora has agreed to. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is what I am bringing forward to the board. I believe that it does give the uh, it does provide future boards with opportunity to make decisions. It also provides stability for current and future boards. Okay, uh, my next question. Um, what's the story with the house? It, is he potentially still renting it? And if so, um, what impact does that have on the contract we're adopting tonight? Because the contract we had with our previous superintendents explicitly laid out the terms around the house. And I, I thought that was because the house is deemed to be a component of compensation and thus can impact our um, hitting of the limits. And so I would just like some clarification. Uh, I would, um, that. I'll address that. I'll ask uh, again, Council Rice to add to that. The uh, <coughs> rent of the Theodore Worth home has never been a component of a employment contract. Uh, there has always been an arm, as Council Rice has With put it, Fisher's and I believe has always been an arm's okay. length uh, separate agreement. Uh, Superintendent nominee Bangora has expressed interest in living in the home and having a market rate uh, rental for the home, um, which uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder and his staff are working off of the presentation that was delivered earlier this summer, along with the uh, market rate uh, assessment that was done um, in uh, prior to Superintendent Miller moving into the house. Uh, it is a separate agreement. It does not uh, uh, impact uh, Mr. Van Gore's employment. Uh, he will be, if he chooses to rent the home, he has, a, he has expressed some interest in that uh, until his family joins him from Mecklenburg. Um, if he chooses to rent the home, he will rent it at a market value that uh, staff will be bringing to the board probably either, either at our <coughs> January 2nd meeting or our January 16th meeting. Uh, Mr. Van Gore, to my knowledge, has not been in the home yet. So he has expressed interest, but he had, has not been in the home yet. Uh, Council Rice, is there, did I leave anything? Out? Uh, if I could just maybe uh, clarify something. I think that the more accurate statement is, is that I think not since David Fisher Thanks. term has the superintendent's uh, residence been part of a contract. Um, but uh, the President Board is correct. Um, when we negotiated the contract with Superintendent Miller, there was a contract uh, for employment and then there was Fairly quickly after that, there was uh, an agreement entered into on the rental of the property. Um, we, in my opinion, and I've advised the board this previously, we do need an arm's length transaction because if it's deemed to be 
um, if there's any rent subsidy uh, involved in the house, uh, that could become and would could very well become a compensation issue for the superintendent, and you'd have to impute some value to that under the Internal Revenue Code and treat it as compensation. Um, this contract is well under the uh, maximum amount allowed by uh, the MMB, I think, by about twenty thousand um, dollars. So, should there be any issue about that, it, it could be considered. But my, my advice, both for the board and for the uh, superintendent, is that you really need to have a, as much as you can in this situation, an arm's length uh, contract. I know. Uh, Mr. Schroeder and his staff are looking at uh, what is an appropriate price. When we had uh, the one with uh, Superintendent Miller, they, the board contracted for it with the real estate company to give an appraisal, and that's in the file. So um, I think we got through that one all right. Um, but uh, yes, I think not since uh, Fisher have we ha had a term. And the uh, go back to uh, Mr. Worth uh, and other superintendents, it was not unusual. To my knowledge, I think the only public officers down in the state that have a house along with their job are the governor and the president of the University of Minnesota. Um, and we're not quite in that category. Thank you, Council Rice. Commissioner Musa, do you have additional questions? I just had one more question. Uh, Mr. Bangora is getting less vacation time than our previous superintendent. This job is crazy. And while it's well, um, well compensated, I do have concerns about burnout, particularly with the dynamics of the board. Um, do we want to consider giving him equivalent vacation as our previous superintendent had? I, I think it's something the board might want to consider. Commissioner Musich, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I will uh, restate uh, what I said at the beginning of the conversation. The, these, this is a contract upon the terms of which that uh, Superintendent Amini Bangor has agreed to. Okay. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your questions, uh, Commissioner Meyer. I have that. Thank you. Uh, so I expressed at the beginning of the year how frustrated I was with the previous uh, superintendent's contract, where we uh, were obliged to approve a severance package of six months, even though the superintendent voluntarily um, resigned. So there, there was you know, basically no scenario where they didn't get that basically free six months of pay. So I'm, I'm very happy that that is uh, not part of this contract. Um, the uh, incoming superintendent will only get the severance if they voluntarily, or if they involuntarily resign or are fired. Um, and then I also just want to draw attention to the nature of the severance because it is different. In uh, section 10B, uh, it says, if the board gives notice of non-renewal under paragraph 11 below, the board shall provide Bangora uh, with a severance pay payment in the form of a consulting agreement. Um, so that, that's the key thing. Um, it's a severance payment in the form of a consulting agreement or a continuation of benefits. So um, you know, if we decide we're dissatisfied for whatever reason, uh, we can... Um, give notice that we're going to terminate the contract. And then the last, it, it basically, um, the last six months, he could be serving as a consultant. But it's not a free severance. It's a severance tied um, with service. Um, off of uh, Commissioner Musich's uh, comments, I just want to say that I, I think it's appropriate um, to have this contract to go through the middle of a term so that we don't have um, you know, new commissioners coming in and, and, and a new super, or superintendent at the same time, like we did this year. Uh, so it makes sense to have that in the middle of an election season. Um, and as uh, Councilor Rice mentioned, there were a, a few uh, typos and errors that I pointed out. And you advised me to make a, an amendment to the contract. So, uh, uh, so in the term section under Section Five. Um, And this is also under Section 6 of the contract itself. Um, it says National um, Park and Recreation Association and Minnesota Park and Recreation Association should be National Recreation and Park Association. They have the opposite um, as what we do. 
uh, for the Park and Recreation Board. But we just want to make sure that those uh, fees are going to the right organization. Uh, for Section 8. Commissioner Meyer, yep. uh, I might suggest yep. um, if these are all typo, are. Uh, if these are all typo corrections, if there is no objection, uh, we will receive that correction. Uh, that if there's no objection, we will receive uh, Commissioner Meyer's first correction. Is there any objection? Is there any objection? Is there any objection? Uh, we will receive Commissioner Meyer's correction. Thank you. Uh, you're next. Uh, section eight of the term sheet should be annually instead of annual. Is there any objection to? Is there any? Uh, is there any objection to the correction? Any objection? We will receive that correction. Section ten. It's employee. Em, the verb employee, employee instead of employee. Is there any objection to that correction? Is there any objection? Any objection? We will uh, unanimously receive that correction. And under the section ten six of the contract, whichever is less, that clause um, is a stranded clause that probably remains from a previous contract. You are suggesting removing that. Whichever is less. Okay. Um, is there any objection? Is there any objection? Is there any objection? Uh, we will receive that. Uh, we will receive that correction. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Um, Commissioner Forney. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the contract in front of me to refer directly to it, but um, there's some vagueness as far as the performance goals and review and I'm wondering it says annual when are we anticipating setting the goals so that we understand you know when does the year shall we say um, if it's an annual review when are, do we have a, a sense of, of that within the first six months and therefore then a year after we have set the initial goals that seemed very vague to me is how that's measurable knowing that in essence we're looking really only to two Is that a question for yes. clarification? Thank you. For either uh, one of you. <laughs> th thank you, Commissioner Forney. Th this was a point of uh, this was a point of request for Mr. Bangora. Um, previous um, previous superintendent contracts that I'm aware of did not have this number nine provision. Uh, this was uh, his intent. Is uh, Mr. Bangora wants to be judged for the work that he does? Uh, so he will take some time. We have not. Uh, we have not set that time period yet. Uh, Mr. Bangora will take some time when he gets here, gets to know the organization, and um, under his prerogative, as it was similar with uh, between Superintendent Miller and the board president, they will they will bring those forward. So Mr. Bangora and the board president will set a time on, on the agenda to be determined to start talking about those goals. But I think Mr. Bangora will have some work to do to um, meet with executive staff, define what, uh, define, uh, review our strategic directions, which he is already, which he is already aware of, um, and build uh, build those uh, build those objective goals and metrics around the work that he intends to accomplish year to year, and that's not a that's not a day one January twentieth piece. So he will need a little bit of latitude to um, bring that forward to the board, and the board president and the superintendent will work on that to bring it forward as soon as they can. Great, and and I guess what I'm trying to clarify is the fact that um, the way that I'm reading this is that, let's say that we set goals um, collaboratively let's say within the first six months. And then if there's an annual review of that, okay, that's then a year and a half into the contract. That is, like I say, really only for two years. So um, we are really indicating we're only having one job performance review of those goals between when we um, decide on a contract. Is that the understanding? Am I making sense? Uh, Commissioner... Forney, I, you are making sense. I am not sure if I understand your question. Uh, Mr. Bangor is asking for a year-to-year -year performance evaluation. Yes, there is a time period in which the board has to make a decision to renew. Um, I believe it is. I, I believe it is pretty clear. There is a year-to-year -year, uh, objective performance evaluation, and there is a point in which the board has to make a decision to renew. Uh, Council Rice, if you have. Uh, something to add. Uh, yes, Mr. President, Commissioner um, Forney, yeah, as you, you raised a very good point, and uh, as we were negotiating this, uh, I spoke with Mr. Bangor about trying to pick a date. Um, 
he was very clear that he wanted to be, have objective measures to be evaluated on and it, that being done with a collaborative agreement between, okay, the board says here's what we want you to do and here's what I think I can do and let's put it down on paper and then uh, measure me against the standard that you set. Um, I think this is going to be a, um, uh, I would advise the board to try to get those uh, objective goals done, say, within the first quarter of next year or no later than the second quarter, um, and then determine an evaluation point. Um, it, um, I, I understand your point, Commissioner Forney, if you take till June to set them and say, okay, Mr. Van Gogh, you have a year to meet them, you'll only have one evaluation before you have to decide whether to renew the contract for another two, you know, this three-year contract to make it a five-year contract, um, which would make that first evaluation pretty significant. Um, the alternative is, is uh, have the board get to work in the first quarter and say, okay, here's the goals and try to get it done by the end of this year and then try to do it again at the end of next year. That's a little bit dicey because we all know how busy the end of the year is with the budget setting and everything like that. So um, it's not perfect, but that's, uh, it's a new concept. Uh, prior superintendent contracts did not have this provision in it, although prior boards did and have attempted to evaluate superintendents. Um, I have to say that some of them have gone well and some of them have not gone so well. Um, Superintendent Miller had a couple of evaluations, as I recall. They weren't annual, um, and they're always a bit of a challenge because it takes time and it's, it's a big decision, and if you do it, it, you can do it in a closed session initially if it's an evaluation, but then you have to report back publicly a summary of what the evaluation is. So I think this would be... Uh, this is something that Mr. Ben Gore is requesting of the board, and it's, for lack of a better word, I think it's probably a to-do item that's going to be put on the board rather than Mr. Ben Gore to figure out what your objectives are. Well, it, thank you for the clarification. That really, it is um, uh, Mr. Ben Gore that suggested this. Um, I, I just am just so concerned to not set him up for failure, and so to be clear, both parties. And that's the thing that I would, you know, seek. And so I don't want to be a part of the contract, but at least I want to convey that, you know, we want clarity. Um, and so, you know, whether or not we say, as you indicated, you know, within the first quarter to set out those um, objectives, um, uh, goals and objectives, I think is a realistic thing. And we encourage that collaboration. I don't want it a part of the contract, but at least to convey that. That I appreciate, you know, his um, interest in, in being, you know, having a measurable and um, but, just don't want to set him up for failure. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Chair, I would say this. I think it's the opposite. Mr. Bangora is asking you, the board, collectively to tell him what is the objectives, what do you expect of him, and then he'll do that. So. Okay. This is a provision that's not on Mr. Bangora, it's on the board to get together and say, here's what we want you to do, and I'll be measured by what I'm told to do. So maybe another way of approaching this is that probably within the first um, even 30 days of next year that the board, I think, should be um, considering what it, you know, to make it a part of our agenda, you know, what it is that our expectations are. Um, I think you know, to be very clear. So to take the assignment seriously. Yeah, and I, I mean, as your lawyer, this was really a term that uh, is going to be in your court, not his court. And I think what you've said, Commissioner Forney, would be I would recommend that, that this is like the board get to work and you've got a new superintendent and say, here's what we expect. And the sooner you can do that, probably the better off uh, everyone's going to be. Commissioner Forney, do you have additional questions? Uh, not an additional question, but if I remember correctly, I believe that we do have a possibility of a um, committee of the whole, I think the third um, week in January, and then I, I ask that that be one of the agenda items. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Forney, Commissioner Vitan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any other questions or discussions on the uh, 
terms of the contract before uh, before you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? Um, seeing none, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, uh, thank you for uh, drilling into the details of the uh, of the contract. I think it's good that everybody has an understanding of what we're agreeing to on the biggest decision what, uh, that we are going to make. Um, I will say this is exciting. Uh, thank you to the entire board for their for their work. Thank you for authorizing me to bring this contract forward. Um, I think Mr. Van Gora is uh, strategically and uniquely positioned in the entire country at the uh, tail end of a year-long search to uh, be successful in the position of the superintendent. Um, I know there are a lot of clauses in this that talk about the event of Mr. Van Gora not being successful. Uh, but the frame that I am taking from the get-go, and I think the frame that I would encourage all of us, and I know Mr. Bangor is taking, is that uh, the Minneapolis Park Board will continue to be successful. Uh, we are approving this contract, should you approve it, uh, on the uh, tail end of a banner year for the Minneapolis Park Board. We have had, um, we've worked really hard together. Uh, we've had challenges at times, but we have had a, um, I think the testament that uh, that this board unanimously agreed to pursue a contract with Mr. Bangora. We had a unanimous budget. We had um, just done a lot of work together in securing a down payment on our city's youth. Uh, Mr. Bangora is poised to build off of those successes for the next year and I think work with us on the opportunities where we all need to grow together. Uh, so with that, um, I would um, obviously encourage uh, commissioners to uh, support this contract with Mr. Bangora and welcome Mr. Bangora back home to the city of Minneapolis. As uh, they're uh, seeing no further discussion, I would ask the secretary to take a roll. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Kogan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Absolutely, yes. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Hassan. Aye. President Forney. Uh, aye. You have nine ayes. Uh, welcome home, Mr. Bangora. We will be seeing you very soon. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, I would entertain a resolution for 2018-350, a resolution approving the Second Amendment to the employment agreement between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and uh, Mary Merrill Anderson and authorizing the President and Secretary to execute the agreement with Mary Merrill Anderson to act as Interim Superintendent on a full-time basis for the period of February 5th, uh, 2018 to January 19th, uh, 2019. Is there a motion? It's so been moved. Is there a second? A second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Meyer. Uh, so in the first resolved clause, it refers to this as the First Amendment, when it is the Second Amendment, so I would propose to amend that. Without objection, is there any objection to Commissioner Meyer's uh, diligent correction? Is there any objection? Is there any objection? Seeing none, we will accept the correction. Um, just for uh, clarification, is there any other discussion? Uh, is there any other discussion? Um, I do have uh, one question for uh, council. Um, Superintendent Emeritus Merrill's current contract goes through December. Um, never mind, I withdraw my question. <laughs> I, I just uh, I was reading something wrong. Um, seeing no further uh, no further discussion, I would ask the secretary to uh, take the roll. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Hassan. Aye. President Bourne. Aye. You have eight ayes, one nay. Uh, the motion carries. Uh, Superintendent Merrill, are you willing to uh, stay as superintendent until January 19th? Thank you, Superintendent Emeritus Merrill. Uh, moving on to item 9.3, uh, uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold, 
uh, we have our uh, first discussion on the work that we've been doing over uh, the summer and into the winter on our park police learning sessions. So uh, Deputy Superintendent. Thank you, President Bourne. Commissioners, I um, feel like this is kind of the halftime update. <laughs> um, and uh, we had promised when we began the learning sessions in September that we would come back to you by the end of the year and present findings. So this is not recommendation phase yet. This is findings phase. So this is an opportunity um, for you to, at this point, even be able to say, mm, maybe you missed something, for the community to weigh in and indicate if they think we missed something. Um, and after the presentation tonight, we will also be making sure all of the data from all of the um, comments we received are posted online along with this presentation. So we really want to make it accessible to folks so that they can uh, dive into it, they can critique us if they want to, and you know, we, we can make this an iterative process. Um, I am presenting on this tonight actually on behalf of the entire Park Police work group. Um, this has been an extraordinary group of people to work with uh, since actually August, I think, is when we started meeting as a group. And for the most part, we have met every Friday for at least an hour since that time period. And that has been a time where we have certainly contemplated um, next steps with the community, but we've contemplated next steps with staff, next steps with uh, the family members. So we've had a lot of different um, groups that we've been focusing on within that, within that group. When we did decide to branch out and uh, set the structure to engage the community, we knew we would need some additional help in order to do that. So we were able to rely on a group of our staff. We call them the internal influencers. This is a group of staff who has had over 40 hours of racial equity training, everything from understanding uh, structural, institutional, and individual racism and biases to understanding how historic trauma lives in the body. So these individuals were the ones that we sought out when we knew we were going to be reaching out to the community and be having conversations with, with them, which some of them we knew would be difficult conversations. So we're in gratitude to the facilitators and note takers who helped with that. We also had five individuals who went through the uh, nearly 1,300 comments and coded them. Um, and then also, in order to get this on our website, everything that goes on this, these days is ADA compliance. So very thankful to Taylor and Vincent for helping um, with that. Um, and this couldn't happen without the participants. So we're also in gratitude to the participants themselves. In total, we had 114 community members, including youth, participate. And we had 95 staff members who were actually giving us data. And if you contemplate that they, each person gives about two hours of time, and we had nine meetings, um, we end up with about 418 hours of engagement that was contributed to this to date, and likely to be more um, in the future. Just a reminder, when we started out, we have anticipated this would be a three-phase process. We are now closing in at the end of that initial information sharing phase. So this is the time where we said we'd come and we'd report findings. Next, after this phase, we will be diving into the recommendations phase, but we're going to spend tonight talking primarily about those findings. Uh, I get to pull from planning on this. I don't know if Adam is still in the room at the moment, but I'm excited to use his slide because it does a great job <laughs> of articulating what happens when we get a comment. So you've seen this before. So a commenter makes a comment, right? They, they provide a comment. And there might actually be three, four, maybe even six or seven ideas within those. Those each get broken out into an individual uh, idea. And then we look at them to see if they fall into a unique theme or combine with an existing theme. And then we go to the next comment. And you'll see that sometimes the comment falls into an existing theme. And sometimes you need uh, to create a new theme. And the importance for me talking about that is that it's important to realize we didn't come up with a set of themes and then try to drive the comments into them. The comments tell us what the themes are. So it's a really uh, grassroots type of process. Um, and as I said, we had 13 or 1,334 uh, comments. 
those rolled up into 52 themes. And in order to make this manageable into the recommendations phase, that has rolled up into 11 topics. Again, each of those a grassroots uh, movement up versus us trying to push the data into a preset set of ideas. So let's talk a little bit about what those topics area, area are. Um, so we had uh, several themes that spoke to historic trauma, racial profiling, uh, concerns around or support for uh, relationships with park police, um, recounting negative or positive interactions. And we looked at those as a team and said, this fits into a, a topic area uh, that we called park police or police relationship with community and youth. Uh, then we started to see a series of themes um, around kind of alternatives to policing. So focusing on more youth work, more recreation type staffing versus policing staffing or uh, recognizing a, a concept of the fundamental uh, basis of oppression that could be found within in policing. And so we took those themes and put them into a topic called alternatives to delivering park safety. <clears throat> We had a few themes that uh, talked about the need for more information, more definition, or concerns or thoughts about the July 10th event at Minnehaha Falls. And those fell into an information and definition about role and park police theme. <clears throat> There were several um, comments uh, that fell into themes that talked about um, undergoing training, differentiation from city uh, police, um, policing strategy, so all things that once you had a police force, how you were actually uh, applying the strategy of policing. Um, there were themes that focused in on resources or the composition of uh, the Park Police Department and those fit into a Park Police Resources theme. There were some themes that came up around staff relationships, either uh, poor morale amongst Park Police or whether or not there was um, support from administration or opportunities to create better collaboration between staff who are in the field and um, Park Police. And we um, slid those into a topic called uh, staff relations. There were several things that came up that were more tactical, so types of uniforms, types of transportation, uh, possession or not of weapons, and those fit into patrol tactics. We're almost, I know this is exciting to see a lot of, a lot of items um, on the screen like this, but it's important that you get to see all of the themes <coughs> and get an understanding of what they are, because this is something that if you're not comfortable with how these themes are laid out, we should get, we should start to get that feedback now. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a series of comments that rolled up into themes that uh, contemplated the presence of park police within parks for, against, uh, maybe not familiar, um, and that rolled into a topic of park police presence. Um, there were comments about either satisfaction or dissatisfaction about the process itself, and that uh, laid out into MPRB community engagement for the project. And there were a few, not many, things that were out of scope or considered in other where it just wasn't, it wasn't um, uh, a topic, maybe it was talking about a whole other type of project or a parking lot or something very different than what um, the topic was, and those fit into another topic. So in total, we ended with 11 topics um, at this time. And so as we roll into the recommendation phase, um, which is intended to go from January until April, we, we need to now determine how we move from those topics and those findings to recommendations. And when you look at uh, the topics, you'll start to see that there is some sequencing or ordering. Like you wouldn't really want to talk about uh, park uniforms or patrol tactics until you answer the question of how are, we do, how are we actually looking at this relationship of community and police? How are we actually looking at alternatives to police? And you'd want to answer those questions first before you rolled into some of the more tactical items. 
So you'll see that they break up potentially into three um, nice categories where you go from kind of the why to uh, some of the tactics to finally then how are we engaging other staff, community members in this work through implementation. But they, uh, they might be sequenced as we would walk through them from defining strategy or defi definition and strategy, tactics and resources to commun uh, communication and ongoing engagement. Um, and it might result then uh, as we are looking at it in a series of teams. And if we were to group them in some type of form like that, there might be three to four teams that would either maybe start and then sequence in over time, or maybe you'd start one team and let the others roll in as you got um, prepared for it. Uh, but as we would uh, group continue to refine that, the one thing that we are increasingly very certain about is we want this recommendations phase to be a relationship building phase. We, we have valued the time we have spent together as a work group and recognize what we have learned and, and worked through as a work group. And we really want to create that experience as we work through the recommendation phase as well. And uh, we see this as an opportunity to bridge relationships between commissioners, between police officers, between community members, key staff from departments across the organization, um, uh, potentially youth in some cases, and then uh, what we're calling thought leaders related to the topic. And we're very intentionally using the term thought leader because the, the concept of an expert could be construed as a specific type of expert with a specific focus on a, a, a type of policing or a, a, a specific track. And we, we want to make sure that we're bringing in people who are thought leaders on a range of ideas as we would work through this. So with that being said, um, what our intention would be to do as a team, unless there was, or a work group I would say, unless there was different direction given from the board, is we would start working towards crafting what these teams look like, the subject matter that they would address so that we could fit their work into the first four months. Those first four months of next year are gonna be really packed with a lot of fun stuff, but fit that work into the first four months of next year with the hopes that we would be at a spot if we knew there were budget asks or other types of things that you wanted to incorporate for um, what would then be 2020, you'd be able to do that. So with that, um, I'll take questions and comments, and this URL actually directs <coughs> you directly to the project page for this work. And if it's not already, um, it will be soon all of the data that you could look at from a, both a raw perspective as well as a compiled perspective, and then this presentation will go up on that site. Thank you, uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold. Um, before we go into discussion, I will look at Commissioner Meyer and any other commissioners. Uh, are we in need of a short recess? <laughs> All right, is anybody in need of a short <laughs> recess? All right, see, seeing none, we'll go into, uh, we'll go into <coughs> discussion. Thank you for the presentation, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold. Are there any questions or comments? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner <laughs> Kogel. All right. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for preparing this presentation. Um, I haven't been part of the Friday morning meetings, but I just commend everybody in staff uh, as, as well as a couple of my fellow commissioners for being part of those conversations um, and for the members of the police department that have been part of those conversations. Um, I feel very good. I've gone through this um, the, the comment uh, sheet and um, kind of the compiling and themes, and I feel very, very good about how that process has, has gone so far. And um, so I'm very hopeful um, for the second phase um, in, the, in the coming year and am looking forward to working with everybody who's, who's interested in, in continuing this, uh, this work and coming forward with some very clear, uh, decisive uh, recommendations for improvements that are gonna make everybody in our system feel safe and have confidence in, in our policing force. Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Kogel, Commissioner French. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who participated in the work group. Thank you, Chief Ohado, uh, for what, what we have our cultures clashing. We have police culture that's been defined, and we have communities that have a different culture. And we are trying to figure out a way for, for us to bridge these two different cultures together so it works for everybody. And, uh, we took a really big step this summer. I think we got a lot more room to grow and a lot more stuff to do. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to all the staff that participated. Uh, I want to say thank you to 
uh, Jennifer, who kind of led the effort. Appreciate it. So I just let's let's keep moving forward. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French. Is there any other discussion or uh, comments? Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion or comments? Um, Deputy Superintendent, uh, could you please put up the slide of the folks that had worked on the work to since July on this? Uh, and while you're bringing that up, uh, Superintendent Merrill. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that that we began that work um, as a result of, of that incident, but um, I think that um, we, so we don't want to forget that, but we also want to know that we have really um, grown um, where we think we want to go with um, with service levels and really looking at park policing from a wide range of views so and, and again would add my thanks to all of the people who uh, came and participated and put in really um, a lot of their personal time in thinking about um, how we could improve um, our park police relationships within the park board thank you superintendent uh, Merrill Commissioner Vita So late. <laughs> oh. um, I just wanted to say that, you know, I attended some sessions, but not a lot. But I wanted to thank Abdi. Um, mm -hmm. Abdi was like amazing during this whole time, even from I, I just remember when Superintendent Merrill said that it started from the incident at Minnehaha. And just it, it just reminded me at, of how great Abdi was from the very beginning, from when the incident happened, just Thank you so much, Abdi. You did just a wonderful job from the beginning with the families, just keeping us posted on what was going on, just just being warm to everybody in, in the situation from the beginning to the end. So thank you so very, very much for all your work and all your help in, in a very culturally sensitive um, situation. So thank you so, so very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Vitas. Is there any other questions or discussion? Superintendent Merrill, your light is still, okay. Um, seeing none, I'll just, I, I will also extend my uh, thanks to staff. Um, I was in quite a few of the sessions early on um, once we started uh, negotiations with uh, Superintendent Bangora and we started kind of coming to, um, as we started moving further along that road, I had excused myself from quite a bit of those Friday morning meetings to, uh, as did Commissioner, uh, Commissioners Vita and Vice President Hassan to start working on to make sure that we had a, uh, the, make sure that we had the vote to take earlier. But, but I will say like when, uh, I think when so many people walked into that room and so many folks from the community uh, first came in the aftermath of the July uh, July 10th incident uh, when folks first got to that room I think that there was a lot of skepticism even around even around this table of folks that were working on it. and a lot of uh, well what agendas are being what agendas are being advanced here and what um, what work are we trying to what what work is trying to get done what what preconceived outcomes are there um, so there was um, I was really proud of the way that this, uh, what I had seen in my time there, that uh, this uh, group of individuals really kind of put their preconceived notions aside. 
um, folks really listen to one another and listen to their uh, to their truths and to their life experiences. Um, I've learned some things along the way. Um, I still, um, as I'm sure everybody on this list still has, like our own our own skepticisms, our own um, our own points of unease, and our own desires to want to. But what is very clear is that all of us want to do better together, and we do owe more to the uh, folks of the uh, city of Minneapolis. Uh, and we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I would imagine that there will be um, budget consideration items coming forward from, from these work groups. Uh, so the board will have to give uh, increasing thought to how those, um, one of the things that I think Vice President Hassan and uh, many of us had echoed was that you know we don't want to we don't want to be three years out on on responding uh on responding to this and and the way our budget cycles work this incident happened on july 10th of 2018 we're going into our budget for next year which means changes if their budgetary changes would be implemented in 2020 i think the board would really uh be served well and the organization would be served well when those recommendations come forward that we look at mid-year budget adjustments we've heard um, several several people come out this evening um, talking about the need for more programming in the East African community. Um, some of those are echoed in uh, direct uh, direct response to the July 10th incident. Um, I want to applaud Vi uh, Vice President Hassan's leadership for his work in expanding the um, Walt Dietzik Recreation Innovation Fund, where I think that there is some funding that is available to start immediately addressing some of those concerns. Um, it may want to be a staff may want to look at um, given the needs in the community right now that there is a set of year one recommendations for the uh, DTIC uh, Recreation Innovation Fund that really are focusing around this point in time in the park board and this point of time of what we are uh, what we are hearing. Uh, so there's quite a lot of work to do. Uh, thank you everyone for, for your roles in the work to all the commissioners that came to I know Commissioner Vita said that she didn't go to a lot of meetings, but she did. I saw, I saw, her, quite, I saw her quite a few. Um, the everybody put in a lot of work, had a lot of conversations with folks, and I mean, this this took a lot of bandwidth for the organization this year, mm -hmm. and um, it just took a lot of bandwidth. And I was amazed to see everybody work together. So, uh, thank you, and we'll. Uh, look forward to, I don't think there's any objection to the concept of the formation of the leadership teams. Uh, so I think you're getting some head nods from for your for your next steps, Deputy Superintendent. Right. Thank Just you. Again, wanted to add, again, um, Jennifer Ringel, our Deputy Superintendent, did a great job in leading this effort. And um, I really, yeah. <laughs> Moving on to just one moment to find my spot in the agenda. New business. Moving on to new business. The uh, new business, uh, I would entertain a resolution for 2018 354 commemorating the life and accomplishments of Walter Dietzik and directing <laughs> staff to continue the process of finding a suitable park asset to be named in his honor to recognize uh, Walter's service to, many, to the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and the city of Minneapolis. Is there a motion? Uh, so moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, prior to discussion for, uh, for commissioners, I'd just like to ask uh, possibly Council Rice and Superintendent Merrill to address the resolution. They had done a lot of work in bringing this forward to the board. Um, they are also the only folks sitting up here. I, I missed the opportunity to serve with Commissioner Dietzik by a couple of days, um, so I would ask that um, I, I would ask that possibly Council Rice and Superintendent Merrill uh, just speak to the speak to the resolution first, and then I'll open it up to commissioners. Do you want? Okay. Um, you know, thank you, uh, uh, President uh, Bourne and. Uh, Commissioners, this has been a hard year for the park board. Uh, Annie Young served for 28 years. Uh, Walter <coughs> Dietzik served for 12 years. That's 40 years. Um, there's nine commissioners, and 
the um, collective years of service on this board is a fraction of those two commissioners. So it's pretty hard to lose Annie and Walter in a year. Certainly Annie's, um, in terms of her contribution to the board, uh, a lot of talk happened earlier in the year, and, and she was here more than twice as long as Walter. But I was fortunate to sit next to Walter for a good part of his 12 years. And prior to his 12 years on the board, uh, Walter served uh, 22 years as a city council member. And before that, he served uh, as a Minneapolis police officer for I think another 16 years. So collectively, that's 50 years of service in the employment of the city of Minneapolis. Um, <clears throat> I can't say that's a record, but it certainly is significant. Um, and um, I was fortunate to uh, speak at his funeral. And you Walter lost his father when he was two years old. He was the uh, second youngest of uh, six. And you really have to wonder how a guy who didn't know his dad turned out to be such a great dad. At least that's my impression of him. And um, I think if he were here, um, a lot of it was due to what uh, the Minneapolis Parks and the Minneapolis schools did for him. Um, he was an athlete. He was an extraordinary athlete. Uh, he was uh, a 17-year-old graduate from Edison High School. The, um, then Brooklyn Dodgers signed him to a professional contract. And at that time, the Brooklyn Dodgers had uh, Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella. Um, Walter actually caught for Sandy Colfax when he was coming up in the system. And Walter was the fourth catcher behind uh, Roy Campanella. Uh, Johnny Roseboro, who was an all-star, caught for the Dodgers and then the Twins. And so then they would have two catchers go up in the major leagues and two in the minor leagues. I think if Walter had signed with any other uh, team other than the Yankees, he would have been in the major league. Um, you know, he's an extraordinary uh, athlete, um, and he got that from uh, the Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, there was a fellow named Pete Guzzi there who Walter was um, no saint by any means. Um, he was a tough guy. Um, I knew that because I, uh, I, I had some friends that were arrested by Walter, as they remember, <laughs> um, to this day. Um, but he was, uh, he was quite a guy, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, he was just quite a guy. Um, I would add to that. Um, I got to know Walter uh, really well as he became a commissioner. Um, with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. I certainly knew of him as a city council member. And he usually, it usually came in the frame of that he was um, feeling like the park board wasn't doing enough for our youth and children because he cared. First of all, he loved people. Um, he, re he really was a people person. But he, his devotion to the children of the city was amazing to me. And, um, but... More than that, he loved Northeast Minneapolis. And there were many times when we would, you know, we'd go on these tours to look at different programs. And uh, Walter would come and he would take pictures with all the kids, whether it was the south side or the north side or wherever. He'd take pictures with everybody. And, but then as soon as we kind of left the room, he'd say, I want one of those over Northeast Minneapolis. <laughs> you know, so... He, he was uh, really uh, an incredible representative for that area. Um, he thought outside the box. He wanted uh, the staff to think outside the box. When I think about Botnell and the shape of that facility, we didn't have a lot of money. The building burned down. And so, but he really wanted to do something unique uh, for that community. And he really thought about um, how we could do something different, and we have a different building. We have a fill house that we never would have had there. We have a, a gym facility that just wouldn't have been there had he not been willing to think outside the box and look at different ideas for how we might do our building there. Um, I know um, the Northeast Ice Arena. Um, we wouldn't have had that facility had it not been for uh, Walter Dietzik. 
So I would just say that um, uh, I, I think he was tough, but he was tough about the fact that he wanted the best for the children of Minneapolis. Um, and he wanted the best for the people of Northeast Minneapolis and the whole city uh, as well. And so again, um, he, his contribution to this board was immeasurable. Um, I uh, really enjoyed my time getting to know him and getting to know um, uh, kind of the leadership style that he had in terms of athletics were really important to him, the golf, uh, golf courses were really important to him. Uh, he had a really strong uh, friendship and relationship with people like Dick Yates and Tommy Johnson and those, those are names of the guys who uh, were district supervisors and, and directors of different uh, departments that um, they would talk daily about what they thought ought to be occurring in our parks and, and really trying to pursue um, athletics, not only for um, for the um, boys, but athletics for girls as well. And then he really got interested in the arts. And um, I remember he used to refer to our city children's nutcracker, the production that we did, um, uh, as uh, Kathy Thurber's program. Then one time I said, come on, Walter, I want you to go see our city children's nutcracker. And he went and saw it, and he um, I could imagine one of his grandchildren as a part of that group. And all of a sudden, he was really <laughs> our biggest supporter of the city children's nutcracker. So um, again, um, any way to engage youth, he was, he was for it. And uh, he will be sorely missed. Uh, his leadership and his strength and his support will be sorely missed. Uh, in this city and, and uh, in the parks. He continued to go to, uh, up to maybe a couple months ago, up to Botno. He was part of the walking group, the adult walking group up there, and um, just continued to stay involved. So, yeah, I will miss him as well. And Thank his wife, who, who did an incredible job as well. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Merrill, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Bourne. Thank you both for sharing your recollections of Mr. Dietzik. I did not um, know him very well. We did meet once or twice, and he was um, a very colorful, very colorful speaker about parks, so that was fun. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to my colleagues for uh, noting that we should be following the naming policy with this one. I was very excited to see that in here. I, I really deeply appreciate that we are going to try and follow our process and policy. That is fantastic. And then I would ask staff when we do that, we do have a couple of naming requests that are pending from a number of other areas within the city. It would be lovely if we could um, streamline those into this process as well so we could try to not duplicate efforts if at all possible. and get some of those um, other naming asks that have been made of the institution actually done at some point. Um, I would love it if we could do that. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner uh, Meyer. Thank you. I only got to meet Commissioner Zizek once. That was when we were commemorating the Northeast Recreation Center, which is one of several projects that he helped Get done in uh, Northeast Minneapolis. So I, I think it's very appropriate for us to find a, a suitable place to commemorate uh, his service to the Park Board. Uh, this afternoon I did submit several corrections to the resolution. I don't mean to be tedious, but they're already online. I don't know if you want me to make an amendment. Or... Uh, without objection, <laughs> okay. uh, your very diligent corrections would be received. Is there any uh, objection? Is there any objection? Is there any objection? Uh, Commissioner Myers, uh, corrections are uh, received <coughs> by unanimous consent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Um, I'll just say I, I didn't have the opportunity to serve with Commissioner Dietzik. Um, I did, uh, after my parents got divorced when I was 12, uh, my mom and I moved to Northeast Minneapolis and um, you could not live in Northeast Minneapolis without um, uh, Walter Dietzik was a presence and a, and a force. The, I mean, when I was a 
kid. I was like, what's that name that I can't pronounce? <laughs> and the, and it was just everywhere. And, um, the, but I did have the opportunity to, uh, meet with him, um, uh, meet with him maybe about a dozen times over the last uh, over the last nine years and see him in passing at events. Um, the when I was first selected onto the board, uh, he was uh, he was retiring from the board at that time. Um, I think uh, I, I mean, two of my best memories of the first board meeting that, that I came to was shaking hands with uh, Superintendent Merrill. And shaking hands with um, uh, Mr. Dietzik. they were both just the epitome of class. And um, and I, I think uh, Walter said something very—I don't remember exactly what he said—but he was like, "I, I, I want to help you succeed. I might not have agreed with, uh, I might not agreed with what you were running on, but I want to see you succeed." And so he was always open to have conversations around the parks um, and just really. Um, Really wanted to see uh, the organization put its best foot forward. Um, so, uh, Mr. Dietzik will be missed. I, my undergrad is in theater. I actually had a narrowly missed opportunity. I think I started bragging about it a little too soon to some of the folks in this room. I was asked to play Walter Dietzik in a uh, in a play, um, but it was and I, I uh, said I would only I would only be part of it. Uh, it was about the history of Minneapolis. I said I would only be part of it if I could play uh, Dietzik when I saw the cast list, and it was kind of a cast of cast of characters from. Um, uh, we'll all know some of those names. I said, I, I get to play Dietzik, and I was already starting to invite folks. I'm like, you guys got to come to this. Um, I was brushing off my acting chops, but then the play was rewritten, and um, and he wasn't he wasn't there. But um, <laughs> so so uh, you were spared that experience of me dragging you all to a theater to watch me perform uh, as Commissioner Dietzik. But uh, but he will be missed, and uh, I think this resolution is very fitting. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Meyer, for. Uh, agreeing to help be part of the uh, uh, naming um, naming recommendations. Thank you to former board members. Uh, thank you, Council Rice and Superintendent Merrill, uh, for all of your insight on this. So, seeing no further discussion, uh, all of those in favor of Resolution 2018 354, I would ask the Secretary to take a roll. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Hassan. Aye. President Ford. Aye. You have nine ayes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Rice and Superintendent Merrill, for helping to prepare the resolution and, and bring that forward. Um, moving on to petitions and communications, I will start with Commissioner Vita. So thank you, um, Superintendent Merrill and uh, Council Rice for that. I had text Brian maybe like a couple weeks ago and asked, was anything else going to happen um, for Walter? I, I didn't know him. I met him once at the same place that Chris did, and I... I, I think most of you know that I believe in celebrating people when they're here. So I I had talked to John Irwin about Annie, and when I looked up the documents, there was actually something for Walter and Annie that he had been working on. So I, I appreciate you doing that. I think that the people who work with them should do it. It would be kind of weird for me to do it. I wouldn't have had those great stories to tell. So I appreciate that. Um, also, I, I mean, this is our last meeting of the year, so... I want to thank staff for holding us down this whole year. It's been a up and down kind of year, right? <laughs> we made it though with the help of you all. So thank you all so very much for supporting us. And um, well, I should say me. I should speak for myself. Thank you all so much for supporting me in this um, hard year. It's been rough. It's been a long year of my regular job and then learning how to do this. I've learned a whole lot. Thank you, Mary, for your support this year. Um, the superintendent search was really rough, but we made it. I'm really excited about this year to come. I think next year is going to be so much better for us here um, and hopefully for staff, too. Uh, I look forward to the work that we're going to do. I'm excited about everything we've done so far, and I want everyone to enjoy the holidays if you celebrate them, and I look forward to seeing you on the second. Thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner Vita, Commissioner Meyer. Pass. Uh, Commissioner Colgill. Uh, thank you, President <laughs> Bourne. Um, well, first I want to say Holodazzle's been really fun, and I've gone like so many times because I now live right by there. So if you haven't gone yet, please check it out before the holiday season ends and all of the shops um, go away. But of course, skating will continue to be there. They have this really cool thing this year where you can take on certain days, check out uh, headphones and like listen to really annoying Christmas music while you're skating. But it's cool if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and please do check it out. Um, I also just want to say, uh, and, and to echo Commissioner Vitas, uh, uh, some of her comments, uh, thank you to the staff for this first year, uh, I, and thank you to all of my fellow board members for this year. Um, I think we've learned a lot, um, and it's been uh, a, a great honor and a, a really fun time, I think, overall for myself. I'd like to thank Every, everybody for their leadership in a variety of ways. I'd like to f thank President Bourne for leading us through a big transition with six new um, board members, um, and uh, and and really everybody who's who who have stepped up and gotten challenged and continued to learn, um, myself included. I think I've had a lot to learn. Um, I, I also I know it's been about a month since the last time we had a meeting here, but I, I after that meeting wanted to say a couple things about my own commitment to. Um, Working with everybody on the board, um, I, I, I really want to be somebody who um, is held to a high esteem, and so I just want to say a couple of things that I am going to commit always to learning my Robert's Rules of Order better. Um, <laughs> I'm going to treat with everybody with respect at all times, and I'm going to do my utmost to articulate my positions in the moment and attempt to sway my colleagues and respect all disagreement. Um, and you can hold me to those um, couple of things um, and anything else uh, uh, happy to um, consider as well. And I also always get a drink with somebody even if we disagree very loudly uh, <laughs> during a meeting. So those are my big things um, and I just again want to say thank you everybody for your support this year and I'm really looking forward to next year. Thank you Commissioner Cogill, um, Commissioner French, uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you. Um, First of all, I want to um, reiterate um, to Interim Superintendent Merrill that I do apologize for um, not our last meeting, the meeting before. Um, I know that both of us take our jobs very seriously, and um, I appreciate it. Um, and I just want to articulate it again since somebody indicated that they didn't feel I had. I wanted to repeat that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to acknowledge also that I went to um, Walt's um, funeral and um, Council Rice to give the eulogy. It was wonderful. It was just a marvelous um, statement of the man. And I thought the most exciting thing is the fact that it was his birthday. On the, the funeral was on his birthday. And the church was packed, just packed. And they had everybody sing happy birthday. That was just a very touching thing, and I know that's something that um, Walter would have appreciated. So, um, I did attend the Pesticide Advisory Committee meeting. Um, it's a wonderful, engaging group. Um, I, I really appreciate the fact that um, we as a board decided to um, have our separate appointees. Um, it isn't, it's an unusual um, way that we do things. And then to combine it, you know, with the um, Technical Advisory Committee. Um, so, um, I, I'm pleased with the group. Um, although I am um, concerned that um, part of our resolution, we did not indicate who is going to be uh, appointing the chair, and yet it, there was a, a chair appointed um, by the president. And so that um, I just would like us to reexamine is that was our intent because it's not in the resolution, um, and I, I want us to be transparent about what we are doing. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is the Parks Foundation. Um, I served on that a year ago and have continued to be involved. I'm on the development committee. And um, first of all, they had a holiday party. I think it was a week ago. And I met some of the new board members. I'm very excited that this group is going to be, um, has found some really, really wonderful, excuse me, younger people. <laughs> and um, uh, one in particular happens to be my appointee to the um, East of the River CAC um, 
wonderful, engaging woman, and uh, the other people that I met, um, very exciting. And then I have to brag that um, I think most of you know that I turned 70 in November, and next year um, I will be then consequently 70 and a half. And there is an IRA. Um, <laughs> Oh, I know. Uh, Commissioner Vitel loves for me to also indicate that what I am the oldest elected uh, Minneapolis elected official in the city of Minneapolis. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, but um, there's an IRA, um, IRS um, ability for you to um, uh, you you are mandated to at 70 and a half to um, take a minimum distribution from your IRA. Um, and you can um, have those funds directed straight to um, a not-for-profit and therefore, excuse me, avoid um, paying taxes. Um, it's something that, you know, is a huge benefit um, to um, the community. And um, so I am <clears throat> apparently the poster child for uh, the Parks Foundation as the 70 and a half, um, whatever, um, person who's advocating for those, so many of us baby boomers, to utilize this um, uh, advantage and um, particularly to use it for the Parks Foundation. So um, I do hope that I can um, be appointed to that board again next year. Um, it is something I am dearly uh, passionate about, and I really think that how we utilize um, these philanthropic um, organizations is what's going to sustain this um, park system. Um, I, too, went to the Holly Dazzle this past weekend. Um, it's wonderful. I feel sad that, of course, that it's largely mud, <laughs> but it still is just um, a, a wonderful event. Um, and with that, that's all. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Forney, Commissioner Severson. Pass. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Bourne. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending the capstone presentations from the University of Minnesota's Problem Solving for Environmental Change class uh, that was held here at the Park Board in lieu of the Minneapolis Tree Advisory Commission meeting for the month of December. Uh, you all should have this lovely handout at your spots uh, that gives a kind of high-level executive summary of each of the presentations. You'll be receiving a email from Assistant Superintendent Barrick when the um, reports in their entirety are available. These kids, um, and they're not kids, these young adults, they really went above and beyond in terms of getting to know the various challenges that we are experiencing at the Park Board and then digging into looking for solutions, very similar to the work that we do up here um, a couple of times a month. And seeing the presentations was fabulous. Hearing the suggestions was great. I, I know that um, Mr. Sievert and Mr. Barrick both walked away from that with a, with a couple of ideas that they wanted to look into implementing um, on an ongoing basis. I had a couple things that on my list that I'm hoping we can do as well, but I really recommend uh, taking the time to at least read through the executive summaries, if not uh, read through the full reports when we get them, because there's a ton of great stuff in there. And uh, we've got some very bright young people in our city doing great work, and I look forward to seeing what they do when they're in the workforce. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musich, Vice President Hassan. Oh, it's my turn. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, President Bon, and thank you all my colleagues for s supporting me, and uh, thanks to the residents of District 3 and uh, the people who elected me to serve them as, uh, as a representative. Uh, it's such an honor and humble, and also my colleagues to be give me the opportunity to serve them as their vice president. It's been a uh, learning experience, uh, very tough challenges to make, and uh, I, I've met some good friends, and uh, I think we have some things to learn from and you know, things to improve. And, uh, and one of the things that my dad used to tell me is that you make a mistake, you learn from it. And I'm sure, you know, I, it's something that we can, all learn, we can all learn from it, and we can all continue to be better. And uh, in, in 12 years that I was, in, uh, I was serving the board, and commissioner of the District 3, I've held 10 listening sessions, and some of them uh, were, were Superintendent Mayor Mer 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 was there, and uh, uh, Chief Ohado, 
And I just want to thank uh, Superintendent Mill for showing up to those meetings and listening to the community. And uh, one of them was in uh, Longfellow neighborhood, but the one, the hardest one was in Brian Cope, which, where, uh, which was about the Minnehaha incident, which is uh, an incident that affected the youth in, in, in my district and in, in our community that don't feel safe in our park system. But, you know, it'll take a lot to get that trust back and to build with the community that had been affected. And, uh, and as you guys see tonight, they showed up in uh, the last board meeting, in which they promised they will come. And uh, I was so happy that they came and make their voice heard, because that's, what's, uh, that's what this is all about. And uh, I want to thank Chief Ahado for also taking a, a big leadership on uh, the Minaha incident. Uh, I think you, the way you handled was very professional, and uh, the fact that you reached them out, you show you were able to work with the family, and it's something that changed my mind about you know uh, how we can all work together. Because uh, sometimes uh, someone who's a kid, a guy, and who grew up in our parks, PV Park, which is a park that um, I hold dear to, a park that I used to play soccer, basketball, and uh, and seeing the park police. And then get to witness as a commission, as an elected official, and then working with the family, and then working with you along with Abdi and uh, uh, the rest of the board and uh, the staff. I was very impressed. Uh, I was very uh, supported. You know, people feel like they're welcomed and uh, they've been heard. And also the president, who also show up some of those meetings, they were very, uh, they were very demanding. And uh, sometimes you have to work and meet in the middle. And uh, the, the staff were very professional and uh, working with everyone that came into those meetings or called them in regards to those incidents. But, you know, but I've learned a lot, you know, uh, over the years, uh, the 12 months that I've been serving this board. Uh, we in, I improved my leadership with, with uh trying to meet with everyone, work with uh, everyone in the board. And sometimes it can be challenging, you know, when people don't see each other a lot. It's a part-time job. <laughs> but we always find the time to uh, meet after the board meetings and uh, catch up and ask questions that we have. And uh, the other thing I also want to, I also want to work in next year is to work with the legislators to make sure there's enough funding for youth programming and the mayor of Minneapolis, uh, our mayor, uh, for, to make sure the, the, those uh, families that came here, their voice has been heard, and they're getting enough resources, enough funding to make sure they get in the programs that they, they deserve. And uh, I, it's one of my frustrations as a commissioner, I'll, say, I'll be honest with you, because I've been meeting with some of our uh, uh, staff, but now that there's going to be a new year, January is coming, and uh, there's nothing for uh, the communities in the city of Side, uh, which is the highly populated youth in the city of Minneapolis, immigrants who deserve access to a lot of resources, they don't feel like they're not getting enough, you know, what they need. It's, some, it's something that it's going to be hard for me as a commissioner, and as I'm getting calls every single day, and uh, and it's I know I get it. It's hard to meet the needs of a community that's uh, highly populated and that does have. Uh, a center that fits them all or have, uh, that can take a lot of people in one time. But I've, met with, I've, met, I've been to so many meetings and uh, I'm listening to them, but I can't do this alone. I want you know, my colleagues to help me and to make sure we're, you know, we're responding to those communities that came before <laughs> us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice President Hassan. Um, the... You know, I will just uh, echo as, I, as we're about to take a motion to adjourn on the last uh, meeting of uh, of 2018. Um, this was an incredibly successful year for the entire Minneapolis Park Board for all nine commissioners of the board. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you have taken the time to kind of go through the individual things that we've accomplished together, um, but it is quite a list, and and when you reflect on the fact that I think as uh, uh, Commissioner Kogel had said, it's a larger new board uh, and a large turnover uh, from the superintendent's office to our partners at the city, to our partners at the legislature. Uh, this board did not miss a beat. 
Uh, so I'm very, um, very proud of the work that we've done together uh, from, uh, without missing a beat, inviting Superintendent Mary, uh, Mary Merrill to return to the organization to help us through this year. Um, one of the first things that we all did together that I think we're all proud of that um, Commissioner Musich and Forney and I had worked on in the previous board was one of our first actions that we did together was uh, the, uh, the official restoration of Bidet Makoska, which I think, uh, I, I think really signaled the direction and the priorities that this board wanted to move, move in. Um, moving on after that, we swiftly repealed the spitting and lurking ordinances that were, um, that were many people in the community felt that there were disparate impacts on, on folks in the community. Uh, we uh, we created an agreement for uh, for the first uh, survivors memorial to victims of uh, sexual violence in the um, in the nation. We've expanded we expanded seats at the table at our Hiawatha uh, our Hiawatha CAC to include members from our Dakota community to make sure that they had a seat at the table. Uh, we negotiated a settlement with Graco, uh, which was a Herculean effort for everybody on this board, clearing uh, clearing the way on a lot of a uh, lot of liabilities that this board was facing coming in. Uh, in the midst of that, we had our incident on July uh, July 10th at Minnehaha Falls, and the entire board stepped up and said, "What what can we do to help all nine members all nine members of the board?" And our staff, um, Superintendent Merrill, secured our down payment on Minneapolis Youth. Uh, we were able to uh, fund full ser our full service community school pilot. We passed a moratorium on glyphosate. We ended the year with a unanimous vote on our budget after a lot of contentious on uh, uh, contentious negotiations, and we just ended this evening with a unanimous vote on the next superintendent of the Minneapolis Park Board. It is consider considering what uh, I think there's an expression we kicked beyond our uh, kicked beyond our coverage. Uh, is that is that the right expression, uh, Commissioner Severson? Uh, but I'm just really proud of the work that uh, that everybody did. Um, an incredible thanks to staff for the year. Um, the there's too many people to name, but uh, you know the the folks that I would not have been successful uh, without this year were Superintendent Merrill, uh, Council Rice, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold, and Vice President Hassan. Um, the Everybody, did, everybody contributed so much, um, but those folks were really uh, answered every single phone call, every single time that they were made. Sometimes called me more often than I wanted to take, but um, but did such incredible work. So I am honored to uh, work with all of you. I said at the beginning of this year that uh, being elected president of the Minneapolis Park Board was the honor of my life. I would just like to clarify that and say that being elected as president of this Minneapolis Park Board has been the honor of my life this last year. So thank you all for the opportunity to serve. Um, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the final meeting of uh, 2018. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? We are adjourned. Thank you all. Okay, it is. Aye. No, we still have committee. Yeah, we still have committee. I think planning was underway. Is planning it? Yeah, we'll go back and see. Yeah, I'd like to reconvene the planning committee. Um, we are at resolution 2018 352. If somebody could move that, please. Land development and easement agreement with Hennepin County Housing and Redevelopment Authority and the City of Minneapolis for application of the private land maintenance maintained for public use parkland dedication option to Lake and Hiawatha, including Market Square, located in the southwest quadrant of Lake Street and Hiawatha, and releasing to Hennepin County Housing and Redevelopment Authority the parkland dedication fees paid and related to Phase One of Lake Hiawatha, Lake and Hiawatha. Thank you. Um, Michael, if you can share with us um, this wonderful, another wonderful opportunity that we're. Chair Forney and Commissioners, I will attempt to move through this rather quickly, um, but I want to make certain you have a chance to answer questions. There are a few uh, nuances to this that I think are, are worth pointing out as I, as I move through. So this is a park plan dedication um, that relies on the private land maintained for public use option and it's a project that was facilitated um, by Hennepin County. 
um, just to review the parkland dedication options, a developer through the process and um, working with park board has uh, three options to dedicate land up to 10% of the land area based on a certain percentage or to provide cash in lieu of the land or the third option which is to provide a, a private land maintained for public use and there are a few of these that we have done most of the parkland dedication that's happened has followed the cash in lieu of land uh, but even as just I think in uh, November you looked at one um, that would help complete a private land maintained for public use application that helped achieve some of the um, uh, ideas around what we call the 8th Avenue streamscape leading to the river. This is the development site. On the north of the site is Lake Street. On the east side is Hiawatha <coughs> Avenue and the blue line. Um, the YMCA is to the west of this site um, and it is a 6.3 acre site and it was formerly occupied by the Minneapolis Public Schools. Um, and you can see the building that was there before redevelopment started. Um, the Hennepin County has called this project Lake and Hiawatha Lake and Hiawatha, and when it's fully developed, it's projected to include 100,000 square feet of office and with street level retail. That, that phase has been constructed. 560 units of market rate and affordable housing, a portion of that has been constructed. A three level, 406 space parking structure, that has been constructed. And then the subject of this discussion is the 50,000 square foot public plaza. 50,000 square feet is to, to reference back to CPRO, uh, which Adam, I think, said was 1.65 acres. This is 1.15 acres. Um, so we, we, will, we have been looking at this through the application of the private land maintained for public use. Um, and as a part of this, it will also releases parkland dedication fees that are paid. And I'll come back and talk about that as we move through this. This is the current development. The commercial building that uh, faces onto Lake Street has been constructed. And the first phase of the 560, um, approximately 560 uh, units of housing has been constructed. Ultimately, it will be this configuration. Uh, they change the graphics as they move through here. You can see that the remaining portions include a, um, uh, the, the housing on the southerly side of the site, one more housing unit that would face against a market plaza, and then there is, oops, um, I went the wrong way. Excuse me. The, the market plaza is this portion here. That's the 1.15 yes. of the 6.3 acres. So this is what it would look like at build out. Uh, market plaza is um, the parkland dedication proposal. So under this, uh, Hennepin County or its partner developers would construct, maintain, and provide land for what they call market square. It's a 50,000 square foot public plaza. In total, and there was a cost estimate included in your packet. Um, they expect to expend about $2.7 million on construction of the improvements. The development costs um, exceed the cash option. That's one of the things that we look at. If they were to look at the cash in lieu of parkland dedication, um, that total would be about 875000 And I will continue to say about 875000 because they haven't developed or submitted plans or permits for the last phases of, of this development. Um, and finally, with this uh, in the description of the proposal, the work would begin in 2019. So this, the small uh, green shape that I highlighted in, in one of the previous slides turns into this development they call Market Square. And it's called Market Square because it's attempting to accommodate both uh, market spaces and uh, socializing and recreation spaces for this neighborhood and for neighborhoods beyond. So. In the depiction of, of Market Square, they show um, uh, canopies or tents for the truck market, like a farmer's market, around the periphery of spaces, as well as some freestanding um, canopies. Um, three areas which we developed as more active play areas. And then the green area that's in the center is a, an irrigated lawn area that would be this, the, 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 the center of, this, uh, of the, what they call Market Square. When we look at these, we have to, we, uh, as, as private land maintained for public use, we look at how it fits in with other plans. Um, so we look at it in particular from the perspective of the comprehensive plan and then from the South Service Area Master Plan. 
So when we look at this, the, the map, the co comprehensive plan identifies a gap, and so w this is one of the places where there is a gap. It was refined as we went through the South Service Area Master Plan, and this is figure 3.2 from that master plan um, that highlights those two corridors uh, along Hiawatha Avenue and along the Lake Street corridor. Uh, Adam had talked about those when we talked about CPRO. And in particular, and highlighted with number um, 12 here, it says seek additional parkland or private land available for public use. Um, and it gets very specific and in the Hiawatha corridor in the vicinity of Lake Street. Uh, or it, so this is, um, you couldn't get closer to the target um, for this right, right here. So the parkland dedication fees were paid for the first phase. The uh, Hennepin County knew that they would be developing this but they needed to advance the construction of the first phase. So they paid just over 100, the developer, LNH Station Development, paid $190,000 to um, secure the permit rights to build uh, the first phase of the developments. Those fees have not been allocated through the parkland dedication that we take care of. Um, as a part of this agreement, the developers are requesting the release of those funds so they can be directed back. We, in, in areas outside of downtown, um, limit the amount of fee that can be waived to 75%. So in the subsequent phases, which have yet to be determined to get up to that approximate 875, we will still be collecting 25% of the total park dedication in cash. And when we come back, uh, we'll, we'll have that outlined in an agreement, and the, the application of those funds would be left to this board to decide through the CIP. Um, so uh, I note the last bullet point here that we will have to work with the developers um, to secure the deficit from that um, from the return of those funds. So it, the recommendation staff is making is that is based on the value of the improvements exceeding the likely parkland dedication fee, and in particular because it accomplishes goals that are really clearly outlined, um, very clearly outlined in the South Service Area Master Plan. So if this is approved, staff would go um, to Hennepin County and essentially go through the process that we've gone through with the other processes uh, that we, where we've applied the private land maintained for public use to execute an easement agreement and parkland development agreement. Um, and a part of this also would be the release of those funds, as I had mentioned. So this is the, pro the, the market square, and I'll stand for questions. Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Uh, in the staff report, it describes this project as tr a transit-oriented development, and I just want to object to that. Um, with 406 parking spots, it's not transit-oriented. You know, it's immediately adjacent to the light rail station, lots of transit options. They could have done better. That's not what's you know on the table for us tonight that, that's already built, but I just want to note that objection. Uh, it's... Interesting that it's described as um, private land for public use uh, because it's public land for public use for just a different government body, right? So I was wondering if you could uh, speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, like I know that it was controversial at the time of, of the dedication ordinances whether other government bodies would have to pay them. Um, so I, I'm curious, like. Why is it that they're not just transferring the land to us outright? Um, is there some kind of maintenance issue to that? Uh, Chair Forney, Commissioner Meyer, um, first of all, Hennepin County is not in the business of developing market rate apartments, so they are working with private sector developers, and so that's the notion of where the private land maintained for public use. It's actually a function of how the development as a whole is coming together. Even though Hennepin County is facilitating the process of developing this by acquiring the land, they have put together developers who are essentially, and with Hennepin County's HRA, acting in a private development capacity. So that's how we look at this. You are correct that um, there was discussion about how governmental entities would be subjected to the parkland dedication. Um, we don't talk about it often, but um, we did go through that process uh, because of Hennepin County's objection to paying fees for a project related to uh, the hospital in downtown. And so they're actually, while we describe most typically four approaches to parkland dedication, with two exceptions, one being affordable housing, the other as a result of changes that were made 
uh, to the ordinance last year, the year before, two years ago. Um, governmental and the, the projects of governmental entities are also not subject to parkland dedication. But this is a private development that's being facilitated through Hennepin County's HRA with private sector developers. Will it be private developers who own the land or will it be Hennepin County that owns the land? Uh, um, it's my understanding that the private developers are securing the land rights to develop here. And so the, pro the land, while it's being facilitated, it is being exchanged or sold or I don't know exactly what the terms of the deal are uh, through the private sector developers. So the, the, the first phase was developed not by Hennepin County, but by LNH Station Development. They're the ones who paid the $190,000 in for the park dedication fees for phase one. Okay, so who's going to be responsible for maintenance of the So, so at the, that's an important uh, factor here. Um, this project will be main, constructed, maintained, managed, overseen by um, a development entity that we, work, that we define in the easement agreement and parkland dedication agreement, the process that would result from this, um, so that the park board is not responsible for maintaining it. Um, there's probably several reasons why that becomes important to the developer. There's probably several reasons why it's important to us. But in this process, as we've described for other projects, all of the policies of the MPRB, the public facing policies about how this land will be used have to be applied. And it's the first kind of test that we ask developers when they are um, proposing this as a potential. And as, as staff, we kind of take it to the extreme and say, would you allow a public protest to happen here? Um, and if they say no, that's the end of the discussion. Okay. That's good to know. It's, you said that um, this exceeds the value of the park dedication fee. Do you have an estimate of how much? I'm just trying to get a sense of like how good of a deal it is to get the land instead of the money. So included, Commissioner Meyer, included in your packet was an estimate of the cost of construction. Um, the Hennepin County is also provided and it's summarized in the background the cost of land acquisition. Um, so when you put the total cost of land acquisition, design and, and development, construction of the space, they estimate it's $2.7 million. Um, when we look at the, the possible or approximate um, cash dedication, <laughs> um, even though we don't know exactly what's going to be in the last phases, it's estimated to be at about 875000 So it would be $2.7 million if we were to buy it and own it, but we're not buying it in this case. That's, but Commissioner Meyer, that's a fair way to look at it. Okay. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you. Commissioner Kohler. Thank you, Chair Forney. Uh, I just wanted to speak to the parking issue. Uh, this was recently at uh, City Planning Committee of the Whole, um, and um, there have been concerns from co other commissioners regarding at least some of the surface parking and the amount of surface parking. So that likely could change before the final design is approved by the city. Isn't it already built? Did I miss something? It, mm -mm. No. The parking lot, though, the parking garage is already built. Yeah, there's additional parking for the new units. Well, let's suppose that's that. Okay. <laughs> that's it? Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. Once again, this is so exciting. Um, uh, I question I just more for everybody's clarification. We have only done in lieu three, four, five times. Chair Forney, it, it started with the first one with the so-called Wooner um, um, probably three years ago. Um, we had a project in the Seward neighborhood with Seward uh, with the redesign when they were proposing at a project, I believe it's called Bessemer and Seward, a trail connection that would move through their pro through their property. Um, we've looked at it more recently at the Opus development on the Star Tribune parcel at West River Parkway and Plymouth um, Avenue, and there might have been one other, but I think that. Oh, and, and the Nordic in, in the North Loop where uh, we we oh, work with them. It's the the building that was essentially built in the parking lot of uh, of. Uh, um, What's, I forget the name of the Freehouse. That's right. I <laughs> uh, in the parking lot of Freehouse. 
So, so, we, so this is, uh, if you look at the, the number of, of uh, parkland dedications that have happened since the ordinance was implemented, um, this is one of a handful that have chosen this route. And, and yet, as far as I'm concerned, it's such a win-win. I mean, the whole objective of the park dedication fee was to put these little bits and these pieces together and, and make it possible for connections. And um, to me, this is the epitome of what, and the fact that we could collaborate on both of these, the CPRO um, as well as this with Hennepin County is, is marvelous. And I can't remember how much CPRO, how much had they invested, like seven point something or other already into the prop, uh, property? Uh, Commissioner Ford, I don't, I don't remember the number, but it's significant because they had to acquire the land, take down an elevator, and uh, build and maintain the site then. Right. And then with this 2.7 and everything, that's $10 million that has been invested already that, you know, we have not had to incur, and we are receiving the benefits of it. So I, it, to me, it's a marvelous thing. Just a point of clarification, it's not the YMCA, it's the YWCA. YWCA, thank you. <laughs> We women, we got to stand up for ourselves. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, I'm very excited about this. You know, once again, you know, thank um, Hennepin County for being such a wonderful um, partner with us. And um, hurrah, we've just, I think, um, added or will we'll be adding um, three more acres um, in District 3. It's too bad Commissioner um, Hassan isn't there to hurrah, hurrah. We have um, added. More and more. Keep it up. Thank you so much. So, we, um, all those in favor of the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose. Abstentions. So move. We will move on then to the next resolution. Uh, resolution 2018 uh, 353, uh, resolution approving an encroachment permit for use of 30 square feet of land in front of the subject property at 2002 Westlake of the Isles Parkway. Encroaching upon parkland at Lake of the Isles Parkway. Uh, okay, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> presentation, are people interested in one? It looks like I they. Would be, yes. Okay, yes. Christine um, Downey, if you're available, we'd love to hear about another encroachment. <laughs> I guess the main thing I just want to know is um, why staff is proposing to waive the fees and what, um, what benefit they see from that. So if I hear you correctly, you don't need a full presentation. You just would like to answer to that question? Yeah. Okay. So why we are waiving the fees, or why is it recommended? Um, what is your cost-benefit analysis to that, I guess? <laughs> Commissioner Meyer and um, Chair Forney. Um, the the uh, um, encroachment in, involves just the service walk, which is 30 square feet. And the property owner is also offering to replace 112 square feet of public sidewalk. And we have no plans on re actually replacing that public, uh, the uh, public sidewalk, which is adjacent, which is adjacent to the property owner's um, service sidewalk. So there were three panels of public sidewalk that were actually um, panels that were affected by a Dutch elm tree, or actually a elm, elm tree that was removed last year. And um, three of them were cracked. Well, actually one was cracked and two were half moon um, cutouts. And as a result of the removal, they became hazardous in terms of trip, trip hazards and one was heaved and one was cracked. So as a result of that, they offered to replace them in addition to their service walk replacement. So they're replacing 30 square feet for the service walk, but also off offering to replace the three panels of public sidewalk which is adjacent to their service walk so they're actually offering to replace more in terms of square footage than they're doing for their own their own property or actually for their own benefit so that's why we're asking they're offering to we're at, we're off we're suggesting or recommending that we waive the fee the fee is um i believe well, 1700 square 1700 dollars Enlisted in the. I'm sorry, it's 17. 17. $1,732.50. And then we also um, calculated that same value based on the 112 square feet of public sidewalk at 6000 
based on the same value that was used for um, the 30 square feet for the service walk. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Deal. All right. If no other lights, then um, all those in favor of the motion, uh, the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. We have uh, three uh, study report items. Uh, first one is the presentation of draft community engagement policy. Carrie Christensen and Radius, I guess, um, welcome. Thanks for staying so late. No, it's my bedtime. <laughs> Excited to be here on tonight. I'm just kind of excited because the strategic planning department extended an invitation to the community outreach department for us to co-lead this work. So both Carrie and I were assigned by our directors to lead this um, update on the community engagement project. And we utilized a racial equity toolkit to update the uh, community engagement policy. Good evening. Um, so we wanted to talk quickly about the process um, that we used for the policy update. And um, so we started out with a community engagement plan, which is typical of any big um, public policy sh um, update or master planning process, uh, vetted it with community, with our, our policy team, which was an inner kind of inner um, department um, park board staff team that was along for the entire ride with us, advising us as we went. Um, we did a document review of other agencies, um, community engagement policies. We looked at uh, sort of best practices in the community engagement field um, and gleaned kind of patterns and, and findings from that. Uh, we did a series of internal interviews with staff we did external interviews with what we call thought leaders and agency partners. We conducted a community survey um, online with past community advisory committee uh, participants and also posted it just generally out there for um, anyone that is interested in park board community engagement work. Um, we then drafted an update. We had our, our work group or our policy team review that. Um, and then we met with our leadership team, our executive committee. We had one-on-ones with commissioners um, as we worked toward opening it up for public comment. So um, we have just um, closed our official public comment period, um, but are here tonight to, to discuss and make sure that we have a chance to, to hear from you as a board um, about the, the draft policy. We've had also um, in this public comment period I'm actually going to, our, our next steps will be, so we'll take all the comments that we received during the public comment period. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we've done in the last couple <laughs> months because it's been, it's been a really great process, I think. Um, we'll take what we hear during public comment period, tabulate, um, make revisions to the, to the draft policy, and uh, bring it back to you for approval um, in 2019. So, as I mentioned, um, we... Um, so we opened up our public comment period in fall of 2018, uh, and it'll, it'll closed in early December. And we met with directors and division staff across the agency for feedback. It was, it's been really helpful to have um, these focus groups all across the agency over the last few months to make sure that the, the, the policy really uh, works for everyone and all the staff, especially at a director and manager level um, across the agency. We've learned a ton, and I think anticipate making some really meaningful um, changes to the draft that's been circulated. Uh, we also had a thought leader focus group um, and have done um, some, had some great interagency conversations with entities like the city of Minneapolis as they um, work on, on um, reimagining NRP and NCR and sort of what roles uh, neighborhood organizations play and how the funding works. And so it's, it's been really helpful for us to, to, to work with them. Um, and then finally, we had a community online survey and a traveling exhibit um, in rec centers. So <coughs> as you can see in the back of the room, that's our, our exhibit in, um, that we had in a number of, a number of rec centers across, across the city. So we, we are presenting here tonight uh, the draft plan, and we'll, we'll tabulate our comments and mod make modifications to the policy in the new year. 
and um, come back to you in January or February, we hope. Here's a, a shot of the exhibit at Botano. And it's, there was a suggestion, there was a box with comment cards in, in multiple languages and copies of the full policy and procedure um, if people wanted to take home a copy and read it with links to the, to the website. So as Carrie mentioned, we did a lot of drawing from our regional and national innovation uh, community engagement. We had a lot of great meetings and conversations with the city of Minneapolis, uh, Portland, uh, Oregon. We also, the Met Council and Nexus. So those are just some of the um, organizations that we got a chance to connect with, to share with them, share what we were doing. And so what we want to do right now is just to kind of share with you some of the feedback that we received from staff, uh, the interviews, and some of the key findings and what those were. One of the things that the staff were really good about letting us know is that they really wanted this uh, tool to be a tool for all of the organization as opposed to one or two departments. So they saw it as an agency-wide uh, stewardship um, applicability and compliance. Uh, they wanted the staff roles to be defined. Um, how do we continue to bring more underrepresented voices uh, to the table for the park board decisions that should and could involve community input? Um, at what point uh, do we not rely on community engagement to inform the decisions such as operational, um, safety, some technical kinds of uh, decisions? Um, the community engagement plan creating flexible templates and using the racial equity toolkit as a procedure, which we did do and we're really excited about that. Uh, some of the tools, resources for agency-wide staff to do and learn effective community engagement methods, um, providing some professional development and training around what that might look like because it's going to be an agency-wide, organization-wide uh, tool. And then dovetailing with um, other policies and plans. Um, informing plan and interpretation and translation policy, uh, just to name a few. Our partner agency and thought leader interviews, some of the key findings from that were dovetailing again with other um, local and regional agencies when possible. Um, consider developing a roster of cultural liaisons uh, that we can bring into for specific engagement efforts, very similar to what you might see in a hospital or in a school system where they have uh, cultural liaisons. Um, use, use of inform, consult, collaborate, partner, which is the grid for a starting point for all of the engagements that we see across the organization. Using existing committees in the city, um, county, community to engage, um, creating a publicly accessible policy. That was one of the other thought leader interviews. Um, disaggregating the data by race in engagement, uh, development, and evaluation. Um, as Carrie mentioned also, we had a community survey that we shared with our CAC members. And some of the key findings were, of course, um, more diversity on the CACs. Um, reporting back after the process. Um, continuing to use staff-led engagement processes. 75% of the respondents felt that the park board was hearing them some of the time to all of the time. There was a request for the park board to clearly communicate how the input will be used and what is being asked of. Um, there was some tensions around notifying neighbors within a three block radius with mailers in the electronic age and just how do we go beyond listserv outreach effectively and affordably. Maximizing online engagement was also something that was mentioned in the uh, community survey as feedback, a key finding. There were five goals that we followed and one of them was definitely the racial equity action plan, continually involving Minneapolis residents and park uh, users and processes that inform and shape park projects and initiatives. Um, reaching to underrepresented voices to ensure uh, park projects and initiatives are influenced by all Minneapolis residents and park users. Creating a policy that is relevant, useful, and applied across the agency. Creating sustainable, transparent, and effective standards for staff 
elected officials and stakeholders in the park board community engagement processes. So those were the five goals that we utilized. So um, and just in our in closing, we'll quickly run through what our proposed updates are and then um, open it up for questions and comments. So um, to begin with, one of the big kind of knots to untangle is thinking about the CAC, the Community Advisory Committee appointment process um, refinement. And in the latest draft, um, our suggestion is that commissioners each appoint a CAC rec representative for any CAC um, in, the, in, the, in any process. Um, and, and then the rest of the CAC would be appointed. Um, and so the majority would be appointed by commissioners um, and then the, the rest would be appointed by a combined committee of staff and community. Um, we also have really worked hard, and I think we have, we have more work to do, but I think we've come a long way with creating more agency-wide language. Um, there's been a lot of really good conversations around that question of what, uh, at what, what's the threshold for community engagement. So for example, when we have situations that deal with safety, operations, technical decisions, um, those are times when we need to rely on our, our expertise, our technical expertise, our safety expertise, our operations expertise. And in some cases, asking community for input at those times is actually not safe or uh, may result in a technical issue. And so being responsible both to ourselves and to our community um, about when are those moments that are appropriate to ask and, and to not ask for community input. Um, we, we, in the current update, uh, propose to keep the ownership of the policy with planning, um, however, work in collaboration with you know, departments and divisions across the agency on um, stewarding and technical advising and um, implementation of community engagement. We've also outlined some TAC and PAC refinements, so the Technical Advisory Committee. Um, here we've just clarified that it's more of a, it's truly an external um, agency or external partner group We're focusing on the, the project or the issue or the initiative. Um, the PAC would be an internal working group of park board staff. Um, we're also building off a, a long history, a deep history of community engagement at the Park Board, which we uh, celebrate and recognize in the policy. I mean, this is not the first time that we've had this conversation. This is something I think we can be proud of and say that over 100 years of, of community engagement has helped shape our parks um, and some really thoughtful structures and processes around that. Uh, we also propose um, refining the procedures like the community engagement plan. Um, and we'll be using our, the GARE uh, Racial Equity Toolkit to, to specifically use that as a framework for how we think about engaging community. Um, so for example, having more of a, a data-led, like, all right, who are our stakeholders in this community? What, you know, who lives in this community? Who are the, what are the cultural groups, racial groups, age groups? Um, and that we should be making sure we are reaching and how are we gonna be reaching those um, groups? And um, those, are, those are elements that we're really refining in the, the um, procedures, like the community engagement plan. Uh, we'll also be working on a community engagement toolkit um, to help train in staff, doing some great um, onboarding and rolling out of the policy um, in our implementation. We also are working on ways to better kind of um, do some ongoing evaluation of not only the policy, but also how we are doing community engagement. Are we really reaching um, the diversity of voices that we hope to reach and we, we are striving to reach? Um, and we have some, some you know, ideas on how to do that. Uh, also thinking through public notice refinement, um, how do we make sure we're looping back to community? That's something we heard a lot when projects are done or initiatives are done or policies are, are complete. Um, how do we, making sure that we are looping back and letting people know this is how your feedback informed and thank you. Um, and finally, just that continually prioritizing, reaching out to a diversity of stakeholders. And finally, we'll open it up for questions and thoughts and comments and thank you so much. <laughs> Commissioner Colgill. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair Forney. Um, Thank you for developing this. This is fantastic. I have a couple of questions. It's a, a really interesting field, and I certainly think that we can always improve on community engagement generally. Um, I uh, a couple of questions about the 
proposed uh, changes first on a given project, whichever it is, who's determining the level of engagement, um, what kind of engagement, if it's an informing type of engagement, or we're going to let the community develop or lead the process, who, who determines that? And is that stipulated at all in this plan? Yeah, currently that's in the procedures and we um, have, we're fleshing some of that out as we work on the actual form that people would use. But basically it's the staff lead, um, which would fall at a manager or um, director level. Mm -hmm. And um, it would do what we're calling an engagement assessment. Um, and looking at that the spectrum that you'll see in the policy and the, in the definitions. Um, looking at whether this is an inform, a consult, um, and so on and so on. So that assessment is, hope, we're hoping, is a, is a first step uh, before we move into community engagement plan, which will be a second step if it's not in the inform category. So the inform category is being determined more on a, uh, we're really, we're really trying to hone in for each division and department definitions around inform and clarity around what it looks like to inform. A lot of departments and divisions have have clarity around their processes there, so dovetailing with what's already out there. Um, so it'll be at that director, manager level that is filling out the engagement assessment. Okay. And using that spectrum to, to do so. Gotcha, but that, I mean, that's relatively discretionary, right? I mean, I'm gonna look at the, I just kind of choose. I mean, if I wanted to say, develop a, have community engagement around changing some aspect of a park feature, I could and choose to just inform people about that as opposed to engage them, or is that is are there fails there are, to there that? are there's questions and there'll be thresholds that, that will identify. be outlined. Okay. They, they'll have to identify a series of questions, prompting gotcha. them to explain and justify why they're selecting a specific category. Okay. And then the idea is that we're also figure we're kind of figuring out what how that's going to be publicly filed, and I our see. intention is to to make that community, that engagement assessment, um, okay. a publicly shared uh, piece of information so that people, you know, it, that, that is transparent. Those decisions are transparent to our public. And there's Great. also the hope that they would submit a proposal to someone so that we can kind of do an accountability check mm. and make sure that what they're proposing to is realistic mm -hmm. for the kind of work that they're needing to do. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, another question I have is uh, one of the first recommendations was around appointment structure for community advisory committees and uh, the, the number breakdown was not specified and I'm assuming that that's because certain CACs are maybe there are a different number of folks in, in certain CACs. Um, uh, but you mentioned that there was a majority of appointments coming from commissioners, uh, what kind of majority are we talking about? Um, is that stipulated or is that still something that needs to be refined? That. If you look at community on, on page 10, mm -hmm. uh, community advisory committee one, D, all CAC members must apply before being appointed. CAC shall be compromised of 17 members. Nine members will be appointed by commissioners. Eight will be appointed by selection committee. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, I suppose, I, I mean, I guess that makes sense since there are nine uh, commissioners. Um, you know, I, I understand one of the issues is like getting people who are thoughtful about whatever the CAC's stead is. Um, and utilizing the, the knowledge of staff in that process, I think that's important. I would say that my thought on that is that perhaps a few more of those um, eight would also be at the discretion of commissioners. Um, I suppose we're already, I, I guess, in, in ultimately voting on it here, but um, that would be my thought. And maybe they would just be coming from, as recommendations from staff. Um, but to me, um, I think that would give, since we are the elected body, a little bit more um, confidence in, um, in our ability to kind of shape um, and, and buy into whatever the recommendations of the CAC, CAC end up being. 
um, while still acknowledging that staff has really valuable um, connections and insight to people who would be good in serving the, in those roles. That's my thought there. Um, and then on the, the safety technical piece, could you um, describe for me what your thoughts are on when you're determining something is out of scope for engagement? Um, I guess my, I'd just like to say, I, I, I've seen it in projects in Planning Commission and, and a lot of other kinds of projects where technical expertise or even safety is used as a barrier to get a, or to get a kind of certain outcome. So for example, on the 11 of the river project, there was this specter of a safety issue because um, there was a need for access for um, the fire department. They even got the, uh, the fire chief for the city to write a letter <laughs> saying that they needed this and they didn't really have all the information that they, they needed and it wasn't actually the case. Um, so I would be concerned about the specter of safety or technical expertise sometimes usurping the um, really valuable perspectives that uh, community members might have. That's, thank you. That's, um, I think, a really, a really helpful example. Um, and encourage you to take a look at the language and see if there's ways that you think that it might okay. better capture what, what that nuance. I think, um, you know, I think a great example for us when we think about inform, you know, um, cutting down a tree. That would be a moment when we're not going to ask community if the tree is a hazard or an issue, we'll, but we will inform people that maybe the parking lot will be closed as the removal of that tree occurs. So that's, a, I think, a pretty typical example of what we're thinking about. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I suppose my one other example would be just regulations around um, street widths and uh, other things that are established by national organizations but really could use um, for some community push to make changes that I think would actually benefit the safety of everybody in our communities. Um, and I would just not, not want to see that. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I, I'm certain that's not the intent here, but I wouldn't want to see that be precluded by a policy that just said, well, whenever there's anything that's already established by federal regulations, we can't even have a conversation about, I don't know, yeah, painting a creative crosswalk because that's like federally not allowed. And we have that now right by um, right by Loring Park, so things like that I think would be important. You. Yeah. Finish. Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Um, Radius, you mentioned, or maybe it was, I forget which one of you was, but you mentioned a three block possible uh, policy where you mail everyone within three blocks. Is that in the plan? Because I know that was an issue that some people brought up with the East of the River plan, which will be presenting on next, where some people said that we should do that, but the concern there was that, you know, if, if we're only mailing the people immediately adjacent to a park, that could have a disproportionate class impact because the people who live right next to the parks are typically, well, typically wealthier and not necessarily the only people who are using the parks. So I don't know what the, the balance is there. Yeah, I think, um, so one of the patterns with, with the service area master plans and I think citywide initiatives is that it becomes cost prohibitive to mail three blocks mm -hmm. um, out from every park. Um, so that was, I think that was a constraint of budget constraint. Um, and then, you know, that's one consideration. And then also just with being in the electronic age, uh, the, the reality of mailers being really like our, one of our, our preferred tools for reaching, uh, and again, it's only that three block radius from parks um, is in question. And so, um, you know, we are, there is one, there is a, the possibility that, you know, we look at maybe that's no longer a requirement in, in the same way that we, you know, we, we haven't been able to fulfill that in certain instances because of budget. Um, so that's one of the, I think we're looking to the board for some guidance around that three block, three block radius. I think that's one of the kind of nuts we're still trying to crack. I don't know if Michael or Adam have anything to add on the three block dynamic. No. <laughs> I will ponder that for a while. But Please do. <laughs> Thank you. I also think it could be um, pretty helpful to have the commissioner appointments and then have some staff appointments that are oriented toward getting a broad group of people um, 
for example, with our pesticide advisory committee, you know, we all individually made our um, appointments, and the staff appointments were first before the commissioners mm -hmm. made theirs. Um, so that you know, may maybe if we had this in effect, then the staff could have done theirs afterward and corrected to that. But at least at the first meeting, you know, the, the committee is you know, has tons of really high qualified people with a diversity of experiences and, um, and backgrounds, mm -hmm. but they were all visibly white for us as far as I could tell. Uh, so I think this would be um, a good adjustment to make. One of the other things that we talked a lot about, or one of the key findings that we received was going to where the people are for the engagement and not just expecting the people to come to us for the engagement. That's all, thank you. That's it, President Bourne. Thank you, uh, Chair Forney. Um, I, I would, um, echo some of the comments I heard Commissioner uh, Cogill say, and I think Commissioner Meyer kind of discuss around, um, if there are uh, these community advisory committees in one form or another are extensions of the Board of Commissioners and represent the, represent the Board of Commissioners in, in the community. So I do, like the, I do like the practice that we've adopted the last couple of years of having some staff insight on uh, to, to help us look through another lens to make sure that those committees are balanced. Um, but I also like the process that we did on uh, the, last, uh, the last couple of recommendations where those are recommendations and they are brought to the board for affirmation because we then have to, we on some levels own their recommendations and their work that they're doing in the community on, on our behalf. And, Frankly, uh, staff have the luxury of of not having to do that. I mean, you you have a stake in it, obviously, but the um, I, I would like the board to at least affirm that yes, this is somebody we want representing the Minneapolis Park Board. Um, the I, I think I have some language suggestions, but I can work offline. I, I can work offline with that. Um, but I would really. I just really want to emphasize that uh, these committees do represent the Board of Commissioners on on one level or uh, on one level or another. Um, the and then I, I think to the point of um, engagement assessment, that might be something that the board would want to own as well. And if there's a staff recommendation of uh, level of engagement assessment, um, that could be something that the board could affirm through a vote, saying that yes, we agree as an elected body that this is the you know that this is and inform level of engagement. This is a collaborate level of engagement. Um, and those could be as simple as consent items. But again, it would be good to have a piece of ownership from the board. So if we have constituents that are coming back saying, why aren't you engaging the public in this? We have then owned in that decision and said, well, this is, this is why. Uh, and then that might actually avoid some things in the future that, that have happened over the years that I've been on the board where um, and I think different commissioners each time, depending on the specific CAC, are always frustrated with it, um, where we come back and say, well, let's add somebody to this seat, let's add somebody to this, let's make the CAC bigger. I do really like the idea of a standard, uh, a standard advisory committee size, um, but um, I think the more ownership the board can have in the creation of it, um, the less we will have to revisit um, on an individual basis. So those are my comments, and I'll work on the language pieces offline. So. No other lights. Oh, <laughs> Commissioner French. <clears throat> I just want to say thank you for the project that you guys worked on. This has been something that's very important to me, uh, how we engage the community, how we, how we get feedback from the community. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for the project that you guys took on. It's a various, very tedious charge, so thank you. Seeing how the lights, I will put in my two cents. I'm hearing um, a, a lot of commonality in the comments are here about um, our appointments as commissioners. And one of the things that has always been challenging to me is who I choose. Um, it's not just a political patronage thing. It's not, you know, whatever. I had to, to juggle, you know, like, okay, what type of expertise are we looking for and everything. And I don't know if there's a, I don't know, recommendations that, you know, we can be looking for. Um, I mean, there's so many obvious things, but at the same time, they may not be obvious. 
Um, the other thing that, to me, um, I always find interesting is who I appoint, what do I, what is my relationship with them as far as encouraging them to represent me, represent them, rep represent, you know, it, anyway, it's, it seems, the, it, it, there isn't clarity there, is how we describe to our appointee, this is what your role is, um, and also what is the role of the commissioner in relationship to that appointee. Um, you know, what, how much follow-up, you know, is there any follow-up, um, things like that. At the same time, um, I view that am I there, though, to influence my appointee, um, or is my, you know, appointee influencing me? You know, those are things, dynamics, that I think that are, um, at least to the five years that I've been making appointments, have been varied, and, and, and I'm not sure if I'm doing, quote, unquote, right or wrong. And, and, and I don't know how, how we would analyze that, but I just feel that that's something that would be helpful for all of us. Um, there is a section in the procedures that outlines commissioner roles, and I would encourage all of you to take a close look at that and see if there's anything that you would add or, or suggest edits to that. I think that, and well, maybe we can do it on, we know definitely when we do a public hearing, we'll do more of an in-depth kind of here's what we've landed on. Um, but. I think having more onboarding conversations about all of our different roles is going to be really important. Yes, truly, you know, and like I say, I don't want to taint the process, and so having real clarity on, on both, you know, parties, I think is very important. Um, I was talking with Larry Humphrey about his revolutionary sports project that came before us, and um, how we can possibly do some measurables in his program or that program and he indicated that the, he does a, sur or a survey is done I don't know if it's halfway through or at the end of the season and everything and I don't know how many surveys that we do throughout the system and if there's some sort of component that we can I don't want to say automatically add but add something you know are we meeting some objectives or not um, and is there community? Anyway, I just feel that that's an opportunity for us to continue our community um, engagement is through whatever already existing, you know, um, evaluations, I think is what he called it. Anyway, um, is somehow to incorporate that um, throughout the system um, would be very helpful. Um, anything else I had? I guess that's it. There's no other comments. Um, oh, it's not a, we don't need passage to it. So anyway, um, thank you very much for really fine effort. I appreciate it and um, look forward to next steps. So, thank you. And so moving on to our next study item, curious you again, <laughs> the presentation of the draft east of the River uh, Park Master Plan. Chair Forney, Commissioners, thank you. I'm um, excited to be here tonight to share the story of the East of the River Park Master Plan, and um, it uh, is here, a 280-page document, and it's open for public comment right now. Uh, there's a copy at the front desk. There are copies at all of the rec centers. I um, encourage you to check it out online or in, in person. Um, it's an exciting point in the project. Um, so tonight I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the approval process and then run through the, some of the highlights of the master plan and open it up for questions and comments. So the um, CAC had been meeting for about a year exactly um, and on the October 2nd uh, passed a recommendation um, on the plan to open it up for public comment. All 33 of the existing parks along with two potential new parks for east of the river. Um, all neighborhood parks in the northeast and southeast service area. So on November 14th, the public comment period opened. Um, uh, I'm presenting here tonight to the board. And um, on December 28th, the public comment period will close. In January, the staff will tabulate um, comments. 
And in January or February, uh, we'll make modifications of the draft and come back and have a public hearing um, with you uh, and um, present the public comment tabulation and plan changes along with um, any amendments to the draft for, for board approval. Um, and then we'll have a final a full adoption um, at the full board. Um, sometime we hope for February or March of 2019. I'm putting that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, the outline for the East of the River Park Master Plan mirrors that of all the other service area master plans. So we've got an introduction, a uh, planning framework, a planning process chapter, a service area vision, the neighborhood park plans themselves, an operations and maintenance chapter, and finally an implementation chapter. I think it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful to be able to build off of the, the ma all the great master planning work that's happened. Um, and I think for each of the processes, we continue to find ways to, to create like a unique plan for that particular service area or to innovate on a process. And um, each of the master plans is really continuing to evolve. Our, we've got this down now, now that we're wrapping up our <laughs> service area master plans. Um, so we, you know, it was an 18-month process um, of planning and design and a lot of community engagement, um, close to 100 engagement events including the CAC meetings, uh, design sessions. So we, we didn't have a summer of engagement because we were doing the heart of our community engagement um, in the winter. And so we had a lot of like in-depth design conversations. Um, I think there was 18 altogether, sort of hour long uh, with maps and plans and drawing with community groups across the city or across the service area. Um, we also had a work group about the, the regional trails and especially the Grand Rounds Missing Link that met several times. Um, we attended park events, community events, different stakeholder meetings. Um, we had a, a rockin' youth design team that I will tell you more about um, in a little bit um, that was along for the entire process. It was a paid position. Um, they worked five hours a week for the entire year on the process um, and took part in everything from um, from you know, looking at data to community, they actually helped with community engagement initiatives. They made design recommendations. Um, they even, you know, when we needed to bring more voices to the table, they were out there door knocking. They attended all of our CACs and were really active participants. Brought youth voice into the community advisory committee process, which was was really great. Um, so I can't commend them enough. And um, they, many of them, have left for college and so won't be here tonight. <laughs> Um, we also, uh, just as another thing on our what we did with our community engagement, was had a number of um, open houses and in-houses during the design week. Um, during the summer, when we had our draft concepts out, we did some creative community gatherings, like a barbecue in a park. Um, we had a pop-up plan van out in, like, actually just showing up to a park and bringing the concepts out into the park to get feedback. Um, we also did some door knocking, as I mentioned, and finally, um, online engagement. So using our website, using SurveyMonkey, all of our tools that are, are well-hewn um, paths for engagement. So um, I think you're familiar with generally what the, the scope is of these service area master plans, but they're, you know, they're, they're park drawings and designs and operations and budgetary visions for each of these uh, neighborhood parks. And uh, again, the service area that we're focused on is everything east of the Mississippi River, um, including the Grand Rounds Missing Link. So everything east of the Mississippi River that is a neighborhood park, um, but with the one exception, a regional trail uh, that we hope to, to implement um, in coming years. And that has been an over 100 year um, kind of challenge that um, has been master planned several times and we're in some ways updating the master plan that was done in, in 2009 but um, it's a it's a really important part of this and there's a chapter in this the regional tail, tra trail chapter that will eventually be pulled out and taken to Met Council after your approval um, and submitted for for their approval so we can then be eligible hopefully for regional trail funding um, so the East of the River Master Plan will guide capital investment operations maintenance for the next 20 to 30 years. So these are long-term plans. This is, um, these are going to be implemented incrementally. I think you are all very familiar with that. But um, 
this is something, it's an ambitious vision for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, and we're, we're very excited about these roadmaps. Here's the service area. All of the green highlights the, the neighborhood, the bright green highlights the neighborhood parks in the service area. The dark green is the regional parks that were out of scope for this master plan. Um, and then the dotted aqua line is um, the sort of, the Grand Rounds Missing Link corridor. So this may look familiar, this process. We um, you know, engaged with our CAC early on. We uh, brought in the youth design team. We did what we call vision and engagement. So I, always, I like to think about these service area master plans um, as a four-legged stool. So we're looking at policies and current policies that the park board has. We look at our activity plans. Um, we look at innovations around the world, around park use. We look at um, what the community wants in their parks. Um, and then we also look at the data, everything from tree canopy to demographics to projected population growth. Um, and out of that, you know, we come up with a, a park design. We put it back out there for community feedback. Um, and then all along the way, the community advisory committee is a really important sounding board. They are giving it, you know, in, input at every stage um, and also helping connect the plan out to their community. So their, their role, I think of them really as the backbone of engagement, but, but definitely one part of the engagement of the process. We also had a great PAC. So our internal working group of park board staff from across different divisions and departments. Um, we had a TAC, so external agency partners that um, we met with in some cases as a group, but for the most part kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, as we needed to work through technical issues with things, especially like the Grand Rounds Missing Link, the University of Minnesota, the city of Minneapolis, Hennepin County have been really important um, thinking partners around how do we, how do we make this thing happen. Uh, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization has been a great partner. Uh, we've worked with them on, on a few of the park concepts in terms of stormwater. So uh, they were another technical advisor. So similar to the other service area master plans, we um, devised not only a park plan, so a drawing you know, of each of the parks and the, the future of that park, um, but also established a set of area-wide guiding principles um, and strategies. So of the values and then the how are we gonna get this done. So um, we you know, had different groupings, values and design and planning and facilities. And they were, that's a CAC approved part of the plan. So I think that's a, has a lot of gravity in my mind, that, that particular chapter. So if you do take a look at this plan, I just encourage you to spend some time with those guiding principles and strategies. Those, you know, those are also will inform when the design happens, the implementation happens of the service area. Uh, those will also be used by the project manager to, as a roadmap for how sort of the process and the philosophy and the values behind um, how to implement. So some of the examples of the, the guiding principles and strategies, um, for example, a guiding principle of responsiveness, which was to anticipate and thoughtfully respond to the diverse needs of the city's communities, continually seeking to improve park and recreation services. Emphasis, and then sort of a strategy within that would be, emphasis will be placed on researching community needs and demographics when considering program and facility delivery. Ongoing robust and equitable community engagement is an ongoing need in park design, maintenance, and programming. Um, we also had wellness as a guiding principle uh, so to establish parks and park features that provide opportunities to improve physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Also to work to improve any past pollution of air, soils, and water in northeast and southeast Minneapolis. It is, you know, it is an actively industrial part of, of the city, which is really great for our jobs. And, um, but it also means that it is one of the areas of town that has a park, some park gaps, so it's not... Um, as well served in terms of that 10 minute walk to parks. Not everyone in Northeast and Southeast um, has that. And so I think part of, part of the intention too with these is to think about um, how do we fill those gaps and how do we bring, how do we have Parkland actually play a role in, in integrating with industry but also healing uh, potential contamination issues. So I think there's, there's a lot of kind of different ways we can think about the inner, like laying over Parkland within industry. Um, Another guiding principle is the idea of it being the parks being multi-generational. 
um, considering all ranges in the age ranges and the design and development of the parks, um, with particular focus on youth voice, design for seniors, um, thinking about each of the neighborhoods and its and how unique the context is. I think, for example, you know, neighborhood parks near the university, Minnesota. That's you know, if we have a 90% rental community of students around a park, having a giant playground on that park may not be the best use of that park. Would be an example. Uh, another guiding principle is this idea of integrating arts and culture. Uh, Northeast is a really fabulous arts district. How, does, how can our parks amplify that um, and uh, improve connections? So I've mentioned the Grand Rounds Missing Link is a huge infrastructural, you know, in, in, in terms of improved connections, but even in the smaller ways, I think wayfinding to our parks and within our parks is something we heard consistently um, throughout the process. Environmental stewardship um, is another one, and I think this is the last one. Um, but you know, the, we don't have lakes in northeast and southeast Minneapolis, but we do have you know proximity to the river and a really great parkway system. So thinking about those as ecological corridors and connections to the flyway um, and the ecology of the river is a really important part of of the way that people are thinking about their parks and the connectivity um, in northeast and southeast, and also what shows up in the data. So some of the big highlights, now I'm moving on to just a few of the highlights of the, the um, area, service area-wide amenity changes. Um, similar to other, other service areas, the idea of refrigerated ice is something people are very interested in for season extension and more consistent uh, playability for winter sports. So the idea of having um, a, a rink at Columbia and potentially a trail at Van Cleve uh, with summer uses also like roller derby at Columbia. Um, All-wheel parks and skate spots of various scales at Luxton, Excel, and Botno. A universal design playground at Audubon. The Grand Rounds Missing Link. Um, trail additions in most parks to create loops similar to other service areas. Um, and urban agriculture sites in a couple of parks, including a commercial kitchen at Dickman. <laughs> Here's some examples of, of some of the ideas put forth in the master plan. Um, also acting as definitions. So if you're reading any of the chapters and you're like, what does that mean? What does multi-generational play look like? Here's some examples and definitions. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Perkins and Will. Raise your hand. You're still there. This has uh, <laughs> been, it's been an honor to work with this, uh, with Perkins and Will on this plan. And um, thanks, thanks to your team for being here tonight. Uh, winter facility examples, gathering facility examples. <coughs> here's, um, so here's an example of one of the like park packets, we call them. Um, and this is what, you know, if, if I was a project manager, Dickman gets a CIP allocation. I'm going to pull this chapter and I'm going to use this as my roadmap. It's the idea for um, implementing. Um, so we've got, you know, the history of the park, the existing conditions and character of the park, and then a little bit of narrative about the proposed design. An aerial showing the existing conditions, um, and then finally a proposed plan for the future of that park that will be implemented over the next 20 plus years. Um, similar to the other service area master plans, we've got the engagement matrix, kind of a summary of, of uh, what we've heard at all the different stages of engagement to be clear and transparent, and then cost estimates and operations estimates. Um, so estimated annual increase uh, with the O&M. This is similar to other master plans. Um, and um, similar to other master plans also, uh, the idea I, already, I mentioned, you know, project manager pulls this chapter, um, they'll live digitally, the master tracking form will say, okay, we're, we're actually gonna do this, we're doing, we've completed this playground at Audubon check. So we're tracking as we go what we've accomplished in the master plan. Um, and then as needed, we'll also have the opportunity to amend the plan. And there's guidance in the master plan around how to do that as well. Um, so cost estimates. You know, with our MPB 20 funding, there's park dedication fees in different neighborhoods. Um, and East of the River came out um, pretty close to, to the north anticipated costs per acre. 
which was just presented. So I think it's great to see some alignment um, and still kind of this combined uh, per acre cost of the, of, the, um, of the different service areas and knowing, again, it's still hovering around that 70% of improvements um, system-wide. MPP 20 would be funding, so it's, as Adam says, um, aspirational but not unrealistically so. <laughs> Okay, and finally, the public comment period. Just a reminder, it runs, it's open till December 28th. You can find the, um, you know, the plans and then the, and the survey at this URL or at the minneapolisparks.org slash east of the river. Um, again, I'll be taking, staff will be taking the comments, tabulating them, including the comments I hear tonight, including the comments I hear from our technical advisory committee review. Um, and we'll hold it the next time I see you will be for a public hearing. Oh, and my final closing statement, I just again, a thank you to everyone that was involved in the project, including the Community Advisory Committee, um, but a special shout out to the youth design team. They've, they've prepared a little video. Oh, nice. I'm going to show just a segment of it. There should be a youth design team in the future because it's really important to get youth perspective, especially on things like parks. The youth design team means giving opportunity for new voices to be heard in the parks. It was great to hear different diverse opinions and all different types of viewpoints. There are certain things that we never thought people used in the park, and it turns out they were really valued in the community, and it was interesting and important, I think, to hear that in the process of forming designs that will be used by the people. I'm having the chance to work behind the scenes and actually getting to look in detail at everything that happens um, with the planning process. I think it's important in this process to have youth input at the forefront of the planning process. Like I feel like it's su a super valuable thing to like work with a large institution like the park board that you know is a quasi governmental institution because I think a lot of the times people assume like oh well why can't this just be this one and you really realize like when you're working on the process that like there's all these steps that you have to go through and I think that's a really good and educational thing to have as a young person because you so um, and I'm just gonna skip ahead to their this video we'll have online at some point it's still a work in progress but uh, just to end my presentation with some of their recommendations. Recommendations that I have for the parks would be to support small businesses in parks as vendors, um, create more youth jobs that are meaningful, and engage them in decision making. Support for local and emerging artists. Just more of a diverse, like, age, schools. gender, race, schools. We should always honor and respect the indigenous community. So respect the land if, um, that belongs to the people before us. You know, if it's something sacred or indigenous, we should not mess with it because it's not ours to mess with. Um, Renting hammocks, teens would be really into that. We should host more cross-cultural festivals and cultural exchange events at parks with organization, and we should do cultural cooking classes. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Carrie. Questions and comments. Yes, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Well, this has been a big part of my life uh, for the last year. Uh, the plan is 280 pages of quality reading that I encourage you all to go through over on Christmas break. <laughs> um, I've already submitted, I don't know, probably more than 100 comments. I hope you're able to read all of that. <laughs> I, I won't go through. I haven't been able to talk to you since I sent those to you, but, um, but yeah, this is a, a, a pretty big deal, and I've heard from so many people from all across the area about what a great job you've done in the engagement process, um, so it really is on the model of what we need to be doing for our plans. Um, you know, we have a great data-driven uh, policy, and um, some of the additional highlights, um, you know, you mentioned some of the big ones, and I heard Council Rice mention uh, Lake Sandy, which is in the plan to be restored. Um, the, I'm, I'm really excited about the Universal Design um, Park at Audubon. I, we have one in the park system right now at Minneapolis Falls that's accessible to people with disabilities, and it's a great one to have. 90%. Um, the analysis found that we had probably more uh, baseball diamonds than we need, so some of them come out. 
Um, we get more basketball courts, um, more dog parks, more uh, pollinator friendly areas, more urban agriculture, uh, more orchards, you know. Um, and we have the plan for the Grand Round, which I'm extremely excited about. There was a great article in MinPost profiling that. And I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing our park system completed. So thank you for all your work on this. Anybody else? Thank you. Really um, awesome presentation. Um, I want to put a shout out. Uh, Cordelia, right? Pearson was um, yeah, the, the to chair. Cordelia Pearson was our chair. Yes. Fabulous. And I, great. I, I hope that she'll attend one of our meetings and everything. But um, it just I, I did attend a few meetings and I thought, she did a marvelous job, and so did you. Um, I love the fact that you use the um, the youth design team. I'm not sure if we've used it, you know, in any other um, service area, but I, that to me was wonderful that you engaged that. And I love the fact that you refer to our partners as thinking partners, <laughs> um, and the addition of the the guiding principles. Very powerful. I thought that was um, exceptional. And yeah, there are a lot of Park caps, and uh, hopefully we've got a, a CPRO up there, and you know a few of those types of things to help fill in so many of these connections that are needed. So, um, thank you, Carrie. Um, really, I'm pleased. And uh, we have one more um, uh, presentation. Chair Forney, Commissioners, um, the, the Planning com, uh, Division a couple of weeks ago went on a retreat and we talked too long about other things, but we had intended to get to, uh, for ourselves, the highlights of what we were, uh, what we had accomplished in 2018. And mentioning that to Chair Forney, she asked if we could actually, if we could present that. Um, I'll note that we didn't have a lot of time to put this together. Um, but we did put together, and if I can find it, um, like the presentation from Mr. Fisher earlier, um, we have pictures but uh, no words, and um, <laughs> apparently this is supposed to go by itself. So um, once I hit enter, it's it's supposed to advance like every four seconds. Ooh, Yahoo.
Wahoo. <laughs> hey. <laughs> totally awesome. Any comments anybody wants to make? Bob? Are you all speechless after that? <laughs> Meg. Oh, sorry. It's Commissioner Music. Thank you, Meg. Well, I'm not on this committee. Planning is one of my favorite things that we do as park commissioners. So I would just like to say thank you for making this yet one more awesome year of park planning. Uh, it's been fabulous to work with you all, and I'm super impressed with how much we've gotten done. I hope 2019 is at least as good, if not better. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, one of the reasons why I did ask um, for um, planning to, to look at this is um, past couple of meetings have been People refer to it as divisive. And um, I decided to look back at the, all the um, planning committee meetings. And what I realized is that every item, we've been 100% unanimous in support. I think that speaks very highly of, yes, us. But most importantly is on this phenomenal staff that has vetted all of these issues so well beforehand and you know dug deep um, as we saw with the the service area master plan um, I, I'm just in awe constantly and I, I just want us all to remember that you know we were a hundred percent unanimous in all of our planning um, committees um, decisions so to me I think that is a, a real compliment to us all that we are far more collaborative than I think that we give ourselves credit for and um, I think it's an important thing to note um, I like Commissioner Musich this is my favorite committee and the biggest reason why is that it touches every single aspect of our park system and um, personally and professionally, I've been involved with this. You know, <laughs> um, I hate to admit that I was the youth director um, at the YWCA. I realize before any of the commissioners on this board were even born. <laughs> so I've been advocating and working on these um, types of things for a long time and of course um, you know that professionally I'm a real estate agent and 
um, as my mother re refers to it, terra firma. There is nothing like it, and that is what we advocate for and um, work so hard for. So I, I just really want to compliment everybody, and particularly our staff, and the fine, fine work that they've done in 2018. So thank you all. And with that, I will ask for a motion to um, adjourn. All those, okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Okay, it is 1020, and I would like to call to order. <laughs> out, out, I'm calling to order operations and environmental committee. I'd like, to, Ms. Secretary, can you do the roll? Commissioner Cogill. Commissioner Severson. Absent. Commissioner Musich. Present. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Here. Uh, Chair French. Here. You have a quorum. I, I'd approve a motion to approve the agenda. i look for a second. No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Staying? Okay, I like. I would approve, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes from Wednesday, November 28th, 2018. Uh, any second? No second. Yeah, all opposed? No? Any yeses? Yes. Yes. Aye. <laughs> all right, okay. So we have an action item, uh, study report, no action item, study report item on the Minnehaha Falls Winter Operations and Lisa Beck, I believe, is going to do our presentation. And joined by uh, this is uh, this is the first time Matt has been in front of the board member. Uh, he is the park operations manager for the regional park system, uh, the areas that run from Worth down to the Falls. And um, as you see as the title, we're here to talk briefly about Minnehaha Falls. Um, if we knew it was going to be 40 degrees and the water was running <laughs> fine, we probably would have delayed this. But, you know, uh, if you'll bear with us. Um, as you can probably guess with all of you are involved in social media now, um, the falls is quite the attraction in the wintertime. And Matt is pulling up just a quick reminder of uh, uh, an accident that occurred there. Um, and we've had some group uh, team meetings across departmental lines. And um, it, there's more and more people going behind the falls and down in that area. And I've just asked Matt to come and talk to you a little bit about what goes on there. Because we'd like to, as a group, we've decided to kind of upgrade the signage and try to heighten some of the safety issues that we have. And so with that, um, we may be giving up on the video. Oh. All right. Okay. Go ahead and uh, we're going to show uh, the brief video just because visually it is one of the most alarming things I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind everybody um, why we do what we do. Years and now someone has gotten hurt after trespassing at Minnehaha Falls. <laughs> In the wintertime, the frozen falls are an attraction for people who like to take photographs and explore. But on Sunday, a big section of ice fell. Oh, oh my God. <gasps> Well, a WCCO viewer just happened to be recording video as that collapse happened. So while you're pulling up your stuff, fun fact, there's actually a drawing from like the 1900s or late 1800s of someone having icicles falling on their head, like the same exact situation that was a, a plea then of us to please... Please don't go back there. Please don't go under it. It's super dangerous and you can be hurt. So this is, this is not a new problem. <laughs> All right, Chair French and committee members, um, I'll be briefing you on uh, the actions that we're taking to help prevent some of these um, incidents. Um, so we do have an increase in some of these safety issues um, in the Miha Falls area. Um, a lot of it, we believe, is um, exacerbated by people posting personal photos of themselves behind the falls on social media. Um, this behavior does um, not just put, uh, put park visitors at risk, but it also places a burden on um, park safety personnel and also um, maintenance personnel who have to go down there and either try to get people away from the area or clean up after people when they're in the area. Um, so earlier this month, we pulled a working group together 
um, that was comprised of people from uh, communications, customer service, planning, uh, police, and maintenance. And we had three objectives. One was to uh, find ways to better um, secure closed points um, that lead to the area, and then also to add specific um, signage that will help be to better inform people um, of the hazards in the area, and then also that the stairs are closed. Um, and then finally, to um, reach news outlets and uh, social media channels to further inform people of uh, the hazards. Um, part of uh, sealing off closed points is to install fencing. Um, we've purchased uh, panels like the ones that are uh, in the photo here. They're six feet tall, and the panels are each five feet wide. Um, we'd use them in strategic places, and I've got a picture that'll show you where those are. Um, the signs that we would attach to those, um, for the access points to the frozen areas, we'd attach a sign like this um, that shows the specific hazards. And then for the stairs, a sign that says closed for winter. Um, this is consistent in terms of color with the signs that we have um, throughout the park system with the orange and black but usually those stay, just state uh, steps closed. Um, here we want to just be a little bit more specific about the winter hazards and so saying closed for winter. Um, also, um, at the uh, at stairs, typically we also just have the, a chain with a sign attached to that that's easy to cross over. So that's why we want to have the fence there as well. This uh, picture depicts where we would put the uh, fences and the signs. Um, the falls in this picture are uh, depicted on the left-hand side with the water drop, and then you can see the basin. Um, so there's really six points where we'd like to put up the fencing, and then um, you can see here where we put the specific signage. Um, to help further communicate, um, access to the gorge. We're also working on signage that'll help to uh, safely direct people to access points um, so they can, they can get to the gorge area uh, safely. And to get there, you'd have to go um, through the plowed road that comes off of um, Wabin, so up by the picnic area. There's a way to get down there um, without having to go on steps. Um, and then on top of that, um, communications team will be reaching out to news outlets to um, remind them to, you know, not unwittingly um, glamorize going behind the falls by showing images that uh, viewers might send to them to say, you know, here I was behind the falls and um, kind of kind of keep that out of there. That is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and then um, just we'll also um, maintain our practice of not having maintenance folks go down there, except to really um, maintain fence or signage. Uh, we want to keep them um, away from, from the risk as well. I think that concludes my part of the brief. Chief Otto. Chair French, commissioners, as I'm sure you can appreciate, um, this is an extremely challenging site to try to regulate access to. We, we want it to be in one of our natural sites and not overbuild or overcontrol it. But one of the challenges that we've had is that people, um, in spite of, of the risk to their own safety, uh, have gone to areas um, behind the falls and at the basin of the falls. Um, and by going there, they not only jeopardize their personal safety, um, they jeopardize the safety of staff and emergency services. So uh, in the past, we have not done a very good job of securing the access points. And um, what Matt just talked to you about was um, really putting a concerted effort forth and doing a better job of securing those access points and putting signage up. Um, one of the tactics that we have used, especially the past couple of winters, has to do, had, had to do with enforcement of um, trespassing notices at some of those uh, not very well secured access points around the falls. Um, last season, we wrote 76 citations for trespassing. Uh, what we are proposing this year is that by uh, putting up better signage, doing a better job of putting up the access or the, the uh, fencing to restrict access at those major points. Um, 
is that we would not be doing that level of enforcement this year. Um, I think that, that what we have done in the past has pitted park patrons against our park patrol agents and some of our police officers, uh, and it hasn't been a very enjoyable experience, frankly, for, for either one of those groups. So I think um, we are not interested in, in having officers go behind the falls or, or at the basin of the falls. Uh, it's just, frankly, too dangerous. Uh, what we want to do is make sure that um, we have physical barriers and signage that conveys the risk, um, the safety risk to park patrons. Uh, but beyond that, we're going to take more of a hands-off approach uh, with enforcement. Uh, emergency services obviously will respond to emergency situations and rescues uh, if an accident were to take place, like the video that you saw to start this presentation. Um, just know that that those rescues are extremely challenging for emergency services, and it's not something that can be resolved in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, it's something, a technical rescue uh, on an ice over falls uh, in the middle of January um, would take an extensive amount of time. So I think with that, um, the panel is uh, here to stand for questions. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Chief Ahoto. Uh, are there any questions? I see one, Commissioner Musich. Uh, thank you, Chair French. Commissioner Vito, did you have your light on before me? No. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know where we're at with the ambassador program, but I think it would be incredibly helpful if, at least on weekends when it's really busy, we had um, a park staff presence at the top of the falls just informing folks about why it is we don't let people do this and the dangers to themselves and, and so forth. I know we can't prevent everyone from doing this, but um, I know in the past we've had officers there. I don't know if that's necessarily the, the nece if it's necessary to have police officers, if there are other trained staff available. You look ready to answer my questions, so I'll stop talking. Um, Chair French, Commissioner, Commissioner Musich, uh, we will continue to have a park patrol agent assigned to, to many hot balls, and, and they will continue to try to steer people uh, away from the restricted areas. So that won't change. And I think that we all would like to see um, some form of a park ambassador at, at Minnehaha Park um, to assist uh, park patrons in a regional park that, that really isn't supported with much staff. Okay, fantastic. Um, I was also wondering about um, adding some thin ice warnings near the deer pen area uh, towards the I think it's the first or second bridge down. Um, last year I just saw a ton of people playing on the ice there, including people with small children. And I know how silly it is to go over water that's over on ice that's over running water, but I don't know that everyone does. So would, is that something that would be possible? Chair French and Commissioner, Commissioner Mucic, that's something we can do. Okay. Yeah, we'll take Phenomenal. Care of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then my last question, um, we ticketed people for trespassing that were using the stairs last spring after the ice had melted off like almost entirely <laughs> and um, we just hadn't had time to get out and remove the chains yet and I'm wondering what we can do to be a bit more proactive about you know, taking down that signage when things are passable so that we aren't ticketing people for using something that there's really no reason for them to not to be using. Yes, uh, Chair French and Commissioner Commissioner Music, uh, right? I think um, we uh, we don't help ourselves when we delay the removal of the signage. Um, so that's something that we'll pay uh, close attention to, so that we get that moved on time um, and just at the right time. And I think this uh, fencing is actually pretty easy to move, so we can get that moved and um, uh, put away pretty quickly. Okay. And do we intend to at some point put some sort of locking mechanism in place to keep these intact on the, on the site? Because I have a feeling that people are just going to move them if they're not fixed Yes, so they way. will be um, locked into place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Commissioner Musage. Uh, Commissioner Vito. Thank you, Commissioner French. Um, I just wanted to say thanks for working on this. I've seen people doing this before, and it was like so scary when you when you see somebody like actually down there. It's really it's 
very scary. So I appreciate the work that's being done on um, preventing this from happening in the future. Um, also, Matt, are you the person that was here at 4 o'clock when I came in earlier practicing? Were you in here? Like, yes, I was here at 4 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> for, <laughs> I came thank in you. earlier and there was someone here practicing, like getting ready for their presentation. So thank you so much for bearing with us. It's a little late. You did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Vita, uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you, uh, Chair French. Um, security cameras, have we used those anywhere? And with, are something like that effective? I, I, whatever, I just. Um, Chair French, Commissioner Forney, we, we do use security cameras. Uh, we have three mobile cameras that we use frequently for special event security. Um, but I don't see that as an effective prevention measure in this case. So I think um, from especially, you know, we can reference back to the video, uh, people are not particularly shy about this activity. In fact, their aim is to get a picture and to post okay. it on social media. Um, and then the other component to this is um, we, if we were to have surveillance video, what is it that, that we would do with it? Right, is it just to monitor what's going on or is there some nexus to enforcement? And I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to get away from having to do uh, the strict law enforcement um, by using a different means of, of um, preventing or at least warning and advising people who are going into this area what the potential risks are. Thank you, and it really was clarification of why, when, why do we some places use you know, security cameras. And good clarification. I appreciate it. And appreciate the work. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I have my little two cents that I want to stick in. Uh, do we, have we ever tried like some type of social media campaign and talk about how dangerous yeah. this actually is? Like, you know, I people who, who say, you know, there's all type of anti-smoking videos and all other stuff that can include in dangerous behaviors. There's someone we can either start some social media campaign about idiotic and stupid this is and people get hurt, you know, and, and, and just try to just send that and share that with all your friends and make this to be a very unpopular thing to do. So, Chair French, um, the short <laughs> answer is, is yes. Part, the news story that you saw, if we had continued to play that, would have interviewed um, MPRB staff. And each year over the last at least three years, um, we have we have worked really hard with local media to make sure that we're getting the message out about how dangerous this is, um, and it frankly hasn't been very effective. Is there something that we can do so we're not relying on local media? Is something that we can do? Is there some type of pamphlets, brochures that we that already go out that we can just add? Please be safe on the ice. Please be safe around the falls because you can get hurt. I'll ask Don Summers to answer that question. Resend whatever Don sends you. Well, one of, I mean, we can certainly get messaging out tomorrow to commissioners, the same thing we've been sending out to media and, and the public. Uh, Robin Smothers manages our, our park board website. Um, we, one of the challenges of being, doing things, I, I like your social media plea, the, the problem gets to be is it becomes an attractive yeah. nuisance. It, it actually draws more people to do these kind of crazy things that we're really trying not to have them do. The media have been very responsive. We, we, have, we had more problems in the past with, you know, even Star Tribune photographers showing these on their, their favorite sites. And we, yeah, we have and written some pretty uh, not, cool. not so nice emails <laughs> to them. So they're real, really well, well aware of it. And that, to Jason's point, uh, if they would have showed some of these clips, they've been down there. They've seen the agents, and if the, you know if the agent steps away, they they clamber down. They've done some really ridiculous things to get down to the falls. I remember the year of the rope. Do you remember the year of the oh, rope? I mean, just the maintenance so staff bad. will cut it down and appear the next day. I mean, a knotted rope going down the side. It's it's just in, it's insane that the length people have gone to. I, I, so, uh, Council Councilor Rice, this question I guess is for you. Are we are we covered by recreational immunity when stuff like this happens, or? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, my partner in Walter works on it. We basically, I think the staff's doing the right thing. You've got to stop people. It's a dangerous hazard. Um, um, 
but if people walk out on ice in the middle of winter on a day like today, it's like they're they're taking risks that they shouldn't be taking, and if they go through the ice, it's it's tragic. Uh, we should try to stop them, but at some point we can't. Uh, but also, also putting the life of the rescuers at risk. We, if, if, <laughs> I mean, the point would be, I mean, when, you know, former Commissioner Greenland wanted to warn people about everything, about this, <laughs> the the, the, uh, the bluffs and how dangerous it is. If if we went down that road or going down a sliding hill and running into a tree, and we could spend a lot of money just putting up those red signs everywhere in the park system. Um, Okay. I had a I had an aunt one time. He like no, I, no, I won't say that. I'll get in trouble. And I, I, I do apologize for my comment about the Worth House, so I'll keep my word. <laughs> Your comment in the paper? Yeah. <laughs> so I, and I guess the last question I got, uh, you're hilarious. Uh, last question I have is, you guys do have these uh, temporary cameras. Have you ever tried to put them there just as a deterrent to see what happens? Like it maybe, maybe the it won't stop everybody, but it may stop the. Well, I don't want to be on camera doing it. Um, Chair French, the, these mobile mask cameras are actually on a on a trailer, yeah. so we can only get them to places where we can drive them. Um, okay. So we have put them sort of in that viewing area adjacent to the pavilion, okay. which looks out over the falls, um, with with little deterrent success. Any other questions? I want to thank you for the effort that you guys are doing to keep people safe. Uh, it's a very tedious effort. You got to deal with young kids, teenagers. I've worked with teenagers forever. As soon as you tell them to do, not to do something, it's like telling them to do something. So, <laughs> so I, I appreciate you guys' uh, toughness and keep doing what we got to do to keep everybody safe. Thank, Thank you, you sure. Chair French. This is a change in what we've been doing in the past, and uh, we just wanted to make sure that the board um, was aware of where we were going and, and to make sure that uh, we had your support and endorsement. Absolutely. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks. I got it. Okay. Uh, I think that is it. I would move for an adjournment. So moved. Uh, all in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. All, all against? Stay? No? Okay, let's go. Time being only 10.42. You try, Chris. The night is still young. No. And I will call to order the Legislative and Intergovernmental Committee. Secretary, will please call the roll. Vice President Hassan? Here. Commissioner French? Here. Commissioner Forney? Here. Vice Chair Vita? Here. Chair Meyer? Here. You have a quorum. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Is there a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 5th, 2018? So moved. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Is there a motion to move uh, resolution 2018 355? So moved. Resolution 2018 355 that the board approve one year contracts with Rice, Michaels, and Walter. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this item? Commissioner Forney. Yeah, I'll make it quick and everything. First of all, I'm going to say that I'm going to miss uh, uh, Kirk um, Peterson's usual in-depth and uh, succinct weekly reports. Um, and I'm just curious, so um, are the contracts basically the same as they were last year other than um, we are not employing Marianne Campbell? Uh, there were some modifications. Um, the contract for Tom Workman increases slightly to compensate um, for the work that Marianne Camp was not doing, but not completely because the Democrats took back one of the houses of the legislature, so we're not in as much need. Um, and I, I can't recall exactly. Uh, uh, what changes that were made for the Rice uh, Michaels Walter contract? Councilor Rice, can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I could do it quickly. There's no change in our compensation at 79.5 uh, last time. I did want to just make a brief statement. Kirk Peterson, I think, did send an email out to everyone. Uh, Kirk, who's been with me for 18 years and has worked for the Park Board all those years, uh, it's a big loss. Kirk has been hired by Hennepin County 
Mary Beth Davidson, who ran that program for 25 years, retired. Kareem Murphy moved up. That created a vacancy there, started musical chairs. Kirk has worked with the county contract with me in that same period of time. So uh, I, um, I think it's a good thing for him. Um, we're <laughs> proud of him moving on. And I wanted to introduce Frankie K. Johnson. Oh. Frankie is the new Kirk Peterson. Um, I said be here at 6 o'clock, and this will come up <laughs> shortly after that. Uh, <laughs> welcome to uh, Parkour Time. Um, but Frankie has worked uh, the last couple years with uh, Redmond and Associates, uh, so she's had experience at the Capitol on several issues there. Um, she's also been uh, active in a few uh, efforts on campaigns for the DFL the last couple cycles. She worked with Alina, uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota in politics and anthropology, so uh, she can study uh, both aspects of that at the board. Um, and um, uh, I'm very excited to have her. Uh, I've given her several of Kirk's uh, reports to look at, and hopefully she can help. Uh, <laughs> I'll kind of dig back in. But Kirk did a great job. I mean, he was really good. Good. He knew uh, things, so we'll be a bit more challenged. Luckily, uh, uh, I'm sure Frankie's up to the task. She'll work very hard for us, and uh, look forward to working with her and working with the team. Well, I guess lastly, I would like to thank uh, Kirk and uh, Marianne. I, I do not know how many years Marianne, but it seemed like she'd been here forever and just really appreciate it. years. Yeah, I would appreciate both of their service and um, we'll miss them both. And um, that's it. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Is there any further discussion? Um, I'll just say that, you know, echo Commissioner Forney's thoughts. Uh, we're going to. Ms. Kirk and Marianne um, also say, you know, before I got elected, I was a, somewhat of a critic of um, our lobbyists, but uh, as I've worked with Brian, I've been extremely impressed with his work and I'm very much a convert. I've also been uh, very impressed um, with, with Tom Workman's work and I look forward to continuing to work with them both. I also just want to note uh, something that um, I, I had a few questions about from constituents, and that is, um, you know, when I first met with Brian um, last year, um, one of the things that I brought up, and we had an argument about it, was his um, contract with the police union. I just did just want to note that um, they did drop their police union contract, so there is no longer what I consider to be a conflict of interest there. Um, so, uh, with that said, our um, any other discussion? Okay, one more. <clears throat> Commissioner French. I kind of want to echo a little bit about uh, Commissioner Myers. Wasn't a critic. Is probably a <laughs> being a nice about it. But I, I, I've, I've definitely, uh, working with you in the last year, your institutional knowledge, and not just the park board, but the state of Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, period, is immense, and it's, it's not measurable. So I, I just want to say thank you for guiding a bunch of new guys and who went into uh, a successful year as being park board commissioner. Thank you. I was honored to have the opportunity. <laughs> I too had beef with you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I thought you were a big tobacco lobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> and when I found out you weren't, we were good, right? <laughs> no, it has been. It's been a joy to work with you. And um, I'm excited about your new staff. You've introduced us to new staff. Um, in like two months, one's a woman of color, two, both of them are women. This is exciting. It's something that I'm super excited about. So I appreciate it. Um, I look forward to uh, the next year and, and what we're going to do. Well, well, for sure, like, it's going to be great. I love hearing your stories. You know, Annie always <laughs> told me Brian knows everything. If you have a question, go ask Brian or go look in the book. Brian will tell you where the book is. So I, I look forward to working with you in the future. I appreciate everything you've taught me over this past year. Thank you, Commissioner Vita, and I'll echo that as well. Whenever we need any information about institutional history, uh, Brian is always the person to go to. Uh, with that, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Is there a motion to adjourn?
So moved. Ooh. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Wow, 10 to 11. Right, right, right.